Hi and welcome to this section on advanced portfolio optimization with uh, the Black Litterman model. First of all, what's uh, the motivation of using a more advanced model? So we have seen in the last section uh, that uh, there are various pitfalls when using simple mean variance optimization. And uh, so this is here a recap. And uh, to sum up, so the biggest issue is forecasting returns. And if uh, return forecasts are poor, then uh, the results uh, will be poor as well. And uh, this is also referred to the GIGO problem. So garbage in, garbage out. Now, in particular for listed stocks, there do exist various return forecasting models. But uh, these models uh, can lead uh, to conflicting results. And uh, they also require assumptions and inputs. And even if uh, these assumptions and inputs are okay, these models uh, don't guarantee accurate uh, return forecasts. And uh, we shouldn't forget that uh, not all models uh, can be applied to all asset classes. So typically uh, these uh, models are used for listed stocks. And uh, for example, some of them can't be applied to other asset classes like, uh, for example, commodities or cryptocurrencies. Now, the Black Litterman model takes an alternative approach. And in a first step, it asks uh, what is uh, the average market expectation and uh, why don't we start with returns uh, that uh, the broad market expects, so to say implied uh, returns. However, the problem is uh, that uh, the average market expectations, so the return forecasts or expectations, can't uh, be observed directly. But uh, there is an indirect way. And uh, for this, uh, we have to recap uh, the two fund theorem and uh, the global market portfolio. So you should uh, be familiar with uh, this graph here. And here in orange, we have the capital market line. And uh, all investors should actually seek a portfolio that is lying here on the capital market line. So depending on the individual risk appetite and all portfolios on the capital market line are actually combinations of the risk-free asset and uh, the maximum sharp ratio portfolio. So each and every investor should actually hold here the market portfolio. So the maximum sharp ratio portfolio and this is uh, why it's called the global market portfolio. And uh, we can actually observe uh, the global market portfolio in the market. So it's simply uh, the market cap uh, weighted portfolio with all risky assets. So on average, uh, the market is invested in that uh, portfolio. So the global market portfolio and as every investor wants to be invested in the optimal portfolio to maximize the uh, utility and wealth, it's actually a reasonable assumption to believe that uh, the observable market portfolio is uh, the optimal forward looking portfolio. And this means uh, that uh, the market cap weights are actually the optimal weights. And uh, this means uh, that uh, the result of a mean variance optimization would be uh, the market cap weights so that we can observe in the market. And let's recap that uh, we have actually three inputs for a mean variance optimization. So the expected returns, then the return of uh, the risk-free asset, and uh, the expected variances and uh, covariances, so the covariance matrix. And uh, the output is actually the efficient or the optimal weights. So we have seen this uh, formula before. And now if we assume that uh, the observable market cap weights are actually the efficient weights, then uh, we can rearrange uh, this formula and uh, so for, for the expected returns, so the implied returns implied uh, by market expectations. And uh, this is also called uh, reverse optimization. So we use here this formula and uh, actually optimize for the expected returns. So the inputs are now the risk-free asset return, then the covariance matrix, and also the market cap weights, which we assume are the efficient weights. And then the output of reverse optimization are the implied returns. So the market expectation, and uh, this leads to the following formula. 
So once again, we have here a linear algebra formula. And this time uh, we get uh, the expected returns, which is actually the covariance uh, times uh, the efficient weights times a normalizing factor plus uh, the risk-free rate. So that's uh, the calculation here. And uh, I will demonstrate this uh, with a little example in the next lectures. Thanks for watching and see you there. Bye. All right, for reverse optimization, we need uh, the following inputs. So we need uh, the return of the risk-free asset, which can be approximated uh, by a short um, US treasury note. And then we also need uh, the covariance matrix and uh, the market cap weights. So let's have a simple example. And uh, first, for example, we could assume uh, 3%. So we could be more accurate here by checking uh, the treasury uh, note rates on Bloomberg or whatever. But let's simply assume here 3%. And then we also have for uh, the eight stocks, Apple, Boeing, Disney, GE, JP Morgan, Microsoft, Tesla, and Walmart, the market cap weights as of uh, the end of June 2022. And let's simply create a panda series. So we have Apple with uh, 37% and Microsoft uh, with uh, 32%. And then finally, let's get uh, historical price data for these eight stocks. And then we can calculate actually the simple returns. And having the simple returns, uh, we can create uh, the annualized covariance matrix. And uh, with uh, this, we have everything in place for reverse optimization. And uh, we will continue here in the next lecture. Thanks for watching and see you there. Bye. All right, the Black Litterman model has two steps. And uh, the first step is uh, reverse optimization, where we calculate uh, the expected or the implied returns by the market. And uh, this is uh, the formula here. And you might have noticed uh, that we need here a normalizing factor. And in the following, you can find uh, the formula for the normalizing factor. So I don't want to go here into the details, but uh, there's one input uh, that we have to roughly guess. So the expected market portfolio return of uh, the market portfolio. And actually the accuracy of uh, the rough guess is not that important here. So this is just uh, to set a level for the overall market return and uh, the implied the returns of uh, these single assets will be around uh, that market portfolio return. And uh, for example, for US stocks, 10% could be an appropriate guess. And uh, for other assets like uh, cryptocurrencies, maybe uh, it's higher, so maybe 20 or 25%. But now for US stocks, let's use 10%. And uh, then we have everything in place here to calculate uh, the normalizing factor. So we have uh, the risk-free return, then we have uh, the efficient weights, so the covariance matrix, and also one more time, the efficient weights. So this is uh, the formula here, and uh, the normalizing factor is here 0 0.9. And now having the normalizing factor, we can simply fill here the formula so we have uh, the covariance matrix and a matrix multiplication with uh, the efficient weights and then multiplying with uh, the normalizing factor plus uh, the rate of uh, the risk fee return. And uh, this and uh, this gives uh, the implied returns by the market, so the expected market returns. And uh, for example, for Apple, we have here 10%, then for Disney, 7.2%. For Tesla, 14.1% and from Walmart, 5.3%. And once again, with uh, these returns here, the market cap weighted portfolio is also the optimal portfolio in a mean variance optimization. And uh, that's exactly what uh, we are going to cross check now. So now we actually perform the mean variance optimization and here we need uh, the inverse covariance matrix that uh, we can calculate here and also the expected returns now. And uh, again, we have here the uh, risk-free return. And in the end, uh, the output of uh, the mean variance optimization should be the efficient weights. And uh, these uh, efficient weights should be equal to the market cap weights here. 
So let's go on and first of all, let's get uh, the inverse covariance matrix. And then we can simply apply the formula here and get uh, the non-normalized weights. And then we can actually normalize uh, the weights so that uh, they sum up to one. And uh, these are here the optimal weights of our mean variance optimization using here the implied returns. And now finally comes to the cross check. So let's compare the optimal weights and uh, the market cap weights. And of course here these are equal. So these are the very same. And uh, we can conclude uh, that uh, reverse optimization really works. And now having the implied returns, we can move on with part two. And that's exactly the plan for the next lecture. Thanks for watching and see you there. Bye. Now the Black Litterman model has two steps. So step one is uh, reverse optimization. And now step two is incorporating investor opinions and uh, then rerunning the mean variance optimization. And uh, we still have saved here the implied market uh, returns, so the market expectations. And having now the implied returns, we actually have uh, two options. So option number one, we simply agree with uh, the implied returns or the market expectations. And in this case, uh, we should invest in the market portfolio. So the market cap weighted portfolio so that's uh, the first option and uh, now the second option. So in case uh, you know it better than the market, then you should add your subjective opinions by adjusting uh, the implied returns. However, you should be careful here. So the overconfidence bias is a very typical problem in the investment market. And uh, beating the market or having superior skills or information is way more difficult than uh, most investors uh, think. Or to put it that way, so knowing it better than the market is more unlikely than likely. And uh, there's a great analogy in real life. So let me just uh, quote a Swedish uh, study. So around 88% of American drivers considered uh, themselves to be above average at driving. And uh, that's exactly the problem with uh, knowing it better than the market. So you should be careful here. But now let's assume that uh, we do have an opinion. So let's again start uh, with uh, the implied returns. And now let's make some changes to the implied returns. And let's assume that uh, we think that uh, the Apple return will be lower by one percentage point. So instead of 10.3, we have 9.3. Then also Boeing, we uh, decrease by one percentage point. And then we think that uh, Disney will perform better. So we increase by one percentage point. And then there are no changes, for example, for GE and JP Morgan. And uh, then we think that Microsoft will perform poorer and also Tesla. And finally, we increase uh, the Walmart return from 5.3 to 6.3%. Uh, so this is uh, simply an example. And uh, this is here our opinion. So the changes. And now we can add uh, the implied returns and our opinion to actually create our personal forecast. So now we have for Apple 9.3% and so on. And uh, with uh, these forecasts, once again, we can perform a mean variance optimization. And uh, let's uh, select uh, the linear algebra solution here. So we use uh, the inverse covariance matrix dot. And then we have for the forecast minus uh, the risk-free rate. So these are the non-normalized weights. And then let's normalize uh, the weights to one. And uh, we can clearly see, so these were the market cap weights and uh, we can clearly see that uh, weights uh, changed here. So for example, for Apple, it uh, decreased from 37% to 23%. And also we can see that here for Boeing, we have a negative weight. So we should go short uh, Boeing. And if you want to avoid this, then of course you can use bounce and uh, the SciPy optimizer. But uh, we can clearly see here that small changes in the forecast can lead to large changes in the weights. 
So we increased the Walmart return by one percentage point and then the weight increases from five to 30 percent. So also the Black Litterman model is uh, not uh, the one and only perfect model, but at least it allows us to start uh, with uh, the implied market returns. And as uh, some final remarks, so in our example here, we just view date stocks, but uh, typically the Black Litterman model is more meaningful and reliable if we use uh, the entire or close to the entire market. So we should include hundreds or thousands of stocks or commodities or cryptocurrencies or whatever. And then once again, so small forecast changes lead to large changes in the weights. So we should be careful here. And also this is one of the reasons why Black Litterman should be combined uh, with additional bounds and constraints. So we have uh, seen this earlier. And finally, our opinions should be derived from or at least verified uh, with other forecasting models. So this was uh, the Black Litterman model for portfolio optimization. Thanks for watching. Bye. Hi and welcome to part three of the course. So part three is all about income generation with algorithmic stock trading. And uh, we will cover the following topics. So first of all, there will be an introduction to uh, trading strategies and different categories of uh, strategies. So for example, technical trading and the statistical arbitrage and more. And then you will learn the life cycle of a strategy from idea generation until income generation and uh, probably the most important uh, steps in the entire process uh, are strategy backtesting, strategy optimization, and also forward testing. So you should only trade strategies where the likelihood of uh, success is high. And then we will focus on uh, technical analysis and uh, technical indicators uh, with Python. And uh, we will also implement and automate the one or the other strategy with Python and interactive brokers. And finally, we will have to deal with trading costs uh, throughout uh, the entire part three because it's uh, simple to find strategies that are profitable before costs, but it's much harder to find profitable strategies after costs. So that's uh, the plan for part three. Have fun and uh, I'm looking forward to seeing you in the next lectures and sections. Bye. Now there do exist thousands or even millions of different trading strategies and uh, let me give you a quick overview and uh, let me uh, classify the trading strategies. And uh, as I said before, this is a 100% data driven trading course and the trading strategies are based on data. And uh, now there are two different types of data. So we have fundamental data and uh, we have uh, price and uh, volume data. So fundamental data can be interest rates, uh, GDP growth, inflation, unemployment, and also company revenues and profits. And uh, price and volume data are for specific instruments. So we have historical prices and uh, returns, uh, the trading volume, and also the volatility of uh, prices and returns. And uh, first of all, let's consider fundamental data and uh, we can use fundamental data and uh, simple economic rules to define strategies. And as an example, if interest rates in the US rise, uh, this uh, could be a signal that uh, the US dollar will appreciate relative uh, to other countries. And of course, we can also feed the more advanced uh, statistical and also machine learning models uh, with uh, fundamental data to come up uh, with uh, trading strategies. Now in this course, you will not trade on fundamental data for two reasons. So typically fundamental traders have a newsfeed and wait for new fundamental signals. And uh, the challenge is uh, that fundamental news is uh, less uh, structured data because typically it's written text and uh, compared to uh, just the price data. So this is just numbers. It's uh, more complex. So we need to process written text, uh, which can be challenging. And uh, second, and even more important, even if we can process uh, news and extract uh, the essence of any news feed, we have to interpret uh, the news and uh, convert this into uh, uh, signals. And uh, we can do this either with economic rules or with more advanced uh, statistical models. 
However, this uh, requires a solid background in economics. So let's have an example and let's assume that uh, the European Central Bank increases interest rates by 50 basis points. And uh, the question is now, is uh, this high or low? And uh, will this have an impact on exchange rates? And uh, the best answer is it depends. So it depends on market expectations and on other economic factors. And uh, this is clearly beyond uh, what we can cover here in this course. So we will focus on price and volume data and uh, try to find patterns in this data to create strategies uh, with uh, technical indicators and also machine learning models. And in a way we build our strategies on market inefficiencies. So the efficient market hypothesis actually tells us that uh, we can't make abnormal returns uh, with historical price data but actually markets are not 100% uh, perfect and the uh, traders are not 100% uh, rational. So there are definitely some market inefficiencies and uh, some opportunities for us. And actually we have uh, three options here. So first of all, we can turn uh, the price or volume data into technical indicators and to create trading strategies based on these indicators. Or we can also feed uh, machine learning models uh, with the price or return or volume data to come up uh, with a machine learning powered strategy. And third, we can also feed uh, machine learning algorithms uh, with uh, technical indicators. Or we can also use a combination of both. Finally, let's have a short overview on technical indicators and uh, they're actually trend indicators, momentum indicators, volatility indicators, and uh, volume indicators. And uh, typically we focus on trend and uh, momentum indicators. And uh, to give you a few examples here, so we have simple moving averages and uh, we will work with SMAs in this course. Next we have Bollinger Bands, so then Stochastic Oscillators, the Relative Strength Index, then moving average convergence, divergence, and exponential moving averages, and many more. And in some of the next lectures, we will have a closer look into technical indicators. Bye. All right, uh, this is probably one of the most important lectures in the entire course, as it explains uh, how you can be successful with active trading and uh, why it's important to create your own unique strategies. And last but not least, it also clarifies how this course uh, will help you to uh, reach uh, your goals. So at uh, the end of the course, you should have uh, the required skills to create, test and implement uh, your own unique strategies. And in addition, the course provides uh, the coding frameworks that allow you to easily switch from one strategy to another with uh, just a few changes. And uh, to help you to really understand how it works, we will create, test and implement uh, some example strategies for illustration purposes. And uh, these strategies are not necessarily the best and most profitable strategies. And uh, one major goal is to also demonstrate uh, commonly made errors, mistakes and pitfalls when dealing with uh, training strategies. So in the next uh, lectures and sections, we will build frameworks for backtesting and also implementation. So that's uh, the trading bot uh, framework. And uh, I will demonstrate how it works uh, with uh, some examples. And uh, then it's your part to feed uh, the frameworks uh, with your unique strategies. So that's uh, the ultimate goal of this course. And uh, coming up with the unique strategies is not that simple but uh, there are many good uh, resources for it. And uh, this course provides some good ideas and sources and it uh, will hopefully inspire you to create your own strategies. And uh, as a side note, so there are many good uh, resources like other courses. So not only my courses, uh, but also courses from other instructors where you can find uh, more ideas and more strategies. And also there are tons of blogs, books and more. And uh, last but not least, it could be your creativity to create more and even better strategies. So to sum up, uh, creating unique strategies is your part. That's uh, the creative part. 
And uh, this course uh, teaches uh, the required skills to do that. And it also provides uh, the coding frameworks. So that's, so to say, the technical part. And uh, in my view, that's uh, the only way to create a useful, a really useful course on algo trading. And now let me explain why this is uh, the case. So successful strategies are typically unique strategies. And if everybody knows uh, that a particular strategy works very well, for example, for Bitcoin, then many will trade to that strategy. And uh, by definition, uh, the opportunity will diminish. Now, reason two is uh, related uh, to this. So a great uh, strategy in the past is not necessarily a good one for the future because uh, things uh, keep changing and uh, you need to adapt and uh, you have to continuously test, update and if necessary, change uh, your strategies. And uh, some students ask me if uh, there's a profitable strategy that always, always works for a specific instrument like, uh, for example, for Bitcoin or for Euro, US dollar. And uh, the clear answer is here, no. So you need to continuously develop screen and test the new strategies. And uh, that's uh, the major part for any professional trader. Now, why don't we just cover all existing strategies here in the course? And uh, the answer is pretty simple. So there are thousands, if not millions of different strategies. And of course, we can't uh, cover them all here in this course. So we can cover two, five or maybe 10 strategies. But it's uh, definitely better to have uh, the right skills and uh, the framework to define and uh, test and implement uh, many of uh, those strategies on your own. So that's better than providing five or 10 strategies that uh, won't work in the future. And uh, there's also a regulatory constraint here. So investment advice is a highly regulated business and it's simply a prohibited activity here in this course. So the course is for educational purposes only and it's uh, not investment advice or a recommendation uh, to trade a specific strategy and uh, therefore all examples are for illustration purposes only. And uh, that's also the reason why I can't comment on or assist you with your own strategies because uh, this could be deemed to be investment advice and it's simply not allowed here. And uh, those of you who attended some of my other courses know that I'm pretty responsive and I also answer to questions uh, that are actually off topic. But here in this course, I have to be very strict and it uh, would be really great if you do not post your strategy codes here in the Q&A board and ask uh, for assistance or advice. So I simply can't do it. And uh, in the worst case, uh, you could get into trouble if somebody else uses your code and makes losses uh, with your code. So please don't do it. And uh, thanks a lot for your understanding here. And actually in the next lecture, you will get some more information on the life cycle of a strategy. So here in reason two, we have learned uh, that a great strategy in the past is not necessarily a good one for the future and uh, you need to adapt. And uh, that's exactly what uh, we will cover in the next lecture. So the life cycle of a strategy. Thanks for watching and uh, see you there. Bye. In this lecture, we are going to compare technical analysis and fundamental analysis. And both are commonly used in the finance and investment industry to gain insight into financial instruments and uh, to identify those instruments uh, that are overpriced or underpriced. So technical analysis and fundamental analysis have similar goals, but uh, the underlying methodologies are totally different. And uh, now let's have a closer look and uh, let's compare. And uh, for technical analysis, we only need uh, historical price and uh, volume data. And uh, nowadays it's pretty simple to get uh, that data. And in fundamental analysis, uh, we use the data that uh, we extracted from financial statements like a balance sheet, a profit and loss and cash flow statements. And uh, with that, analysts calculate profitability ratios, the liquidity ratios and more. And uh, they also consider other company news and uh, economics. Now, fundamental analysts analyze financial statements and uh, they estimate the so-called intrinsic fair value based on the fundamentals. 
and uh, they believe that prices are mainly driven by the intrinsic fair value. So if the price of a stock is higher than the fair value, they expect the prices to fall. And in contrast to that, uh, technical analysts just believe that prices are driven by supply and demand. So if uh, more traders are willing to sell, prices will fall. And if more traders are willing to buy, then the prices will rise. And uh, while fundamental analysts believe that prices are mainly driven by fundamental traders, technical traders believe that prices are influenced by all traders. And uh, they're actually not concerned uh, with identifying the reasons for trading. So for technical analysts, it doesn't matter if uh, trading is driven by fundamentals, by psychology or intuition or whatever. And uh, that's actually the more general approach. And uh, there isn't anything wrong with uh, that. Next, let's continue with uh, some pros and cons. And uh, this list isn't uh, complete, but it contains some of uh, the most uh, critical pros and cons. And let's start uh, with the pros of uh, technical analysis. So historical price and volume data is available and observable, and it's uh, no problem to get the data. And uh, for fundamental analysis, uh, we need more data and uh, more complex data. And in most cases, it doesn't make sense to work with uh, the raw data. So fundamental analysts have to make appropriate assumptions and uh, restatements, and therefore they need uh, solid accounting skills. And in contrast to that, uh, technical analysts uh, don't uh, need any knowledge or skills on accounting. Next, fundamental analysis is well embedded and uh, well accepted in academics. So the concept of intrinsic fair value is one of the most important concepts in finance. Whereas uh, technical analysis is often used as a pseudoscience for practitioners. And uh, you can hardly find any content on TA in academic and academic-like programs like, for example, the CFA program, even if uh, TA is heavily used in uh, trading and investing. Now, technical analysis only works in uh, liquid markets where price and uh, volume data is observable. And if uh, this is not the case, so if uh, there's no price or volume data, then uh, technical analysis uh, can't be used. And in contrast to that, uh, fundamental analysis also works equally well for illiquid assets and uh, illiquid markets. Finally, TA is less useful when uh, prices are subject to outside manipulation. And uh, I don't mean here illegal manipulation, but uh, factors uh, that are not uh, driven by supply and demand alone. And uh, one example could be uh, decisions by the central bank to increase or decrease interest rates. So if prices are manipulated by outside factors, then uh, this can limit uh, technical analysis. And in contrast to that, fundamental analysis also takes into account uh, other factors like uh, central bank decisions. Finally, the most important question is uh, what's more useful? Is it the technical analysis or fundamental analysis? So more useful for trading to generate abnormal profits. And uh, empirical studies show mixed results. So there's uh, no clear winner here. And uh, theory says uh, that TA and FA shouldn't work. So both are disputed by the efficient market hypothesis that uh, we will consider in uh, the next lecture in more detail. And finally, the best conclusion is uh, that uh, we should get the best of both worlds and that we should use the TA and FA together. However, in practice, uh, this is rarely done because uh, typically technical analysts don't have uh, the required accounting skills and uh, fundamental analysts are simply not willing to use a technical analysis as uh, many of them view uh, TA as a pseudoscience. And in my opinion, it's uh, best uh, to be just pragmatic and open-minded. And as long as it's uh, beneficial to use uh, both together, then uh, why shouldn't we use both together? All right, this was a brief uh, comparison, technical analysis versus fundamental analysis. Thanks for watching and see you in the next video. Bye. This lecture is on technical analysis and uh, the efficient market hypothesis or short EMH. And uh, the EMH is one of the most fundamental concepts in finance. 
and uh, many other finance uh, theories uh, are built on the EMH. So they explicitly assume that uh, the EMH uh, does hold, but as the name says, it's just an hypothesis that can't be fully rejected or fully agreed on. So technical analysis claims uh, that uh, we can partly forecast prices with historical price and volume data and uh, we can exploit patterns and trends and uh, make abnormal profits. And in contrast to that, uh, the EMH claims uh, that financial markets are information efficient, so current prices fully, quickly and rationally reflect all publicly available information. So this not only includes uh, historical price and volume data, but also fundamental data. And uh, as a consequence, uh, traders can't uh, make abnormal profits, not only with the TA, but also with fundamental analysis. And uh, they can't make profits because all prices do reflect uh, the intrinsic fair value. And uh, by definition, uh, there are no underpriced or no overpriced securities in the market. And it's impossible to predict prices uh, with past prices or fundamentals as uh, prices follow a so-called random walk and uh, they're not influenced by past the price patterns. So to summarize in one sentence, uh, TA claims uh, that uh, traders can beat the market and uh, EMH claims uh, that traders can't beat the market. So obviously they are contradictory and EMH clearly disputes uh, the usefulness of technical analysis. And uh, now the most interesting question is who is right? And uh, there's no clear winner. So this has been and uh, will be one of the most controversial ongoing discussions in uh, the finance and investment industry. And uh, empirical studies show mixed results. So some studies uh, support uh, the EMH and uh, some other studies show significant abnormal returns generated by TA-based strategies. However, what we could say is uh, that uh, developed markets are more efficient than emerging markets. So they are highly efficient, but not perfectly efficient. And uh, finally, it's simply a fact that uh, some of the most important assumptions of EMH simply do not hold. So EMH assumes uh, that all traders have full access to all available information and uh, that also all traders uh, use uh, that information. And second, EMH believes uh, that all traders act 100% uh, rationally. However, both assumptions do not hold. So it's pretty obvious uh, that uh, retail traders don't have access to all available information and uh, they simply don't use all information. And uh, there's hardly any trader acting 100% rationally. So behavioral finance is a newer but uh, well-accepted field of study that examines uh, the reason why there's so much uh, irrational behavior in the market. And uh, the GameStop stock is a recent example for irrational behavior. So for a long time, the stock was around uh, five or $10 and hedge funds believed that the stock is overpriced and uh, took a short position and uh, sold the stock. However, this resulted in a 1,500% increase in the share price over the course of two weeks, reaching an all time high of 400 or 500 US dollar. And uh, this effect was mainly attributed to a coordinated action by an internet community with uh, the goal to gamble and harm the hedge funds. And uh, there seems to be a second wave here at uh, the end of February. So intrinsic fair value might be somewhere between five, 10 or $20 or whatsoever. But uh, many traders buy the stock for 200, 300, 400 and more. And uh, that's uh, simply irrational and uh, contradicts uh, the efficient uh, market hypothesis. And uh, to sum up, as long as uh, there's irrational behavior in the market, there will always be mispriced instruments and opportunities uh, for technical and also fundamental traders to make abnormal profits. And uh, with this we have reached uh, the end of this video. Thanks for watching and see you in the next one. Bye. All right, in this video I will cover and explain some of the major applications and use cases for technical analysis. And uh, there are many proper use cases and also some improper use cases for technical analysis. And uh, improper does not necessarily mean wrong, 
but it's simply not useful or not helpful to make uh, profits in the market. Now, when I read articles in the newspaper or in a finance magazine or blog or whatsoever that uh, uses technical analysis, in many cases I think, okay, that's a nice story, but uh, how on earth can this be helpful to do anything useful with it? And as an example, let's consider the following sentence. So it says, uh, today the Euro-US dollar rate was further going up after the 50-day moving average had crossed the 200-day moving average in the morning. And uh, there isn't anything wrong with that, but it's a typical example for the so-called confirmation bias. So people tend to search for or favor information that confirms uh, their belief. And if you consider 10 different technical indicators, uh, then maybe four indicators uh, indicate uh, that prices will rise. Then uh, three indicators don't provide any clear signal and uh, three indicators show the exact uh, opposite. And uh, picking out that signal that correctly explains the past or supports uh, the story that we want to tell isn't uh, really useful here. And uh, next, let's consider the following headline. So we have a prediction for the instrument the Euro US dollar based on a resistance breakout. And it says uh, that uh, the bullish trend is likely to continue in the near term. And uh, that's clearly an example for the overconfidence bias. So we can't accurately forecast the prices or trends for single events like uh, tomorrow the prices will rise or fall. And uh, technical traders frequently overstate uh, the prediction power of technical analysis. And uh, this can be partly explained uh, by the efficient market hypothesis. Now, what we can achieve uh, with uh, technical analysis? So we can gain a small competitive advantage by taking into account several TA indicators and uh, other tools uh, like fundamental analysis and uh, then we should uh, backtest the uh, trading strategies and uh, closely monitor and measure performance and risk. And uh, most important, so we can gain a small competitive advantage over longer time periods and uh, many trading decisions. And uh, that's important here because even with uh, the best strategies, we probably can't forecast markets uh, with a very high precision like 80 or 90%. So if we could do that, uh, we would make millions uh, within weeks and uh, months. And it's definitely more realistic uh, to assume that we can get a small advantage, like making predictions uh, with uh, 51, 52 or even 55% precision. So for a single event or for a single decision, that's not really helpful. It's almost 50-50, but over longer time periods, and uh, with many trading decisions, uh, we can create a small competitive advantage. Now, as an example for this, let's consider a relative strength uh, index strategy for Euro US dollar over longer time periods, uh, like here 16 years from 2004 till 2020. So we have a quite long time period and uh, we have many decisions and uh, we can generate uh, some abnormal profit here with our strategy in green. However, if we only consider a short time period, like uh, for example here, or a single decision, then uh, chances are close to 50-50. Now let's come to the most important question. How can we capitalize on insights from technical analysis? And uh, day traders typically uh, use uh, technical analysis to make profits in the market. So they are buying and selling instruments multiple times within uh, the same trading day. And uh, algorithmic trading has the goal to automate this process. So it's not you, but your computer that uh, trades for you, which is uh, more efficient and also more effective. And uh, the general rules in day trading or algorithmic day trading are pretty simple. So if uh, technical analysis gives a bullish signal, then we should buy the instrument or in other words, we should take a long position. And uh, with a long position, uh, we benefit from price increases and we suffer from falling prices. 
Now, in all cases where we get a barrel signal, we have uh, to differentiate uh, two cases. So if uh, the instrument and uh, the broker is allowing short selling, so if short selling is available, we can sell the instrument and uh, take a short position. And uh, when having a short position, we suffer from price increases and uh, we benefit from falling prices. Now, depending on the, the trader's location and also on the instrument, sometimes uh, short selling is uh, prohibited. And uh, in these cases, uh, the, the instrument is also called long only. So if uh, we have a bearish signal, then we can just uh, sell a long position and uh, close a long position and uh, go neutral. And uh, the disadvantage here is that uh, we can't uh, really benefit uh, from falling prices and uh, we can only benefit uh, from rising prices. Finally, if uh, the signal is unclear or ambiguous, then we should stay neutral or go neutral so we have no position and uh, we have no profits or losses, no matter if uh, prices uh, will rise or fall. Now, to sum up uh, what are the uh, desired characteristics uh, to benefit uh, from uh, technical analysis. So the broker and uh, the instrument should allow short selling to capitalize on bullish and also bearish signals. And uh, second, uh, we should have low trading or transaction costs. And finally, we should have high price volatility and uh, therefore we should definitely consider forex trading or also CFD trading, but uh, this doesn't mean uh, that uh, technical analysis uh, doesn't work for stocks. That's not true. And of course, we can also use the uh, technical analysis for stock trading, but especially for day trading, forex and uh, CFD instruments and also futures are more appropriate than stocks. And therefore, in this course, uh, we will mainly focus on uh, forex like uh, US dollar, euro. But uh, this doesn't mean that uh, the workflows and uh, the techniques uh, shown here in this course don't work for stocks. That's not the case. So they work equally well also for stocks. Finally, let's have a close overview of uh, how we can create uh, trading strategies. So first, we always have the data and either we have fundamental data like interest rates, inflation, unemployment, uh, profits and revenues of companies and more, or we have uh, price and volume data. So this is actually the data for technical analysis and in fundamental analysis, uh, we use fundamental data. And uh, with fundamental data, we can formulate uh, simple economic rules and uh, create uh, trading strategies. And uh, same we can do with the price and volume data. So we can perform technical analysis and uh, we can calculate and uh, create technical indicators. And uh, based on that, uh, we can create uh, trading strategies. And last but not least, uh, we can use fundamental data and uh, price and volume data and also technical indicators to feed uh, statistical models and uh, machine learning models to uh, create uh, trading strategies. So that's a more complex and more sophisticated way of uh, creating trading strategies. And in this course here, we will focus on uh, creating trading strategies uh, with uh, price and volume data technical analysis and uh, technical indicators. Thanks for watching and see you also in uh, the next lecture. Bye. All right, let's start with uh, the technical analysis uh, with Python and uh, the packages Plotly and Cufflink are great tools for interactive plotting and uh, technical charting. So it's definitely worth installing Cufflinks where Plotly is already included. And uh, you can install cufflinks uh, with uh, the link pip install cufflinks. And uh, as always, you have to enter uh, this uh, command in Anaconda prompt or a terminal window. So in my case here in Anaconda prompt, and I've already done this. So I don't have to run here the command uh, with uh, the enter key. And uh, for this section, uh, we need pandas, numpy, matplotlib, and cufflinks as uh, cf. 
And actually, I've prepared a little data set uh, with uh, three stocks taken from Yahoo Finance. So let's import uh, the data set uh, from the CSV file stocks.csv. And uh, we have here a multi index in the columns. So this shouldn't be anything new here. And uh, we have for the stocks Microsoft, uh, General Electric, and Apple. And uh, the time period is uh, from 2010 until the end of uh, 2020. Next, we can also get some meta information with uh, the info method. So we have uh, 2,800 uh, rows or uh, training days and in total 18 columns. And uh, for example, we could get uh, the close price for GE and then the most simple and uh, most commonly used uh, technical tool is a simple price chart. So for example, for GE, and uh, we can see here that uh, the price increased from 2010 until 2017. And then there was a steep decline here. And actually with uh, the log accessor, we can also select a specific month and uh, again, the close price for GE. So this is just a repetition here and uh, we will continue in the next lectures. Thanks for watching and see you there. Bye. In this video, we are going to create interactive line charts or price charts uh, with Plotly and Cufflinks. And we have still imported and saved to the data set in DF. And now before we can start creating interactive plots with Plotly, we have to make a one-time setting, which uh, we shouldn't change anymore. So when creating plots with Plotly, we can either create uh, these plots locally or to say offline, or we can also create them online on the Plotly online platform. But uh, we need an account for the online option and uh, for our purposes, creating the plots offline is totally fine. And uh, therefore we have here the cufflinks method uh, set config file. And uh, here we have to pass uh, true to the offline parameter. And uh, this value offline equals true is uh, then saved uh, locally in our cufflinks uh, installation. So in a config file. So this is a one time setting. So we have to run uh, this line here only once. And then again, we can select uh, the period from June 2020 till the end of 2020 and only the GE close prices. And uh, now if you want to create an interactive plot, we can use uh, the iPlot method. And here we have our very first interactive uh, plot uh, with Plotly and Cufflinks. And uh, one of the most powerful features of interactive uh, visualization using Plotly is uh, that we can reveal more information about a data point by moving here the mouse cursor over the point and having a hover label that appears. So for example, here December the 2nd, 2020, and uh, the price is 10.43. And uh, we have also some more tools and instruments here in uh, the upper right corner. So for example, we can zoom in or we can zoom out or we can do this manually and select here an area of interest. And then we can also move uh, to the left or to the right or up and down by clicking here on pan. And then we can also create a screenshot and uh, also we can click here on auto scale or we can reset to the axis. So for example, if we zoom in here and then we can reset. So this is uh, the interactive line chart for GE, but of course we can also plot uh, all three stocks. So we select uh, the close prices and uh, create the plot with iPlot. And uh, then we have here the three plots in uh, one interactive plot. So we have an orange Microsoft in blue GE and in green Apple. And uh, with a single click, uh, we can also remove uh, one stock. For example, we can remove here Microsoft. And if we click again, then we add it. And the same we can also do for GE and uh, for Apple. And uh, with a double click, we can only select one stock 
So let's have a double click here on GE and uh, we only have GE. And uh, again, with a double click, we can go back and uh, see all three stocks. Finally, we also have the option here between showing uh, the closest data on hover and the compared data on hover. So if we click here on show closest data, then we get here the closest data, for example, Microsoft or Apple. But if we click here on compare, then we can compare the three stocks on a specific day. So for example, here or month. So for example, here on March or September to 18. So this was an introduction to interactive line charts with Plotly and Cufflinks and uh, we will continue in the very next lecture. So thanks for watching and see you there. Bye. In this video we are going to customize our interactive line charts. So there are many options to customize Plotly charts and uh, we will cover a few of them here in the next minutes. And uh, we still have uh, saved and imported DF and for example, we can get the close prices and uh, then we can also create interactive plots with iPlot. And instead of having simple line charts like here, we can set uh, the parameter fill to true. And uh, by doing so, we fill here the lines. And again, we can enable and disable stocks here like GE or we can only select Microsoft. And as you can see, we have here a default color scale with orange, green, and blue, but uh, we can also set other color scales and uh, we can get uh, the available scales with uh, cufflinks.colors.scales. For example, we have here blues or greens, oranges, and so on. And now let's assume that uh, we want to have uh, the color scale reds then uh, we can pass here reds uh, to the parameter color scale. And now we have here reds. Next, we can also change uh, the theme of our interactive plot and uh, we can get all available themes uh, with get themes. So for example, we have here solar or space and uh, we can change uh, the theme by passing here, for example, solar to the theme parameter. And as color scales, we selected here red, yellow, blue. So let's have a look above here. Red, yellow, blue. Then in the next step, we can also add a title to our chart. For example, US stocks and uh, titles for the X axis and uh, the Y axis, for example, time and uh, stock price. So here we have the title US stocks and time and the stock price. And finally, if we are working with only two stocks like GE and Apple, then we can change uh, the kind of uh, the plot to spread. And uh, all other settings are here the same. So let's have a look at spread. And we get here a future warning so we can ignore it. And uh, here still we have uh, the price chart for Apple and GE and then below we have for the spread. So that's uh, the difference between the GE price and the Apple price. So initially the difference was positive. That means uh, the GE price was higher than the Apple price. We can see this here in green and then it turns uh, negative red. And finally the Apple price is much higher than uh, the GE price. And as a side note here, the spread here might be more meaningful if we are working with normalized stock prices. So for example, if um, GE and Apple starts at a base uh, price of 100. But uh, for our purposes here, this is totally fine. So with uh, kind equals spread, we can actually visualize uh, the difference between uh, two time series. And uh, this, so this we have reached to the end of this video. And again, uh, this uh, were just a few examples. And if we go here inside, then we can see that uh, there are many more options and parameters. So feel free to play around here. 
Thanks for watching and uh, see you in the next lecture. Bye. A line chart is uh, the most simple and most uh, commonly used charting technique. However, there are more informative and more powerful charting techniques and uh, candlestick charts are probably the most popular advanced uh, charting techniques. So we have still saved here DF. And again, we are faced here with a multi-index in the columns. So we have uh, the outer index level attributes and uh, the inner index level symbols. And uh, for example, if you want to get open high low close prices uh, for one symbol like GE, then first of all, we could swap the levels with uh, the method the swap level. And uh, we have to pass one to the axis parameter to swap uh, the levels here in the columns. And now we have uh, symbols in the outer level and attributes in the inner level. And then we can, for example, select GE. And uh, we get um, the attributes for GE. So open, high, low, close, adjusted, close and volume. So let's save and create a separate copy with uh, just uh, the uh, GE attributes. So we swap the level, select GE and uh, create a copy and uh, save uh, GE in uh, the variable GE. Now in simple line charts, uh, we just uh, plotted uh, the daily closing prices. And uh, we could say that uh, we kind of omitted or ignored important price information like uh, high, low and uh, open. And uh, candlestick charts allow us to visualize open, high, low and close prices in one single chart. And uh, that's why candlestick charts are so popular. So let's uh, select only one month, for example, May 2017. And uh, let's create a candlestick chart. And uh, it's uh, pretty simple to create a candlestick chart uh, with uh, Plotly and Cufflinks. So we again use uh, the iPlot method and pass candle to the kind parameter. So let's have a look here and let's see a candlestick chart live in action. And at a first glance, we can see here green candles and uh, red candles. And uh, now let's have a closer look here at uh, candlestick charts. So we have uh, green candles also called uh, bullish candlesticks and uh, this indicates an increasing price. So the open price is uh, here below and the close price uh, here above. And uh, then we also have uh, for the specific time period, the low price and uh, the high price. And actually uh, this is here called the body. So the distance between the open price and uh, the close price. So green candles or bullish candles indicate a price increase from the open price to the close price. And in contrast to that, red or bearish candles uh, indicate decreasing prices. So here we have for the open price, then the close price so that is uh, below the open price. And again, we have low and high prices. And uh, here above, uh, this is also called uh, the upper shadow. So that's uh, the distance between uh, the open price and uh, the high price. And uh, here below we have uh, the lower shadow. So let's have a look at an example. And each candle here stands uh, for one day. For example, here we have the candle for the 3rd of May 2017. And uh, the open price was 27.8. So here's uh, the open price. And uh, then at uh, day end, we closed higher with a profit at uh, a close price of uh, 28.1. And actually the daily high was here 28.1 and uh, the daily low price was 27.7. So let's have a look at another example. And for example, this is uh, the candle for the 17th of May 2017. And actually in the morning, the open price was 26.75 and uh, the price uh, decreased over the day to 26.35. And uh, the closing price is uh, actually here in this case, the very same as uh, the low price. So the daily low price is equal to the daily closing price. 
And actually the daily high price was 27.67. So there was uh, quite a high volatility during the day here. So this is uh, the Plotly candlestick chart and uh, there's a very similar chart, uh, the so-called open high low close chart. And uh, for the sake of completeness, let's have a look here. And uh, essentially uh, we can see here the very same information, but instead of having here candles, we have a kind of bars here. And on the left hand side, uh, we see the daily uh, open price and on the right side, uh, right side uh, the daily close price. And in case we have a red bar here, the close price is uh, below the open price. And in contrast to that, a green bar starts here with uh, the open price on the left hand side and ends at uh, the close price on the right hand side here above. So the open high low close bar chart is nice to have, but um, I think uh, the candlestick chart here is more popular. But in the end, uh, both the charts uh, show the very same information. So thanks for watching and see you also in the next lecture. Bye. All right, this is uh, still the GE candlestick chart for May 2017. And uh, each candle here is uh, one trading day with uh, daily open high low and uh, close prices. So for example, for uh, the 11th of May 2017. And uh, we could say that the bar size or the granularity of our candlestick chart is daily. However, this is just one example. And depending on the specific use case, it might make sense to have intraday candles or bars with a bar size of uh, one hour, 10 minutes, or even one minute. And likewise, we could also reduce uh, the granularity or the frequency to weekly or monthly. And uh, now in case we want to work with intraday candles, we need to pull the intraday data from our data sources. So it uh, doesn't make any sense to upsample daily data to say hourly data, that doesn't work. However, we can go the opposite way and uh, downsample daily data to, uh, for example, weekly or monthly data. So we could convert here the uh, daily candlestick chart to a weekly or a monthly candlestick chart. And uh, that's exactly what uh, I will show you here in the next minutes. And actually downsampling open, high, low, close data seems to be simple and straightforward with a combination of uh, the pandas method resample and uh, the uh, special aggregation method open, high, low, close. But uh, there are two pitfalls here that I want to highlight. So let's uh, start uh, with uh, the naive um, the solution here. So we resample the GE data frame that uh, we still have saved here with uh, the adjusted close, close, high, low, and so on. So we could resample and uh, we could select uh, weekly frequency. And as a trading week starts on Monday and ends on Friday, we should select uh, the frequency weekly Friday. And then we could uh, simply chain uh, the open high low and uh, close method. And uh, we save uh, the new data frame, the weekly data frame in the variable weekly. And let's have a look here. And uh, we can already see the problem here. So we created much more data than we actually need. So we have uh, for each attribute, so for adjusted close, for close and for high and so on, we have all aggregations. So we have open, high, low, close. And actually we only need uh, the close price for close, the high price for high, the low price for low and uh, the open price for open. And um, therefore, in my opinion, uh, we shouldn't use open, high, low, close here. And uh, we should use uh, the more general aggregation method, egg. And uh, egg allows us to select different aggregation methods for different uh, columns. So let's start here again with our GE data frame. So GE starts here at the 4th of January, which is Monday. Then we have Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and uh, Friday. And uh, now if you want to aggregate to weekly data, then uh, the weekly open price is here uh, the first open price on Monday. And uh, consequently, the weekly close price is here the last close price on Friday. 
And uh, the weekly high price is uh, the highest value here in the week. And uh, the weekly low price is here the lowest value. And uh, this is a perfect use case for the egg method. So we open here a dictionary and uh, we want to aggregate uh, the open column and use uh, the aggregation method first. Then for high, we select uh, the method max, for low, the method min, and finally for the close column, we select uh, the aggregation method last. So let's uh, run here the cell and uh, let's again save uh, the weekly data frame in weekly. And now we have here for the week starting on the 4th of January, the open, high, low and close price. And actually on the left hand side here we have for the daytime index and uh, we have here the Friday. So that's uh, the label for this bar. However, the convention is uh, that uh, bars or candles uh, should be labeled with uh, the left edge or in other words with uh, the starting or opening date and in our case, it uh, should be the Monday. So on the first bar here, it should be a Monday, the 4th of January. And uh, there's actually the parameter label in the resample method. But in uh, this case, uh, this doesn't help here. And let's have a look inside here to the parameter label. And uh, here we can define whether we want to have uh, the left edge or the right edge to uh, label the bar. And uh, the default setting is uh, left for all frequencies except for monthly, annual, quarterly and weekly. So the default setting for weekly is uh, right. And therefore we have here the Fridays as labels. Now we could do the following and uh, we could pass here left but this, this is uh, not really helpful because uh, then we get uh, Friday the previous week as label. So we get here Friday the 1st of January for the week uh, from the 4th till the 8th. So that's uh, not really helpful here. And therefore we have to go here the extra mile and uh, we have subtract four days here from uh, the daytime index and to do this We should import the two offset from pandas uh, time series dot frequencies. And then we can do the following. So we can change uh, the daytime index of weekly. And uh, we can actually subtract four days uh, with uh, two offset. So we have four days and uh, let's run the cell here and let's have a look. And of course, first of all, we should go back to the right labeling. So let's again create weekly and here we have uh, Friday the 8th and uh, now we subtract four days and now we should get uh, the 4th of January for the first bar. It's uh, the Monday. And then the next bar is uh, the weekly bar starting on Monday, uh, the 11th of uh, January 2010. And uh, the open price is 16.18. And uh, the close price on the Friday is uh, 15.80. So as you can see, downsampling open, high, low, close data isn't uh, that simple. But uh, finally, we are there. And now we can actually uh, visualize uh, the weekly candles. And for example, we could do this for uh, the time period uh, May to September 2017. And here we have now weekly candles, for example, here for the week starting on the 19th of uh, June 2017. So thanks for watching and see you also in the next lecture. Bye. All right, technical analysis uses historical price and also volume data. And so far we have only worked with price data. So let's focus on trading volume as well. And we still have saved uh, GE with uh, the prices and also some more information on the daily trading volume. 
And uh, the daily trading volume is here in uh, stock units, so number of uh, traded stocks. And actually Cufflinks allows us to create a candlestick chart with uh, the trading volume in one figure. And uh, we can do that with a so-called uh, Cufflinks uh, quant fig object. And uh, we can create a quant fig object with uh, cufflinks.quantfig. And let's have a look inside here. So here we have to pass a data frame with uh, the columns open, high, low, close, and also volume. So we select here GE and only a May 2017. So let's create uh, the quantfig object and let's save the object in uh, QF. And obviously the data type is here a cufflinks uh, quantfig object and uh, we can also use uh, the iplot method on a quantfig object and uh, we can determine here for example the title and the name of uh, the plot of the interactive plot and actually iplot is creating here a candlestick chart so this is nothing new and uh, the only difference is that uh, the colors are different so for bullish candles we have a kind of here a blue color and uh, for bearish uh, candles, we have a gray color. And uh, the reason why we get here a candlestick chart is that uh, there's here the parameter kind in uh, the uh, quantfig uh, method. And uh, the default setting is candlestick. So we have here a default quantfig chart for GE and uh, now we can add uh, some more technical indicators and also the trading volume to the quantfig chart. And uh, we can actually do this uh, with uh, QF. And if we press here the tab key, then we can see that we can add uh, many things uh, to our quantfig chart. And for example, we can add the volume with add volume. And it seems uh, that nothing happens here. But now if we rerun uh, the iplot method, then we add uh, the trading volume. Here below we have uh, the trading volume. And if we set uh, the color change parameter to false, then each volume bar here will have a fill color depending on if uh, the volume data itself had a positive or negative change. So here we have an increase in trading volume and therefore we have here kind of a blue-green color. Then we have a decrease, 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 then increase, increase, and so on. So to sum up, a cufflinks quantfig object allows us uh, to interactively plot candlestick chart and uh, a volume chart in, in one figure. And in the next lecture you will learn how to add uh, some more technical indicators so thanks for watching and see you there. All right, we can add uh, various technical indicators uh, to a quantfig chart and uh, we still have saved here GE and then we can create a quantfig object uh, for the time period 217 till 218. And then we can discover the available technical indicators with the QF dot and uh, then we can press uh, the tab key. And uh, for example, we can add uh, Bollinger Bands or we can add Exponential Moving Averages or Simple Moving Averages. So let's add uh, the Simple Moving Average uh, with uh, periods equals 20. And uh, this calculates uh, the average price over the most uh, recent uh, 20 days. And uh, then let's have a look here with uh, iplot. So here we have uh, the candlesticks and in blue we have uh, the SMA20, the simple moving average 20. And actually a simple moving average uh, kind of uh, smoothens uh, the data. And uh, then we can add another simple moving average uh, with a different window, for example 100 days. And here we have now the SMA20 and uh, the SMA100. So this is 100 and uh, this is 20. And uh, having two different SMA curves allows us uh, to create a so-called uh, SMA crossover strategy. And uh, we will see this in detail in one of the next sections.
but for the time being let's uh, go on and uh, we can also add bollinger bands for example to the sma 20 so we select here 20 periods and a standard deviation of two and let's have a look so here we have now the upper band and uh, the lower band for the sma 20 so now let's restore our quant fig and uh, let's select uh, the period from May till September 2017. And then we can add uh, some more technical indicators like MACD, which stands for Moving Average Convergence Divergence. And uh, we have here some parameters and uh, also some default arguments. And also we can add uh, DMI which stands for Directional Movement Index. So there, let's add uh, those two and let's have a look. And uh, here we have uh, the MACD line and uh, the MACD signal line and also some lines for the Directional Movement Index. So this is uh, just a demonstration that it's uh, pretty simple and straightforward to actually visualize uh, those technical indicators here with cufflinks and uh, cufflinks uh, quant figures. And uh, with uh, this we have reached uh, the end of this lecture. Thanks for watching and uh, see you also in the next one. Bye. One of the most basic concepts in technical analysis is uh, the trend in prices using trend lines. And the market is said to be in an uptrend if prices are consistently reaching higher highs and uh, retracing to higher lows. And likewise, a market is said to be in a downtrend if prices are consistently uh, declining to lower lows and uh, retracing to lower highs. So this sounds complicated, but it isn't. And uh, we still have saved uh, GE. And uh, now let's create a cufflinks uh, quant fig for the year 2012 and uh, let's have a look here and here in the year 2012 we can identify an uptrend so starting here and in an uptrend a trend line connects uh, the increasing lows in price so we are starting here at uh, this low and uh, then we have here another low and another low and uh, now we should connect uh, the increasing lows uh, to create uh, the trend line here in an uptrend. And for example, we could uh, connect uh, the low here on the 12th of uh, July 2012. So we use here qf.add trend line and uh, we have to pass here two dates. So two dates uh, where we have lows, date zero, and uh, this is here the 12th of July 2012. And uh, the second day is actually here. It's uh, the 4th of uh, September 2012. And uh, now let's add here the trend line. And we can also go here inside. And uh, by default, uh, the trend line here is on uh, closing prices. But we could change this. And let's uh, recreate here the interactive plot. And here we have now in red uh, the trend line. And many technical traders follow the rule that when the price crosses uh, the trend line by a significant amount, this is a so-called uh, breakdown. So here we have the trend line and here we have the clear breakdown. And uh, this breakdown from an uptrend may signal the end of the uptrend and investors uh, should sell somewhere here. Now let's also come to downtrends and in a downtrend, a trend line connects uh, the decreasing highs in price. And uh, this time we consider here the year 2018, also for GE. And in this year we can clearly see a downtrend. And uh, now let's connect uh, the uh, decreasing highs. And uh, for example, we could identify here the first uh, decreasing high. So here we have uh, the first high, high, then uh, the second high, then the third high. And we have decreasing highs. And uh, we could here start on the 22nd of May 2018. And uh, the second high could be on the 9th of October 2018. It's here. So let's uh, create here a trend line. 
And uh, then let's uh, replot here. And also here are some technical traders wait uh, until the price crosses the uh, trend line by a significant amount. And uh, this is also called a breakout from a downtrend. And uh, this may signal the end of the downtrend and uh, investors should buy. So we can't see here a breakout, but maybe somewhere here the prices goes up and then it uh, significantly breaks here the downward uh, trend line. And uh, this might be or maybe a signal to buy the instrument. So this was an introduction to trend lines. Uh, thanks for watching and uh, see you in the next lecture. Bye. All right, in this lecture we are coming to support and resistance levels. So at a price support level, buying is expected to emerge that uh, prevents further price decreases and at uh, price uh, resistance levels, selling is expected to emerge that prevents further price increases. And uh, once uh, the price uh, breaks support or resistance levels, some uh, technical traders expect uh, that the most uh, recent trend will continue. So if a support level is breached, then the traders expect the prices to a further decline. And if a resistance level is breached, then the traders expect prices to further increase. Now let's have a look at some examples. And we have already seen the support and the resistance lines as the trend lines can be interpreted as support and the resistance lines. So let's go back here to our uptrend line. And uh, uptrend lines uh, can be seen as support lines. And once uh, the prices cross uh, the support line, like here, this is also called a breakdown and uh, this uh, could be a signal to sell. And likewise, downtrend lines can be seen as uh, resistance lines. And uh, once uh, the price crosses uh, the resistance line, so let's assume that the price increases here and crosses uh, the uh, resistance line, then uh, this is also called breakout and uh, this could be a signal to buy the instrument. Now, in addition to trend lines, support and uh, resistance levels uh, frequently appear at uh, psychologically important prices, such as the round number prices and also um, historical highs and lows. And uh, that's exactly what uh, we are going uh, to examine here in uh, this video. And uh, we still have GE and uh, let's create a quant fig for the year 2012. And first of all, let's start uh, with a uh, resistance level. And uh, one could argue here that here we have a price uh, resistance level at uh, $20. So this is a round number and also this is a high here. So here we have a high and uh, the price uh, doesn't break actually and also here. And uh, therefore we could add a resistance line here. And uh, for example, we could uh, select uh, the 28th of March 2012. And uh, we can do this uh, with uh, the method add uh, resistance. And by default it's on uh, the high price, so here. So let's add and let's uh, rerun. And here we have now our resistance line. And uh, we don't breach uh, the resistance level here, here and also here. And then here it uh, then uh, breaks or breaches uh, the resistance uh, level. And uh, this could be a signal to buy the instrument. Next, let's also have a look at an example for support lines. And uh, here we consider the year 2013. And uh, one could argue that uh, we have a support level here around about uh, $22. And uh, we could select uh, the 24th of June 2013. So it's uh, here actually. And here in this example, we don't see a breakdown, but let's assume that in the future, the price uh, breaks here, the support level, then uh, this uh, could be a signal to sell the instrument.
Finally, there's another important principle in technical analysis. It's uh, the change in polarity. And let's have a look here above. And uh, some traders believe uh, that the breached uh, resistance levels uh, become support levels and that the uh, breached uh, support levels become resistance levels. And uh, this could be an example for this. So originally we had here a resistance level at uh, around about $20 and uh, then we break here the resistance level and then the resistance level became a support level here. But finally, then uh, the support level is breached here. So this was a brief introduction to support and uh, resistance levels. A lot of uh, psychology is involved here and uh, there's also quite uh, some room for interpretation. Thanks for watching and see you in the next lecture. Bye. All right, the SMA crossover strategy is probably the most popular and well-known trading strategy in the market. And SMA stands for simple moving average. And uh, the most commonly used setting is uh, SMA 200 versus SMA 50. So we will see this in the next lectures, uh, what uh, this actually means. And uh, the most important question for any trading strategy is, how did uh, the strategy perform in the past? And uh, how likely is it uh, that uh, we will see a similar performance in the future? And uh, this is also referred to backtesting and forward testing. And uh, the general rule in algorithmic trading is no trading without extensive backtesting. Otherwise, it's uh, just uh, guessing and gambling. Now, in this section, we will examine uh, the SMA crossover strategy with uh, two exemplary stocks. So Disney and uh, Microsoft. And uh, first of all, we need Pandas, NumPy, Nose, Matplotlib, and then I have uh, created a little data set, so taken from Yahoo Finance with uh, Microsoft and Disney and uh, only uh, the daily closing prices. So for the 10 year time period from uh, mid of 2012 until mid uh, 2022 and in total we have here 2515 trading days. And uh, we can also check some meta information so we have uh, no missing values. And then we can create a simple price chart. So with uh, both stocks and uh, in green we have here Microsoft and in blue Disney. And uh, we can see that uh, the performance of Microsoft is obviously better. So it's a stable increase until 2022. And then we have uh, the crisis in 2022. And in comparison to that, uh, Disney is a bit more up and down, but uh, still there's a price increase in the 10 year time period. And now for backtesting, it's best uh, to work uh, with log returns. And uh, we can create a log returns here with uh, the following code. So we have now daily log returns and uh, we will continue here in the very next lecture. Thanks for watching and see you there. Bye. All right, we still have saved uh, the close prices and also the uh, log returns. And uh, before we create and analyze an SMA crossover strategy, first of all, let's analyze uh, a simple buy and hold strategy. So that's not uh, really a strategy, at least uh, not an active one. And uh, buy and hold actually assumes uh, that we buy the stock in uh, 2012, so at uh, the beginning of July. And uh, we just hold uh, the stocks for 10 years without further trades. And uh, we could simply measure the performance uh, with metrics like the multiple or the compound annual growth rate or the annualized risk. So that's uh, the plan for this lecture. And actually this should uh, just be a repetition. And uh, we have learned before that uh, we can calculate uh, the multiple as follows. So we can either sum up log returns and uh, use E here. And uh, for Disney, we have here a multiple of 1.96 and for Microsoft of 8.51. And uh, this means uh, that for each and every dollar invested in the year 2012, we actually have uh, almost $2 or $8.5 uh, now in the year 2022. 
And uh, there's also a second way how we can calculate it. So we can simply divide uh, the last price by the very first price. And uh, this gives uh, the multiple as well. Now to compare different instruments, it definitely makes sense to normalize prices to uh, the same uh, base. So for example, starting with a base value of one, and uh, we can do this here with the uh, sum and np.exp. And here we have the normalized prices. So the data frame with uh, the normalized prices, and then we can plot the normalized prices. And uh, this assumes uh, that uh, we started uh, with an investment of $1 in each stock in the year 2012. And then you can see that uh, Microsoft performed better. So after 10 years, uh, we have $8.5. And uh, with uh, the Disney stock, we could manage to turn $1 into around about $2 with a simple buy and hold strategy. So this is uh, the multiple, but uh, we can also calculate uh, the compound annual growth rate and uh, the annualized risk. And uh, if for stocks, and in particular for US stocks, it's a common practice to use and assume 252 trading days per year on average. So this is uh, the calendar year without uh, weekends and uh, bank holidays. And then we can create a simple user-defined function, annualize the risk and return. And uh, we have to pass a data frame, a returns data frame. And then the function returns a summary data frame with uh, the annualized uh, risk and uh, the compound annual growth rate. So we simply calculate here the standard deviation of returns times uh, the square root of 252. And for the compound annual growth rate, we actually take uh, the mean return, mean log return times uh, the number of days. So this is how it works. And now let's define here the function and let's create the summary data frame for Microsoft and for Disney. And it's no surprise that the compound annual growth rate is higher for Microsoft. So over the last 10 years, we had a compound annual growth rate of 24% compared to around about 7% for Disney. And uh, we shouldn't forget that uh, this is just uh, the price return, so without dividends. However, for active trading strategies where we buy and sell uh, the stock, it's appropriate to assume that uh, we don't benefit uh, from dividend payments. So we just take into account here the price increase and decrease. So the price return only and uh, the risk is uh, pretty similar. So here around 25, 26% per year. And uh, this was just uh, the buy and hold strategy and uh, we will continue now with uh, the simple moving average crossover strategy. Thanks for watching and see you in the next lecture. Bye. All right, let's define an SMA crossover strategy and let's start from scratch. So we import pandas, numpy and also matplotlib and uh, we load uh, the Microsoft Disney CSV file. So here we have the close prices and uh, let's focus first on uh, the Disney stock. And uh, later I will provide a little class that allows us to change inputs like uh, the stock or the time period or whatever. So let's select uh, the Disney time series only and uh, let's rename here the column header to price. And then let's start uh, with uh, the most uh, commonly used uh, SMA settings. So we have SMA short 50, so 50 days and SMA long 200 days. And now let me explain what a simple moving average is. So we can actually calculate a moving average uh, with uh, the combination of rolling and mean. And actually the rolling method provides the uh, rolling window calculations. And the most important, uh, we have to define uh, the rolling window. So to say the size of uh, the moving window and uh, by passing 50, we actually take into account uh, the last 50 trading days. So at each and every day, we uh, take into account uh, the most uh, recent 50 days. And then we have to chain an aggregation method like uh, the mean. So the question is, uh, what are we doing with uh, the latest uh, 50 prices or 50 uh, trading days? 
And uh, for example, we could take uh, the mean, so calculate the average, and uh, this is uh, the rolling mean, or in other words, uh, the uh, moving average. And actually, it's called the simple moving average because we have equal weighting, so all 50 days are equally weighted. And in contrast to that, for example, an exponential moving average puts more weight on uh, the most uh, recent prices or days. But here in this section, we will stick uh, to uh, the simple moving average. And it shouldn't be any surprise that here in the first uh, 49 days, uh, we have missing values because uh, for in the first 49 days, we cannot take into account uh, the most 50 days. So we get uh, the first value after 49 or 50 days. And uh, for example, here, the 50 days uh, moving average price on the 29th of uh, June is 106.55. So this is simply the average price over the last 50 days. So this is how it works. And now we can actually add uh, the column SMA short. So 50 days is uh, the shorter window. So here we have the price, then SMA 50. And then we also add SMA long with uh, 200 days. And uh, we can actually double check here the number of missing values. So in the price column, we have no missing values. So then in the short column, we have 49 missing values. And in the long column, we have 199 missing values. And it makes sense to drop uh, the rows where we have missing values. So now our data frame starts in April 2013. And on that day, we can see that uh, the price is actually higher than SMA 50 and SMA 50 is higher than SMA 200. And uh, we can also visualize this so for the complete time period. So we have in blue the price and then in green uh, the SMA 50 and in red uh, the SMA 200 and uh, calculating uh, the simple moving average kind of uh, smoothens uh, the data here or the price chart. And now we can also have a look at a shorter time period. So for example, the year 2016. So the price in blue, then SMA 50 in green and SMA 200 in red. And uh, the question is now, so how is uh, this here useful? to actually create and define a, an active uh, trading strategy. And uh, the underlying idea of uh, the SMA crossover strategy is as follows. So it's kind of a momentum strategy and this means uh, that it assumes uh, that the most uh, recent uh, price trends persists in the near future. And uh, we should keep in mind here that uh, the SMA 50, so the shorter SMA, captures uh, the more recent price trend compared to the SMA 200 because uh, the SMA 50 only takes into account the 50 uh, most recent days while uh, the SMA 200 takes into account a longer history here. So the SMA 50 captures uh, the more recent price trend and therefore we can uh, define uh, the following trading rules. So if we believe that uh, the most recent price trends uh, persists in the near future, then if uh, the SMA 50 crosses above uh, the SMA 200, then uh, this can be viewed as an indicator for further price increases. So the more recent trend is in the uh, price increase and uh, therefore this is a signal uh, to buy the stock and on the other hand side, if the SMA 50 crosses below the SMA 200, then uh, this can be viewed as an indicator for further price increases. And uh, therefore it's a sell signal. And as an example, let's have a look here at the year 2016. So we start here with the following situation. So we have SMA short, which is above SMA long, and then it crosses below the SMA long and this crossover is a signal to actually sell the stock because it assumes uh, that uh, the stock price further decreases. And in this case, it's actually true here. And then at the end of uh, 2016, we have another crossover and uh, this time uh, the SMA short crosses a 
buff uh, the SMA long and uh, this is a signal to buy the stock and therefore we have here the following uh, trading positions. So buying uh, the stock means uh, taking a long position and the long position is uh, plus one. And uh, for the selling we have for the following cases. So if uh, short selling or going short is allowed and or desired then selling means uh, taking a short position so minus one and if uh, short selling is not allowed or not desired then selling means simply taking a neutral position zero so having no position in the stock and actually one more time a long position means uh, that we own the stock and uh, that we benefit from uh, rising prices and a short position means uh, that uh, we short uh, the sell the stock and that we benefit from falling prices and now for this and the next lectures let's assume that uh, short selling is allowed and uh, desired then we can define the following long short strategy so we have to define a trading position that uh, we have over time and uh, we can actually define this with np.var. So whenever the SMA short is greater than the SMA long, then uh, we go long. So we have a long position plus one. And uh, in all other cases, uh, we have a short position minus one. So let's create uh, the additional column position here on the right. And uh, for example, here at the end of the day, the SMA short is greater than the SMA long and therefore the trading position is one for the next day. So we shouldn't forget that uh, here we have closing prices so at the end of the trading day and uh, also the SMAs are at the end of the trading day and therefore the position that uh, we define is for the next the trading day. So on the next trading day we should take a long position and then at the end of uh, the 22nd of April, at the end of that day, the position is still one. So we keep the position in the next day and so on. And now we can plot SMA short, SMA long and uh, the trading position in one graph. And uh, we put uh, the position on the a secondary Y axis. So let's have a look here. So left we can see uh, the price and uh, write uh, the position so either minus one or plus one and here in red we have the trading positions so these are the changes in trading position over time so we have a couple of changes from short to long and from long to short and let's just uh, zoom in here into the year 2016 so initially the SMA short uh, was greater than the SMA long and therefore we started here with a long position and uh, then we have here a crossover from above and here at uh, that day we have to switch our position so changing from long to short and then we keep a short position until here where we go long again. So this is uh, the idea behind an SMA crossover strategy and uh, these are the trading positions. And now the most important question is, so how did uh, this particular strategy perform in the past? And uh, we will backtest uh, the strategy in the next lectures. Thanks for watching and see you there. Bye. Now we still have safe DF with SMA short and SMA long and uh, we have the trading position. And now the plan is uh, to actually uh, calculate and get the log returns for buy and hold and also for the strategy and uh, for buy and hold it's simply the returns how we calculated it before so using here the price so this isn't anything new and now let's move on with the strategy and uh, the idea is as follows so whenever we have a long position then uh, the daily uh, strategy return is uh, the very same as uh, buy and hold and whenever we have a short position the strategy return is simply minus one times uh, the buy and hold return. So to calculate uh, the strategy return, we can simply multiply the position with uh, the buy and hold return, but uh, we shouldn't forget to actually shift here the position by one. And uh, once again, the reason for this is as follows. 
So the position, the trading position is at uh, the end of uh, the trading day and it's actually for the next day, so for the, for the next row. And therefore we have uh, to shift uh, the position by one row. And then we simply multiply with uh, the buy and hold returns. And uh, when the position is one, then uh, the strategy return is simply equal to the buy and hold return. And if uh, the position is minus one, then it's uh, the negative. So let's create uh, the column strategy. And uh, you can see here, so whenever the position is plus one, then uh, both are equal. And whenever the position is minus one, then for example here, the buy and hold return is plus uh, 3% and uh, the strategy return is minus uh, 3%. And uh, just to remind you, so this simply works because we work with log returns. So with uh, simple returns, it uh, would be incorrect to uh, just uh, multiply with uh, one or minus one. So we have seen this before. And now let's uh, drop here the first row with uh, missing values. And let's uh, measure the performance in terms of compound annual growth rate and annualized risk. So once again, we define here the annualized risk return function, user defined function, and uh, it assumes uh, log returns as an input. So we can pass here the columns returns and strategy, and then we should get the performance of uh, buy and hold. So 5% and a risk of 25.6%. And obviously uh, the strategy performs uh, better, so 7.3%, uh, but uh, the risk is uh, the very same. And uh, the general rule is, so as long as uh, we only have uh, long and short positions and no neutral positions, then uh, the risk is always identical to the buy and hold risk. So we have no neutral positions here and therefore the risk is uh, the same. But obviously in this case, uh, the return is better but uh, we should definitely further analyze and uh, maybe also visualize uh, this. And therefore we should uh, create uh, the normalized prices for buy and hold and also for the strategy. So starting here with uh, the log returns, we can simply create or calculate uh, the normalized prices uh, with a combination of uh, comsum and np.exp. And uh, we create uh, the additional columns buy and hold normalized prices and uh, the normalized prices for the strategy. So here on the right, and uh, it assumes uh, that uh, we start here in the year 2013 with uh, one US dollar. And after nine years, uh, we end up at 1.55 with buy and hold and 1.91 with the strategy. So it seems uh, that uh, the strategy outperforms here buy and hold but uh, we should further analyze and uh, visualize here buy and hold normalized versus uh, the strategy normalized. And here in blue, we have buy and hold. And uh, we can see here in the first uh, two or three years, we have just a long position. So the performance is equal. And uh, then both uh, strategies split here. And it's uh, pretty interesting to see that uh, the strategy underperforms here over the whole time period. But then in the last couple of days or months, the strategy actually catches up and then creates an outperformance here in the last couple of days or weeks. And uh, we could conclude that the, the strategy performs well, in particular during uh, bear markets. So whenever the prices fall, then uh, the strategy performs uh, pretty well here, but over longer time periods. So it's hard to say, or it's not uh, reasonable to say that uh, the strategy outperforms buy and hold. So this is definitely not the case. And uh, we can simply calculate here the difference. So the outperformance, it's a uh, 35%. However, once again, if you ask if uh, there's a reliable or stable outperformance of uh, the strategy, then uh, the answer is definitely no, but uh, we need uh, a deeper analysis here, of course. And maybe a more detailed analysis will show us uh, that uh, at least in bear markets, uh, the strategy performs or outperforms buy and hold, but uh, this uh, requires further analysis. But uh, this is beyond uh, the scope of uh, this lecture here. And uh, finally, 
So what we actually did here is vectorized backtesting because uh, we backtested uh, the performance of a strategy with the vectorized Python code. And uh, as you can see, so this makes it pretty simple. The code is pretty simple and lean. And uh, there are more advanced backtesting techniques leading to a lot more difficult code, but uh, these advanced uh, backtesting techniques hardly lead uh, to better results. So vectorized backtesting is uh, definitely a great tool and a simple tool. Thanks for watching and see you in the next lecture. Bye. Now, even if the SMA crossover strategy 5200 is by far the most commonly used one, there's actually no reason why we shouldn't modify the moving windows. So instead of 5200, uh, we could also use uh, 2074 or 75 or whatever. And uh, maybe we will find a setting that works even better than the original one. And uh, this is also called strategy optimization, where we try to find uh, the best uh, parameters or the best combination of parameters of uh, the strategy. So let's start here from scratch and let's load uh, Microsoft Disney. And uh, let's work again with uh, Disney. And then we actually summarize uh, all the code uh, that uh, we developed in the last uh, one or two lectures in one user-defined function run strategy. And the run strategy has here one parameter, so the SMA parameter, where we have to pass in a tuple the SMA long and uh, the SMA short and uh, what the run strategy actually does. So we uh, use here DF, then we add log returns, then the short SMA, the long SMA, the trading position, and then also the return, so the log returns of uh, the trading strategy. And finally, run strategy returns uh, the multiples of buy and hold and the strategy. So that's simply a reorganization of the code that uh, we have seen before. And let's define here the function. And for example, let's run again the strategy 5200. So we pass here a tuple 5200 to SMA. And uh, we have seen these multiples before. So the strategy 5200 uh, performs better than buy and hold. But again, it's not really stable over time. And now we can also backtest other strategies. So for example, with uh, the short SMA 10 days and the long one 50 days. And obviously this uh, works even better, but uh, we should take into account that uh, the period of analysis is here longer because here in this case we only lose uh, the first 50 days and in this case uh, the first uh, 200 days. So the analysis period is here longer and at least uh, that's uh, the reason uh, why the multiple for buy and hold is different here. But it seems uh, that uh, also the strategy works better with uh, the setting and finally, we could also run the strategy 20 to 252. So on average, uh, we have 20 to trading days per month and 250 to uh, trading days per year. And uh, this leads uh, to the following multiples. Now we could try many combinations here manually, but of course uh, we can also automate uh, this uh, with uh, Python and uh, we can run an optimization uh, that actually finds uh, the optimal strategy that uh, maximizes uh, the uh, strategy multiple and therefore we could actually use uh, the very simple brute optimizer from scipy.optimize and uh, brute uh, simply uh, tries all possible combinations and uh, finds uh, actually the best one and it's important to understand uh, that uh, Brute can only minimize. So if you want to maximize uh, the multiple, then this means uh, that uh, we could minimize uh, the negative multiple. And therefore, I slightly modified here run strategy here in the final coding line. And uh, here I selected uh, the strategy multiple only and uh, the negative one. So the goal of uh, the Brute Force Optimizer is now actually to minimize here the result of a run strategy. So let's uh, redefine here run strategy and uh, then we can actually use uh, the brute force optimizer and uh, we have to pass here a function to be minimized. So run strategy and then we have to pass here ranges. So this is uh, the range for SMA short 
And this means uh, that uh, we check all strategies from uh, 10 to 50 with a step size of one. And uh, this is uh, the stopple here is for SMA long. So for all settings between 100 and 252 with uh, a step size of one. And therefore in total we test here 51 times 153 combinations. So quite a lot of uh, combinations and uh, running here the optimizer takes uh, some time. So let's uh, run here. And now Brute uh, checks all combinations and calculates uh, the multiple and finds uh, the highest multiple or to say the lowest negative multiple. So after a couple of moments, Brute actually returned uh, the optimal combination. So SMA short is uh, 23 days and SMA long 189 days. And now we can also get uh, the multiple of this optimal strategy. So we can uh, run strategy one more time with uh, 23, 189. And uh, the multiple is here. So the maximum multiple 3.82. Now this is how optimization works in general, but uh, there are a couple of things uh, that uh, we have to take into account here. And uh, we will continue in the next lectures. Thanks for watching and see you there. Bye. We are coming now to a very important aspect, trades and uh, trading costs. And uh, so far we assumed that the stock trading is for free, but uh, that's of course not true. So we have to pay commissions and also the bid ask spread negatively affects uh, the performance of any active trading strategy. And uh, the rule is pretty simple. So the more trades and the more frequent uh, we change trading positions, the higher the trading costs and uh, the higher the impact of uh, trading. And therefore omitting trading costs is a frequently made mistake in uh, trading or algorithmic trading. Because even if a trading strategy is profitable before costs, it doesn't mean that it is profitable after the deduction of uh, trading costs. And uh, analyzing the impact of trading costs is our plan for the next two lectures. And uh, we start here from scratch and uh, we load the data. And in uh, this lecture, so for the time being, we work with uh, the Disney stock. So here we have uh, the close prices. And then I've aggregated all the code in uh, one uh, function. So the run strategy function that uh, creates returns, SMA short, SMA long, the trading position, uh, the log returns of the strategy, and also the uh, normalized price of buy and hold and uh, the normalized price of the strategy. And finally, it uh, returns uh, the full data frame. So this is in a nutshell what uh, the strategy actually does. And now let's run the strategy with uh, the setting 50, 200, and let's save uh, the complete data frame in DF. So here we have uh, all columns. And once again, we can see here that uh, in terms of the multiple, the strategy performed better than buy and hold. And here we have uh, the trading position, and it might make sense now to further analyze uh, the trading positions and the change of uh, the trading positions. So let's uh, visualize uh, the trading positions over time. And uh, we have a couple of uh, full trades. So full trades in terms of uh, we change from long to short and from short to long. And actually changing uh, the trading position from long to short means that uh, originally, for example, we own one stock and then to go short one stock, we have to sell two stocks so we actually have here two trades. So we sell two stocks. Then if we start with one short stock, we have to buy one stock to go neutral and another one to go long. So essentially we have here two trades. And uh, with this, we can determine the number of trades uh, for the complete uh, time period. So actually the difference in the trading position, so from uh, one row to another is actually the number of trades and uh, we need uh, the absolute uh, quantity. So if we change uh, position from minus one to plus one, we have two trades and also from plus one to minus one, two trades. And obviously here we can't uh, see any trades in the, in the first five days or the last five days. 
So let's uh, further analyze uh, this and let's create here the column traits. And then we can count the number of trades. So in uh, 2000, the 300 trading days, we don't trade at all. And in the whole time period, we change uh, the position 13 times. So we have uh, 13 times a full trade with uh, actually uh, two single trades. And actually we can filter DF for all those uh, days where we have trades. So here, and uh, the first one is on the 2nd of October, 2015. And uh, we could uh, simply go here inside. So October, 2015. And uh, we started here with a long position. And at the end of the 1st October, the position is still long. And uh, then one day later, so at the end of uh, the 2nd, then suddenly SMA long is uh, greater than SMA short. And uh, this means uh, the position for the next trading day should be minus one. And therefore at the end of uh, that day, we make two trades. So we sell two stocks to actually move from a long position to a short position. And then on the next day, we already have a short position. And uh, here the strategy return is negative and buy and hold positive. So now we do have identified the number of trades per day and in the next lecture we will actually calculate the trading costs and to subtract the trading costs from the performance. Thanks for watching and see you there. Bye. Now I've created a little Python class, the SMA backtester class. And uh, this class allows us to partly automate uh, the backtesting process. And also it allows us to easily change and modify assumptions and parameters. And essentially the class structures and organizes the code that we have developed in the last lectures. So there's actually nothing new here, just organized in a Python class. And we might have a closer look at the class later on. But for now, let's just use the class. And we need pandas, numpy, matplotlib, and also brute the brute force optimizer. And let's uh, define here the SMA backtester class. And now we have uh, a couple of uh, parameters or arguments. So we need uh, the file path of uh, the CSV file where we want to load the data from. Then we have to define the proportional trading or transaction cost. And uh, for now, let's assume a zero cost. And uh, then we have to define uh, the symbol and uh, let's stick for a while to Disney. And then we have SMA short and SMA long. And finally, we have uh, the start date and the end date of uh, the analysis period. So let's start uh, with uh, the full period from 2012 until 2022, so mid off. And then we can create an SMA backtester object with SMA backtester. And let's have a look inside. So this is a class for the vectorized backtesting of SMA-based trading strategies. And uh, we need to pass here a couple of arguments uh, to the parameters. And uh, first of all, we have here the file path. Then we need uh, the symbol, then SMA short, SMA long, start, end, then the proportional trading costs. And finally, uh, we have here the parameter cell position and let's check this here. So the default value is minus one and uh, the other possible value is zero. And uh, here we can define uh, whether we want to allow short selling or not. So if you want to allow short selling, then uh, we should pass here minus one. And otherwise uh, we have to pass a zero. So for a long only strategy. And uh, let's start here with uh, the setting that we had in the previous lectures. So this is an SMA backtester object and then we can simply run the backtest uh, with the test uh, strategy. And we get here a tuple with two numbers. So the first one is uh, the multiple of uh, the strategy 1.91 and uh, the second one is uh, the overperformance. So in terms of multiple compared to buy and hold and in this case, uh, the strategy multiple is higher than uh, the multiple of buy and hold. 
And then we can also create a plot. So this is pretty helpful. And uh, we have here in blue the strategy and in green we have uh, buy and hold. And even if the strategy shows an overperformance, so this is uh, probably not reliable and uh, we shouldn't trade here that strategy in the future. And uh, we can also access uh, the results data frame. So with all the data, so the positions, so the number of trades and so on. And then in the next step, we can optimize uh, the SMA parameters. So the range for SMA short uh, could be between uh, 10 and 50 and the range for SMA long between 100 and 252. And once again, the optimal strategy is here 23, 189, leading to a multiple of 3.8. And uh, then we can uh, immediately and directly plot here the optimized strategy one more time. So now this looks more promising here, but still it's not reliable. So the outperformance is coming here from the couple of uh, months or weeks in the year 2022. So this was uh, the analysis uh, without uh, trading costs and uh, we can simply include here trading costs. So for example, if we assume proportional trading costs of uh, 0.5%, then we have to recreate here the tester object. And then let's test again uh, 50, 200, but now with trading costs and uh, the after costs multiple will be decreased so from 1.91 to 1.67. So there is an impact of uh, trading costs here if we assume 0.5% proportional trading costs. Now, so far we have uh, backtested Disney, but uh, now we can simply switch to another symbol. So for example, Microsoft. And uh, theoretically we could have a CSV file with hundreds of stocks. So there's no limit here. And let's start uh, again with 50, 200. And let's create here the backtester object uh, for Microsoft. And uh, let's test here the strategy 50, 200. And actually this will lead uh, to a multiple of uh, 3.9, but uh, there's a significant underperformance compared to buy and hold. And it's best uh, to just uh, visualize uh, this here. So in green, we have buy and hold. And in blue, we have the strategy, so there's a clear underperformance. So with the buy and hold, we would end up at a multiple of 8.5 or 4 something. And we can conclude here that the prediction power of uh, SMA 5200 for Microsoft is rather low. But uh, we can try to optimize here the strategy and find uh, the optimal parameters. And uh, this takes a few seconds here. And obviously the optimal set of parameters for Microsoft is uh, 35,227. And let's also visualize this here. And uh, at least we are coming pretty close uh, to buy and hold. But still we can conclude that a long short SMA crossover strategy is uh, not uh, the best idea, at least uh, for the two stocks, Microsoft and Disney. But uh, we have a couple of other parameters here. So for example, so far we have backtested long short uh, strategies, but uh, we can also switch to long only. And uh, also we can change here the periods and more. So thanks for watching and see you in the next lectures. Bye. All right, so far we have backtested a long short uh, trading strategy. So for example, here for Microsoft. So this is uh, the optimized uh, version 35,227. And the long short means uh, that we take a short position when uh, there is a signal to sell the instrument. And now let's change uh, this assumption and let's backtest a long only strategy. And uh, this means uh, that we go long if there's a signal to buy and uh, we go or stay neutral if there's a signal to sell. So let's do this here one more time for Microsoft. 
and uh, we create a backtest object and uh, this time we change here the cell position from minus one short to zero neutral so long only and then we can uh, test uh, the strategy 50 200 and uh, then we can also optimize uh, the parameters one more time And we have here the optimal strategy 35, 227. And let's uh, visualize here again. And obviously if we compare here the long only strategy with uh, the long short strategy, then it seems uh, that uh, long only works better. And actually we can say that for stocks uh, that have a long term price trend uh, to increase in prices, very often uh, the long only strategy is better and for other instruments like forex long short could be better because forex over longer periods is oscillating around a long term mean and the price increases and decreases are equally likely and therefore a long short is more promising for oscillating instruments but i mean this is just a very simplified view and it always depends on the specific case and the specific instrument Thanks for watching and see you at the next lecture. Bye. Hi and welcome to the appendix. So here in the appendix I've added a detailed Python crash course for complete Python beginners and also for students who need a refresher. And uh, whenever you have problems uh, with the one or the other coding concept in the main parts of the course, then it's pretty likely that you will find a more detailed explanation here in the crash course. So now let me briefly guide you through the appendix. So we start here with uh, appendix one, but first of all, please keep in mind that you can download all resources for the appendix here in lecture 210. So here you can download appendix materials, uh, the zip file, and then you can unzip the file and then you can open uh, the Jupyter notebooks. So let's start here with the appendix one and uh, here we will cover the very basics of Python coding. So using uh, Python as a calculator and uh, we also cover here some finance basics. And then we have variables, uh, lists, data types, for loops and many more things and also while loops. Then we will continue here with Appendix 2, where you will learn how to create user-defined functions. So creating user-defined functions uh, makes it a lot easier. Then Appendix 3 covers uh, the three important data science libraries, NumPy, Pandas, and Matplotlib. So in the course, uh, we will heavily work with Pandas to actually analyze and uh, manipulate tabular data so we start here with NumPy arrays and then we move on with uh, pandas data frames. And uh, you will learn all the basics here. So for example, how to filter data frames. And then we will also cover matplotlib for plotting, for data plotting. So for example, histograms and the scatter plots. And finally, we will also cover Seaborn for advanced plotting. So for example, statistical plotting and then we have also here group by, and then we have appendix four with uh, some additional advanced uh, pandas uh, time series functions. So for example, time zones and uh, time zone converting. And last but not least, uh, we have appendix five. It's an introduction, a very simple introduction to object oriented programming. And uh, here you will learn how you can actually create uh, classes. So many students uh, struggle with OOP and classes. And I do think uh, that uh, I do provide here a very simple and intuitive way how you can actually learn creating classes. So this is uh, the appendix. Have fun and uh, looking forward to seeing you in the next lectures and sections. Bye. Hi and welcome. This video is about the time value of money concept, which is uh, probably the most important and most fundamental concept in finance. And actually the basic idea behind the time value of money concept is that uh, one dollar today is uh, worth more than one dollar tomorrow. 
And uh, this is uh, the case because uh, you can invest or save your dollar today and earn a positive interest until tomorrow or until in uh, one year, for example. So when somebody offers you the option to give you one dollar either today or in one year, you should actually select today and invest or save the dollar to earn interest on it. So let's have a look at uh, some examples here. And first of all, we have uh, $100 today and uh, we can save uh, the $100 at an interest rate of uh, 3%. And uh, second, uh, again, we have $100 and uh, we save our $100 for three years at an interest rate of uh, 3% uh, per year. And the question is now, what uh, value do we have after one year or after three years? And this is also the so-called uh, future value. So $100 is uh, the present value today and the value of uh, the $100 in one year or in uh, three years is uh, the future value. And calculating the future value is uh, actually pretty straightforward. So this is here the formula. So we have uh, the present value times uh, 1 plus r. So r is uh, the interest rate, for example, uh, 3% and then to the power of n, so n is uh, the number of periods. And actually the concept of uh, compound interest or interest on interest is uh, deeply embedded in the time value of money concept and in the formula here. So when an investment is subject to compound interest, uh, the growth in the value of the investment from period to period reflects uh, not only the interest earned on the original principal, so here $100, but also the interest earned on the previous uh, period's interest earnings. So the interest on uh, the interest. So let's go to the solutions of our examples here. And first of all, we have uh, $100 today and we can actually save or invest the $100 at an interest rate of uh, 3%. So here we have uh, one plus R is uh, 1.03. And in one year, consequently, we have uh, $103. So this is uh, the future value of our present value, 100. And the calculation here is uh, pretty straightforward. So here it is. And now let's go to the three years example. So we have uh, $100 today. And uh, then we save uh, the $100 for one year. And after one year, our $100 is worth $103. And uh, then we again save or invest uh, the $103. And uh, we not only get uh, interest on our original principal 100, but also on the $3 interest uh, that we earned in the first period. So this is uh, compound interest or interest on interest. And then again, we invest our total value after two years uh, for another year here, again at an interest rate of uh, 3%. And uh, finally, we end up at a value of 109.27. So that's uh, the future value after three years. And uh, this is here the calculation. All right, now let's go to present value and uh, some examples here. So we want to have $110 in one year and uh, we can save at a rate of 4.5%. And the question is how many US dollars uh, do we have to save today? to get uh, $110 in one year. And uh, the same example we also have here for an investment period of uh, three years. So how many US dollars uh, to save today at an interest rate of 4.5% to get $110 in uh, three years? So in these examples here, we have uh, the future value 110, then we have uh, the interest rate, and uh, we actually have to calculate uh, the present value and uh, we can do this by discounting the future value. So the computation of the present value works actually in the opposite direction than calculating future values. And uh, this is uh, the formula here. So we have to discount uh, the future value and divide the future value by one plus r to the power of n. And let's have a look how it works in practice here. So we have uh, the future value of 110 in one year and uh, we discount it uh, for one year at an interest rate of 4.5% uh, and we actually get here 105.26. So we could say that getting $110 in one year has uh, the same value as uh, getting $105.26 uh, today. 
And of course, uh, the calculation here is uh, pretty straightforward. And let's go to the second example. So we have $110 after three years and uh, we discount 110, so the future value. And we actually have uh, three periods and in each period we have an interest rate of 4.5%. And uh, finally, we end up at a value today. So the present value of 96.39. So this is uh, the time value of money concept and how to calculate uh, future and present values. And in the next video, we will have a look how this works in Python. So hope to see you there. Bye. In this video, we will use Python as a calculator and we will calculate future values. So we are here in a Jupyter notebook and our task is uh, to calculate the future value of $100 in one year when we have an interest rate of uh, 3%. So let's go here into the next cell and uh, let's type 100 times uh, 1.03. And uh, then let's uh, run the cell here and we get $103. So that's uh, the future value. And it actually doesn't matter if we have here white spaces or not. So this works as well. And also here. Or we could have uh, two white spaces here, so that's uh, no problem. And we can also have an alternative intuition. So in one year we still have uh, the principal of uh, $100 plus actually the interest uh, that we can earn in uh, one year on the $100. And the interest is actually 100 times uh, 3%. And of course we also get here 103. And of course, corresponding to the formula that we learned in the last video, we can also calculate 100 times uh, 1 plus uh, the interest rate. So let's do this here. 100 times and then we have 1 plus uh, 0.03. So this of course uh, works as well. So we can use here brackets. And there's actually one thing that I want to highlight here. So the Python calculator follows the basic algebraic rules. So multiplication or division first and then addition and the subtraction. So let's have a look here. Let's uh, make the same calculation here and I copy here the code and uh, paste it into the next line. And let's assume that uh, we forgot uh, the brackets here. So typically multiplication and division first. And uh, by having the code here, first of all Python calculates 100 uh, times 1. And then it adds 0 0.03 and uh, this uh, gives us here not 103, but 100.03, so that's uh, incorrect here. So same as uh, with any other calculator, we have to set here some brackets. And now let's go to the three years case. And here we have to calculate the future value of $100 in uh, three years at an interest rate of 3% uh, per year. And therefore we can calculate here 100 times 1.03. So that's uh, the value in one year. And then we multiply this uh, with the 1.03 again. So that's uh, the value in two years. And finally we also multiply it uh, again with uh, 1.03 and we get the future value in uh, three years. So that's uh, the long version, but we can also calculate uh, 100 times 1.03 and then to the power of uh, 3. So we have uh, 3 years and we can actually calculate uh, to the power by having 2 times uh, the star symbol here. So this works here and again we have 109.27. All right, thanks for watching and I'll see you also in the next video. Bye. In this video we are going to calculate present values uh, with Python. So here we have our first problem and let's assume that we need to spend $110 in one year. How much US dollars do we have to save today at an interest rate of 4.5% to have $110 in one year? And we've already learned that we can calculate the present values by discounting future values. So here we have the future value 110. And then we divide 110 by 1.045 and uh, we can actually perform divisions uh, with a forward slash. So this is 110 divided by 
1.045 and uh, this uh, gives us 105.26 and of course you can also make this uh, more explicit so let's copy here the code and uh, let's paste and uh, let's create some brackets here and uh, instead of having 1.045 uh, we have one plus uh, the interest rate of uh, 0.045 and uh, let's uh, close uh, the brackets here. So this is of course uh, the same. And of course also here we have to follow the rule multiplication and division first and then addition and subtraction. So let's uh, copy here the code. And let's assume that uh, we forgot uh, the brackets here. Then of course we get a different result which is incorrect. So 110.045. And now let's come to the second problem. So here we have to calculate uh, the present value over three years. So we have uh, the future value of 110 and uh, we have to discount uh, the future value by uh, three periods. So that's a discounting over three periods uh, with an interest rate of 4.5% and we get here uh, the present value of uh, 96.39 and also here there's a short version of doing this so let's uh, copy it here and uh, we can actually take here uh, the power of uh, 3 so 1.045 to the power of uh, 3 years and of course uh, this gives uh, the same result here all right thanks for watching and i'll see you also in the next video bye in the last lectures we calculated future values and present values and actually in our formulas uh, there's uh, another variable, it's uh, the interest rate. And in this video we will calculate interest rates and also stock returns. And let's have a look at an example here. So here we have uh, today we receive uh, the offer to deposit $90 in a savings account, getting back $93.5 in one year. And we can also have multi-periods, so we can deposit 90 US dollars and get back 93.5 in uh, three years. And the question would be, what is uh, the applicable interest rate here? And the calculation is uh, pretty straightforward, so we can rearrange uh, the formulas uh, that we already know. And we can uh, rearrange uh, them for the interest rate R. So r is equal to the future value divided by the present value to the power of uh, 1 divided by n. And n is uh, the number of periods and then minus 1. So let's uh, solve the problems here. And uh, first of all we deposit uh, $90 and uh, one year later we have 93.5. And actually the applicable interest rate is here 3.89%. And this is here actually the discounting or compounding factor. So it's one plus uh, the interest rate. And let's also have a look here at uh, the calculation. So this is uh, the applicable interest rate, uh, 3.89%. And now let's also have a look at the multi-period case. So we have $90 in uh, T0. And after three years, we have 93.5. And uh, the applicable interest rate here is 1.28%. Uh, and uh, the discounting or compounding factor is uh, 1 plus uh, the interest rate. So these were interest rates uh, that we can get from a bank for example. And now let's go to stock returns. So this is a similar concept actually. And let's have a look at an example. So one year ago we invested $50 in a stock and uh, this stock is now worth $56.5. And the question is now what is uh, the period return that uh, the stock generated and uh, this is here the uh, formula. So R is uh, the period return and we can calculate the period return by dividing the price at the timestamp uh, t plus 1 divided by the price at timestamp t minus 1. So that's uh, the price return of a stock but uh, typically there are two sources of income when investing into stocks. So we have uh, the price return, which is simply the price increase. And second, we have dividend payments. So typically companies and in particular more mature companies uh, pay dividends, for example, quarterly or annually. And let's have a look at an example here. So one year ago, we invested $50 in a stock that uh, recently paid a dividend of $2. 
And the stock is now worth $56.5. So let's have a look at the formula. And we have actually R, now the total return. And actually we can split up the total return into first of all the price return. So this is nothing new. And the dividend yield, which is actually the dividend payment at timestamp t plus one divided by the price at timestamp t. So that's uh, the dividend yield. And in total, we have here the total return. And typically the total return is a better metric uh, to measure performance of a stock. So price return, as I said, is only one source. And by having the total return, we can also compare companies or stocks with uh, different dividend payout policies. So that's uh, the formula here. And R is here the period return in terms of uh, total return. And actually when calculating stock returns, so typically the period is either annual or we can also calculate monthly returns, uh, weekly returns or also daily returns. So this uh, depends on the purpose of our calculations and analysis. And in the next lecture, we will exercise so this and calculate interest rates and also returns uh, with Python. So hope to see you also there. Bye. In this video, we are going to calculate interest rates and returns. And here in our first example, we receive uh, the offer to deposit 90 US dollars in a savings account and we get back uh, $93.5 in one year. And the question is now, what is here the applicable interest rate? And uh, there are actually two options how to calculate this. And corresponding to the formula that we learned in the last uh, lecture, we can calculate uh, the future value divided by the present value minus one. And uh, this gives us here uh, the interest rate of 3.89%. Uh, so it's here 0 0.0389, but uh, we can also get this in percentage terms by multiplying it uh, with the 100. So we can do this, of course. And here we have 3.89%. Uh, and actually the second option is uh, to first of all calculate uh, the interest portion. So in one year we actually earn an interest of uh, $3.5 and then we have to divide uh, the interest uh, by the initial price or value. So it's here 90, the present value. And uh, we get here the same result, of course, 3.89%. Uh, and now let's come to the multi-period case. So the numbers here are the same. We deposit $90 and we get back $93.5 after three years. And the question is, uh, what is uh, the applicable per annum interest rate? And again, we divide uh, the future value by the present value. And then we have uh, to the power of one divided by the number of periods. And in this example, it's uh, three. And finally, we also deduct one. And we actually get here a per annum interest rate of 1.28%. Uh, uh, and we can also double check uh, this result. So starting from the present value 90, we can multiply it uh, with uh, one plus uh, the interest rate to the power of three. And then we should actually get the future value of 93.5 US dollars. And of course, uh, this is uh, correct here. All right, coming now to stock returns. And uh, one year ago, we invested $50 in a stock that is uh, worth uh, $56.5. So obviously we have here a price return. So the price increased uh, by 6.5 US dollars. And uh, the return is simply the price of today divided by the price uh, one year ago minus one. So we get here a price return for the one year period of uh, 13%. And finally, if a company or a stock also pays the uh, dividends, it might be better to calculate the total return, which includes dividend payments. So we not only have here $56.5 as a value of our stock, but we also received a dividend payment of two. So in total, our value is here 58.5. And then we divide our current value by the price one year ago, 50, and then we also deduct one. And uh, this is here the total return of 17%. Uh, so we have a total return of 17%. And uh, this uh, consists actually of a price return of 13% and a dividend yield of uh, 4%. So the dividend yield is uh, 2 divided by 50, which is actually 4%. 
Yeah, this is true. All right, thanks for watching and I'll see you also in the next video. Bye. This is an introduction to variables in Python and why they are so useful. So we have our initial example here. We invest $100 for three years at an interest rate of uh, 3% and our task is actually to calculate the future value in uh, three years and uh, this is actually nothing new. And we can actually use Python as a calculator and calculate 100 times uh, 1.03 to the power of uh, three. And by doing so, we get the future value of 109.27. And we can actually see here that uh, we have the value 109.27 here in the output. However, we didn't save uh, the result in memory. And therefore, if we want to get uh, the future value again, or if we want to work uh, with uh, the future value, then uh, we have to calculate it again. So we have to copy here the code and uh, we have to recode it. And again, here we have uh, the value. So this is pretty inconvenient and therefore we have uh, variables in Python. And in Python we can actually save uh, numbers or whatever objects in variables. And actually the statement saving objects in variables is uh, not 100% correct, as uh, we will see in the next lectures. However, I will use uh, this uh, very often throughout the course as it is uh, more intuitive uh, than how it actually works in the background. So we will see this in the next lecture. But for the time being, now we want to save uh, the result in a variable. And uh, actually we can simply do this uh, by selecting or choosing a variable. And actually a variable can be everything. So here we have a future value and we can simply type uh, future value, so fv. And then we have to code an equal sign. So future value equals uh, 109.27 and uh, let's uh, run the cell here. So you can see here that we do not get any output here. So we calculated the future value and we actually saved uh, the future value in the variable fv. And uh, then we can actually get to the value that is stored in fv by simply having here fv and then we run the cell. And by doing so, we can get here the saved value, 109.27. So we can actually save the result of our calculation by assigning it to a variable, fv, with an equal sign. And uh, there's one thing that you should keep in mind here. So let's copy it again here. And let's put the calculation on the left-hand side. Then we have the equal sign. And uh, let's, uh, for example, choose another variable, maybe a future value too. And let's uh, try to run the cell here. And uh, this does actually not work. So saving numbers or objects in Python in a variable only works in uh, this format. So you have here the equal sign and on the right hand side, here should be the value or the object that you want to store or save. And on the left hand side of the equal sign, there you have uh, the variable. And of course, we are not limited uh, to save only here the output in a variable. So we can also save uh, the inputs of our calculation in variables. And for example, we have here the present value 100. Then we also have uh, the interest rate of uh, 3% and we can save it in the variable r. And finally, we have uh, the number of periods. So we have uh, three years and uh, we can save it, for example, in the variable n. And now we can run the cell. And by doing so, we actually saved here the values in the corresponding variables. And we can get the values back uh, by simply running the cell here. For example, present value gives us uh, 100. Then here we have uh, the interest rate is uh, 3% and also n, the number of periods is uh, three here. And now we can calculate the future value again. And instead of uh, using here the numbers, we can also use um, the variables. So for example, we can have here present value times uh, one plus r, and then to the power of n. And uh, this should give uh, actually the future value. So 109.27. And again, we can also save here the result in the variable fv. So let's uh, copy here the code. And on the left hand side, we have here future value equals. 
And now we can get uh, the future value again by simply running the cell here, future value, and it's 109.27. All right, thanks for watching and I'll see you also in the next video, bye. This is a short excursus on inline comments. Sometimes it might be the case that you want to add a comment to your code that is just a comment and not part of the actual code. For instance, to enhance readability for others. And in Python, this is not a problem. So a comment starts with a hash character. So let's add here a comment and let's code hash. And here you can see that it is getting blue. And then you can write your comment, for instance, calculation the future value and actually you don't need a new line for it so you can also add a comment here on the right hand side of uh, the actual code. So a comment starts with a hash character and ends at the end of a physical line so here for example and once you include a hash character to a line all following characters are part of the comment and not part of uh, the actual code. So for instance, it wouldn't work if you include uh, the comment here on the left hand side. And by doing so, you actually uh, comment out the whole coding line. So again, once you include a hash character, then all of the following characters are part of the comment. And for instance, it might be useful to comment out a line or a code that results in an error message, for instance here. And let's have another example. So for instance here, this is the present value. Then this is the interest rate and so on. And finally, there's another very helpful application of comments. So sometimes you want to run only parts or fractions of a code and uh, play around with the code. And instead of copying and pasting and deleting code fragments, you can simply cross out the parts of the code. So for instance here, we have uh, present value times one plus r to the power of n. And if you are not sure to which object uh, PV is uh, referencing or pointing to, then you can cross out uh, the following code and just run PV. So first of all, we have to define PV of course. So this is 100 and let's delete here the hash character. And then for instance, we can calculate the future value in one year by crossing out uh, to the power of n. And this gives 103. And finally, we can delete here the comment. And now we calculate the present value in uh, three years. So this is pretty helpful and I will use this a lot in the whole course. So thanks for watching and I'll see you also in the next video. Bye. This and the next lecture are more theoretical in nature. However, they are pretty important to understand how Python works in the background and how Python stores the variables in memory. So it's really important to understand this uh, to avoid uh, the most frequently made mistakes in Python. So here we have a view on our memory and actually each memory slot has a memory address. So for example here, we have uh, this slot with the memory address 0x1000. So this is only for illustration purposes. And now let's assume that we have uh, the following Python code. So we store the number 0.03, so 3% in the variable r. So that's uh, the interest rate. And by doing so, we create actually uh, the object 0.03. So this is a number and uh, this object is uh, getting stored in memory, for example, here in the slot with uh, the address uh, 0x1000. And then we have our variable r. And actually the variable r is referencing or pointing to the object stored in the memory address uh, 0x1000. So actually variables are memory references. And whenever we use r in our Python code, then uh, Python searches uh, for the object that R is uh, referencing to and uh, uses actually the object here. So in this example, uh, 3%. So actually the statement uh, we save uh, 3% and the variable R is uh, not 100% correct. So either the variable is referencing or pointing to the object uh, stored in a memory address, or we could also say that uh, the object 0.03 is assigned uh, to the variable r. All right, thanks for watching and I'll see you also in the next video. Bye.
In this video I will show you in more detail how objects in Python are stored in memory and how variables are assigned and reassigned. So this is a pretty important lecture and uh, you should make sure that you understand the mechanics in the background to avoid uh, the most frequently made mistakes when uh, working with Python. So we have here two interest rates. Uh, we have uh, 3% and 4% and uh, we save uh, the objects here and we assign 3% uh, to the variable R1 and 4% uh, to the variable R2. And then we can check again that R1 is uh, referencing uh, to 3% and R2 is uh, referencing uh, to 4%. So this is uh, nothing new. And now in the next step we can say that R1 is equal to R2. So let's uh, run the cell. And actually Python is now verifying that R2 is uh, referencing uh, to the object uh, 4% and it uh, actually assigns 4% uh, also to the variable R1. So R1 should now be 4%, so let's check this. And of course R2 is uh, still also 4%. And now in the next step, uh, let's uh, change R2 to 5%. So it's actually no surprise uh, that R2 is now referencing uh, to 5%. However, the question is now, is R1 referencing to 4% or to 5%? And uh, we can check this. And actually R1 is uh, still referencing to 4%. So now let's have a look how this works in detail in memory. So that's our initial situation. We have uh, two objects, uh, we have uh, 3%. And R1 is uh, pointing or referencing uh, to 3%. And uh, we have uh, the second object, uh, 4% and the variable R2 is uh, referencing or pointing to the memory address uh, where we have stored uh, 4%. So now let's move on and let's assume that we have uh, the code R1 equals R2. And now actually Python uh, checks in memory to which uh, object R2 is uh, referencing to and here it's uh, 4%. And then Python uh, changes uh, the reference of R1 from uh, 3% to 4%. So it actually deletes uh, the reference uh, to 3% and it creates a new reference to 4%. And now as a direct consequence, as uh, we have no variable that is uh, pointing or referencing to the object uh, 3%, then uh, Python assumes uh, that the object uh, 3% is uh, no longer needed and it actually drops uh, 3% uh, from memory. All right, so now let's have uh, the next step and we have the code R2 equals uh, 5%. And here it is uh, really important to understand uh, that we do not change here the object in uh, the memory address uh, 0x1001. Uh, so we do not change here the object, but uh, we create a new object 5% and uh, we store the new object in a different memory address. So for example, in the memory slot with uh, the address uh, 0x1003. And now Python is uh, simply changing the reference of R2. So initially we had the reference uh, to the object 4% and uh, this is now deleted and uh, Python creates a new reference uh, to the object uh, 5%. And as you can see, the reference of the variable R1 did not change. So we still have the reference of R1 to the object 4%. So even if we coded here R1 equals R2, so if we change uh, the reference of R2 afterwards, then R1 is uh, not equal to R2. So R1 is uh, not uh, referencing to the same object now as R2. So now let's move on with another example and let's assume that uh, we change R2. So new, the new R2 is actually the old R2 plus 0.01. So uh, R2 is now 6%. And also here it's important to understand uh, that we do not change here the object uh, 5%, but uh, we create here a new object uh, 6%. And actually we store the new object in a different memory slot with a different uh, memory address. So here 0x1004. And then Python simply changes uh, the reference of R2 from the object uh, 5% uh, to 6%. And finally, as uh, there's uh, no variable that is pointing or referencing to the object 5%, then uh, Python actually drops uh, the object 5% from memory. All right. 
We are now back in our Jupyter Notebook and our two is referencing uh, to 5% and our one is referencing to 4%. And again, we can say that our one equals our two. Then uh, we change uh, the reference of our one and our one is now 5%. Now the next example we have already seen in the slides. So we can uh, reassign our two and we can say that our two is equal to our two plus uh, 1%. So R2 is referencing currently to 5% plus 1% gives 6%. So we reassign R2 to 6%. And of course, uh, the reference of R1 is uh, still to the object uh, 5%. And at this point, I want to make a short excursus here. So let's assume that uh, we have uh, the interest rate R and R is uh, 5%. And now let's assume that you want to increase R to 6% then uh, this is here the long version. So we reassign r, r equals r plus 1%. And now we have 6%, but uh, there's also a short version. So we can simply code r plus equals uh, 1%. And by doing so, we actually increase r by 1%. And here we have uh, 7% now. And the same we can also do with a minus sign. So we can decrease r by 2% or put two percentage points. And uh, we can do this by coding r minus equal 2%. And by doing so, we change r to 5%. All right, thanks for watching and I'll see you also in the next video, bye. In this video, I will show you some rules and conventions for using variable names. And uh, the high level message is uh, that we are not completely free when we create uh, variables. So variable names must follow certain rules and should follow certain conventions. And so far we have used the rather short variable names, for example, R for interest rate. And uh, that's of course uh, allowed and this is perfectly fine. But let's assume that you want to have complete words, for example, interest rate. And here we get an error message. And uh, the reason is that uh, we cannot use the white spaces in variable names. So instead of having white spaces, uh, we should use, for example, underscores. And uh, this works here. Next, our variable names should always start uh, with a lower case letter. So a variable cannot start with a number. So for example, first interest rate, here our first uh, character is a number one. So this, this uh, does actually not work. And also having uh, complete numbers uh, as uh, variables uh, does not work. So 2010 equals 5% does not work. And instead also here we should use underscores. So for example, interest rate in 2010. And here we have underscores as separators. So this uh, works perfectly. Next, we cannot use the so-called Python keywords. So true, for example, is a keyword. And if we try to run the cell here, we get uh, the error message can't assign to keyword. And let's have a look at an overview of uh, the Python keywords. These are the reserved keywords in Python, for example, false, none, true, and, s, and so on. And we will get in touch uh, with uh, most of uh, these keywords somewhere in the course. So there's uh, no need to go into detail here. And the message is here that we cannot use the uh, reserved uh, keywords as uh, variable names. So these are the rules uh, that we have to follow, but the uh, variable names should also follow some conventions that have been created by the Python community. And actually by following these conventions, uh, this uh, makes your code easier to read and understand for others. So for example, a variable name should always uh, start with a lowercase letter. And uh, theoretically, you could also start with an underscore, but expressions uh, starting with an underscore is uh, already reserved uh, for other things. So that's uh, clearly not uh, the best convention here or the best solution, but it works. And if we have uh, several words in our variable, so we should always uh, separate the words by an underscore, but uh, we could also use here interest rate uh, without an underscore. And as a next convention, we should only use the uh, lowercase letters. So for example, here we have interest rate uh, with an uppercase I and R. And uh, this uh, format is typically used uh, for classes. So this is actually reserved for classes and it might cause uh, some confusion if uh, you use uh, this here as a variable name, but it works actually. 
So finally, let's assume that you want to store the interest rate in 2010, 5%. And uh, this is actually here the best practice. So we have lowercase letters uh, separated by an underscore. And also here, the number or the year 2010 is uh, separated here by an underscore. So that's actually the best practice and uh, the convention actually. Thanks for watching and I'll see you also in the next video. Bye. In this video I will show you the very first built-in function in Python, the print function. And the print function prints a specified object or value to the screen. So we've already seen that if we calculate the price return of our stock, the result is in the output line. So let's run the cell here and here in the output line we have 13% um, as the price return. However, let's calculate the price return and total return in one line. So let's run the cell here. And here we can see that only the result of the very last line here, so the total return, is uh, displayed in the output, so 17%. And actually Python still calculates also the price return, but it's uh, not displayed here in the output line. So in this case and more complex cases, we can use uh, the print function to customize uh, the output uh, that we can see on our screen. So we use here the statement print and then we open the parentheses and uh, within the parentheses here we pass um, our calculation for um, the price return and let's run the cell here. And uh, no surprise, we get here the result, a uh, 13% uh, price return. And actually with uh, the print function, we not only can display one result or one value, but uh, we can print or display many values. And uh, we can do this uh, by passing here many calculations. So for example, here in this case, two within the parentheses and uh, we separate the values by a comma. So let's uh, run the cell here. And here we get uh, the price return and the total return. And we can see here that uh, by default uh, the values are separated uh, by white spaces, but uh, we can also customize uh, this. And actually the print function has one parameter, it's uh, the separator parameter here, sep. And uh, the default argument is actually a white space, but uh, we can also pass here the combination comma white space uh, within quotation marks. And uh, let's uh, run the cell here. So here we get uh, the two values separated by a comma and a white space. So as I said before, sep is a parameter of uh, the print function. And uh, here we have changed the argument uh, for the parameter. And later in this course, we go into the details of uh, functions, uh, parameters, and arguments. But uh, for the time being, it's uh, just sufficient to know that uh, the print function has uh, the parameter separator and here we can pass actually different arguments. So for example, as a third uh, alternative, we could also pass here backslash n, and actually a backslash n stands in encoding for new line. So let's uh, run the cell here. And here we print out the price return and the total return in actually different lines, so in a new line here. And finally, let's have a more complex example. So let's assume that our interest rate is uh, 3% and actually we assign it uh, to the variable r. Then we have our discounting factor or compounding factor, which is uh, one plus r. And then we want to print out uh, the intermediate result f. And then finally we want to calculate the future value by multiplying 100 and f. And then finally we print out uh, the future value. And here we can see in our output, that uh, we have printed uh, the intermediate result f and also the final result, uh, the future value of 103. So in later sections uh, with the more complex situations, you will definitely get a better understanding when and why to use uh, the print function. So for example, when we use uh, for and while loops, in many cases, it definitely makes sense to print out intermediate results. So thanks for watching and I'll see you also in the next video. Bye. Hi and welcome to the very first coding exercise. Here you will have the opportunity to practice and master what you have learned in the video lectures. And actually the exercises are not mandatory to follow the course, but I highly recommend doing the exercises as it uh, deepens your understanding and actually learning by doing is uh, definitely the best way to become an expert.
I'm here on my desktop and I've already downloaded the course materials for part one. So let's have a look here. And uh, here we have uh, the video lecture notebooks for part one and also the exercises. So in total we have here eight exercises in part one. And now let's uh, open the Anaconda Navigator. And uh, let's select the Jupyter Notebook. And we know that uh, we have stored the course materials file on our desktop and therefore we select desktop. And this is actually a view on our desktop. And here I can find the course materials part one folder. And let's go to exercises and to the very first exercise. All right, exercise one is all about using Python as a calculator for basic uh, time value of money problems. And you should actually use the variables where appropriate. So input values and also final results uh, shall be stored in variables. And here, first of all, you have to calculate uh, the future value. So here in the first coding cell, you should uh, store the input values in variables. Then in the second cell, you have to calculate and store the future value in a variable. And uh, finally, you have to print out uh, the result. And actually here you can uh, check whether your result is correct. So in this case, uh, the correct result is 2631. Next, you have to calculate a present value. And also here you can see uh, the result. Then you have to calculate the per annum compound interest rate. Then question four, there you have to calculate uh, the price return of a stock. And then also you have to calculate the dividend yield and the total return. And uh, finally you are asked here to print out the price return, dividend yield and total return in one single line. All right, this is coding exercise one. And I will continue now with uh, the solutions. So if you want to do the coding exercises on your own, then please stop uh, the video now. So in question one, we have the following situation. We save $2,000 uh, for seven years at an interest rate of 4%. And here we uh, shall calculate the value of our account in seven years. And that's actually the future value in seven years. And first of all, we have some input values, which we should store in variables. So we have uh, the value today, the present value is uh, 2000. Then we have uh, the number of periods or years seven. And uh, we have uh, the annual interest rate of 4%. So let's uh, actually store the input values in uh, variables. And then we are asked to calculate and store the future value in another variable. So here we have to follow the future value formula. And actually the future value is uh, the present value times uh, one plus R to the power of N. So let's run the cell here and let's store the future value in the variable future value. And finally, let's uh, print out our result. And uh, this is obviously here the correct result. So 2,631. So we save $2,000 today and after seven years, uh, we have $2,631. Next question two is actually the opposite calculation. So we consider to purchase a car in four years for $20,000. And the question is now how many US dollars do we have to save today? So that's uh, the present value to have uh, these uh, $20,000 in four years. And we assume that we can save our money at an interest rate of 3.5%. Uh, so we have some input values here. We have uh, the future value in four years of uh, 20,000. We have four years and we have the interest rate of 3.5%. Uh, and then we have to rearrange the formula for the present value. And actually we have to discount the future value for four periods at an interest rate of 3.5%. Uh, so let's run the cell here and let's save uh, the result in the variable present value. And let's have a look. So here we get uh, $17,428 that uh, we have to save today in order to get uh, 20,000 in four years. In the next question, we have to rearrange the formula for the compound interest rate R. So bank B offers us uh, to save $10,000 today and we get back $15,000 in 10 years. 
And here we should calculate the per annum interest rate or compound interest rate. And uh, we should compare this interest rate to uh, the interest rate that Bank A offers, so 4.5% per year. And uh, which offer should we accept? So actually the higher one. And let's have a look. So today we save 10,000. That's uh, the present value. Then in 10 years, uh, we have 15,000 and uh, we have 10 years. And if we rearrange for the interest rate, then we get the future value divided by the present value to the power of uh, 1 divided by 10 years. And then finally minus 1. And here we get uh, the per annum compound interest rate of 4.14%. So this is uh, less than Bank A offers. So Bank A offers 4.5%. And therefore we should accept the Bank A's offer. Now let's come to stock and uh, stock returns. And one year ago we invested $976 in the ABC stock. And then one year later we received $40 dividend payment and the current value is $1053. And first of all we shall calculate the price return. So we have the price one year ago, 976, and we have the price one year later today, 1053. And uh, the price return actually does not take into account the dividend payment and is simply the price today divided by the price uh, one year ago minus one. So we get a name error here and it says uh, P1 is not defined because uh, we didn't run the cell here and we didn't create uh, the variable P1. So let's uh, first of all run the cell here and by doing so we actually create uh, the three variables here. So now let's run again and let's check uh, the price return and we get here 7.89%. Here in question 5 we have to calculate the dividend yield and the total return for ABC. So the dividend yield is simply the dividend payment divided by the price uh, one year ago. So 40 divided by 976 and uh, this gives a dividend yield of 4.1 percent and then finally the total return is uh, the price return plus uh, the dividend yield so we saved our results here in uh, price return and dividend yield and we get here 11.98 percent and finally we can also print out all results so the price return the dividend yield and the total return in one single line separated by commas and we can do this with the print function and uh, then we can pass uh, the values or the variables uh, that we want to print out. So the price return, the dividend yield and the total return. And uh, there is uh, the parameter sep where we can define how the elements are separated in the printout. And uh, we have to pass uh, this within quotation marks as a string. And we want to separate by a comma, so comma white space. And let's have a look. So here we get the price return of 7.8%, comma, then we have uh, the dividend yield of 4.1% and finally the total return. All right, this was coding exercise one. I hope you had fun and uh, see you also in the next exercise. Bye. Hi and welcome to this section. So far we had time value of money problems uh, with only one cash flow, but typically investment projects, loans or retirement plans have uh, many cash flows. And in this section we will learn how to calculate future values and present values for projects with many cash flows. So let's have a look at an example here. So we have uh, today 100 uh, US dollar in our savings account and uh, we save another $10 in one year, $20 in two years, $50 in three years, $30 in four years and uh, $25 in five years. So each payment is uh, at the end of the period, so at the year end. And the question is now, what is uh, the future value of our savings account after five years? And uh, we assume an interest rate of uh, 3% per year. So let's have a look at uh, the formula. And uh, this uh, looks uh, quite complicated. But in the end, we have to calculate for each and every cash flow the future value of the cash flow in five years. So let's have a look how it works. And it's always helpful to have a timeline uh, with uh, timestamps and cash flows. So for example, we have uh, today $100, uh, then in one year we pay $10 and so on. 
And uh, finally, at the end of uh, year five, uh, we pay $25 into our account. And to get the future value of our account, uh, we have to calculate the future value for all cash flows. So we start uh, with uh, the current value of our account, $100. And actually, we have to compound $100 by five periods uh, with an interest rate of 3%. And uh, this gives a future value of 115.93. And actually the same thing uh, we are doing now for all of the other cash flows. So we compound uh, the next cash flows by four periods and we get 11.26. Then uh, we compound uh, the cash flow in year two by uh, three periods and so on. And actually the final cash flow in year five, it's uh, 25, so we do not have to compound this. And uh, finally, the future value of our complete account is actually here the sum of uh, the future values. So let's have a look at uh, the result of our calculations here. And uh, finally, we end up with a future value of 257.98. And actually we can do the same calculation here also in Python. So we are here in the Jupyter Notebook and uh, here we have um, the same task actually. And actually we can calculate the future value by compounding 100 uh, for five periods, then 10 for four periods and so on. So we save here the result in the variable future value. And uh, also here we have uh, the final result of 257.98. And if you think that uh, coding or calculating this in uh, this manner is uh, not uh, really efficient, uh, then uh, you are right. So there are more efficient ways uh, to do this in Python. And uh, we are starting right now in the next uh, lecture to discover more efficient ways uh, to do it. So thanks for watching and I'll see you also in the next video. Bye. This is an introduction to Python lists and lists are containers where we can store many other objects like numbers. So here in our example, we have a savings plan with uh, six cash flows. And uh, theoretically, we can store these uh, six numbers in uh, six different variables, so from T0 till T5. And uh, this works, but it's actually not the best way how to do it. So we can run the cell here, and uh, we can create here the six variables, and uh, we can actually call here one variable, for example, T0. And of course, T0 is referencing to 100. However, it's better to store many objects in a collection or a container. And uh, Python and associated libraries provide uh, several containers or collections. And one of the most frequently used collection is uh, the list. And actually we can create a list uh, by opening uh, square brackets. And then within uh, the square brackets, we can pass our objects uh, separated by commas. So our very first cash flow is uh, 100 comma, then we have uh, 10, then we have uh, 20, and then 50, 30, and uh, 25. So let's uh, run the cell here. And uh, here we can see our list uh, with uh, the six elements. And actually it doesn't matter if we have here white spaces uh, between the commas. So we can also delete this here. So this uh, works as well. And by default here in the output, we can see that uh, we have element, comma, white space, uh, and then the next element. But we do not have to code this exactly in this manner. So we can also create a white space here and it still works. And finally, we can also assign our list uh, to a variable. So let's copy it here and let's paste it. And let's assume that uh, the variable name is uh, cash flows, CF. So the variable cf is now referencing to our list. And of course, we can also get our list here by running here cf. And again, here we have our list uh, with our six cash flows. All right, thanks for watching and I'll see you also in the next video. Bye. In the last video, we have created the list uh, cf and we have stored our six cash flows in this list. And uh, the question is now, how can we get or how can we access uh, single elements of our list CF? And uh, this process is also called indexing. And there are actually two ways uh, to do it. So first of all, we have uh, zero-based indexing, which is uh, one of the most important and fundamental concepts, not only in Python, but also in 
other programming languages and uh, we have a negative indexing. So let's have a look at uh, zero-based indexing first. And actually lists are also so-called uh, sequences as uh, the sequence of uh, the element uh, matter. So the sequence is not random and uh, they are so-called index positions. And uh, the very first element or the most uh, left an element is at index position zero. It's really important to understand uh, that we start uh, with index position zero and not one. Therefore it's called uh, zero-based indexing. And uh, consequently, uh, the second element is at index position one, then uh, the third uh, element at index position two, and so on. Now, the second alternative is negative indexing. And also here we have our list and uh, we have index positions. And with the negative indexing, the very last element, or the most uh, right an element, is at index position minus one. And uh, the second uh, last element is at index position minus two and so on. So finally, our very first element is at index position minus six. Now we know that uh, we have index positions. So how can we index our list? And uh, let's have an example here. So we want to get uh, the very first element 100. And uh, therefore we have to code uh, CF and uh, then we have to open square brackets and pass uh, the index position of uh, the very first element. So in this example, it's uh, the index position zero and uh, we get um, the element 100. So that's uh, zero-based indexing. And let's also have a look at uh, negative indexing. So let's assume that uh, we want to get uh, the second last element, uh, 30, and we can actually access uh, the second last element with uh, negative indexing. So we code the CF, then uh, we open square brackets and we pass uh, the negative index position minus two. And uh, by doing so, we get here 30. All right, I think we have to see this also in action. So hope to see you also in the next video. Bye. All right, in this video, I will show you how indexing of lists works uh, live in action. And here we have our list uh, with our six cache flows. And actually we assign the variable CF. And uh, then we can index our list. And for example, let's assume that you want to get uh, the very first cache flow 100 at index position zero. Then we can pass here uh, zero in inside uh, the square brackets. And by doing so, we get 100. And we can also index uh, for the second element, 10, at index position 1. And uh, the third element at index position 2. And of course, we can also get the fifth element at index position 4. So let's count here. So here we have index position 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. So we should get uh, 30 here. And that's correct. So this is uh, zero-based indexing and now let's uh, come to negative indexing. And let's assume that you want to get uh, the very last element and in this case it's uh, 25. Then we can pass uh, the index position minus one within the square brackets here. And we get uh, 25. And we can also get uh, the second last element, it's uh, 30 with uh, minus two. And we can also get uh, the element at index position minus five. So let's count here. Minus one, minus two, minus three, minus four, minus five. It should be 10. And uh, that's uh, correct here. And now let's again try to calculate the future value of our cash flows. And uh, we create a second list N with uh, the timestamps. So we have uh, the first cash flow 100 at timestamp uh, zero and then one, two, three, four, and five. So we have two lists here, n and uh, cf, and uh, we have our compounding or discounting factor 1.03. So we have 3% uh, per year as interest rate. And uh, then we can actually calculate the future value by actually indexing the lists uh, cf and n. So actually we have our very first cash flow at index position zero, it's 100. And we have to compound 100 by five periods. So we multiply by F to the power of N and the very last element, so five. So here we compound 100 uh, by five uh, periods. Then we have uh, the second element at index position one, it's 10. 
and we compound uh, 10 by actually four periods and so on. So let's uh, run the cell here. And uh, no surprise, also here we get the future value of 257.98. And you're actually right uh, that also this approach here is uh, not uh, really efficient. And uh, therefore in the next video, I will introduce uh, for loops. So hope to see you there, bye. In this video, you will learn how to iterate over lists with a for loop. So what does it mean? With a for loop, you can go through all elements in a list uh, from the first element to the last element. And you can define an action that you want to take on each element and on each loop actually. And options are unlimited here. So for example, you can simply print out each and every element or you can multiply each element by two. So we could say that uh, for loops enable element-wise operations because uh, they allow to iterate over a sequence or a collection like lists. And therefore a list is also called an iterable because we can iterate over the list. So let's see how it works in action. And let's assume we want to print out each and every cache flow in the list uh, cache flow from the first to the last element. So let's first of all create uh, the list here. And now let's initiate the for loop. And we actually have uh, the keyword uh, for so you can see here it turns green and uh, that's a signal that uh, this is a keyword uh, that for example we shouldn't use as a variable name. And then we can code for element in our list uh, cf and then we need to uh, code here a colon and uh, press uh, the enter key. And you can see here that uh, Python makes automatically an indent here. And uh, this is really important uh, that we have uh, this indent here. And then here in the next line, we can define uh, the action uh, that we want to take on each and every element. And here in this example, we want to print out each and every element. So let's uh, run the cell here. And here we have printed out 100, 10, 20, 50, 30, and 25. And as I said before, so it's uh, pretty important to have the indent here. So if we actually delete uh, the indent here, then uh, this does not work actually. So expect it an indented block. And we can again create uh, the block here or the indent with uh, the tab key. So now it works again. So that's uh, the for statement uh, with uh, the keywords uh, for and in. And uh, we iterate over the list uh, cf. And actually on each uh, loop, we call the next element so for example, the very first one, then uh, the second one and so on. And we actually put the next element in the loop variable element. So this is uh, flexible here. So we can select uh, any uh, loop variable that uh, we want to have. And I can show you this in the next uh, coding cells here. So let's go down here. And instead of uh, having the loop variable element, we can also say, for i in uh, cf uh, print i so this is uh, no problem this also works and even we can define uh, the loop variable underscore so for underscore and cf print underscore so this is uh, completely flexible of course we shouldn't use uh, any python keywords and having understood uh, the concept of a for loop now for example we can actually count uh, the number of cache flows that uh, we have in our list so here obviously it's uh, six, but we can explicitly count them. And uh, for example, we can define here a variable and set the variable to zero. And then we initiate a for loop. So for each element in our list cache flow, we want to increment or increase uh, the count by one. And uh, then we want to print count. So let's uh, run the cell here. So here we have in the very first loop, we have uh, one, then in the second loop, we have uh, two and so on. And uh, finally, we end up with a count of six. So that's uh, the for statement here. And uh, these two lines are actually the actions. So we increment count by one in each and every loop. And uh, also we print out uh, the current count on each and every loop. But actually we can also exclude uh, the print statement from the loop and uh, therefore we can delete the increment and by doing so we actually exclude here the printing from the for loop 
And actually, we only print out uh, the variable count at uh, the very end after the very last loop. So let's have a look here. And here we have uh, six. So our list, the cache flow, contains uh, six elements. And of course, uh, there's also a simpler way to do it. And uh, we have uh, the built-in function length. And uh, here we can pass actually our list cache flows. So we have to open here the parentheses and uh, we pass here cache flows to the length uh, function. And of course, uh, this uh, gives uh, the very same result. So we have here in total six elements in our cache flow list. And next we can also take uh, the sum over all elements. So how many US dollar do we save over the five years period? And here I do not mean the future value that we have after five years, but uh, simply the nominal amounts uh, that we pay into our savings account. And also here we can do this with a for loop. And actually uh, we uh, create a variable total and uh, the initial value is zero. And then we iterate over the cash flow list. And uh, for each element or for each loop in uh, the cash flow list, we increment the variable total by the cash flow. So for example, the very first cash flow is 100. And in the first loop, we get the 100. Then the second element is actually here, it's uh, 10. So we increment the uh, total by 10 and have 110. And again, here we have uh, the print statement inside the for loop. So let's uh, run the cell here. And here we get actually the intermediate uh, results and also the final result. So the intermediate result in the first loop is 100, then 110, 130 and so on. And the final result is uh, 235. And also here we can exclude uh, the print statement from the loop and uh, we can only print uh, the very last uh, loop or result. So the total sum over all cash flows. And it's uh, 235. And also here we have a Python build-in function. So it's uh, the sum function. And uh, we can pass our cash flow list inside the parentheses. And uh, this gives us, of course, um, the same result, 235. And last but not least, so let's assume that uh, we have our cash flows here in US dollar. And uh, we want to convert each and every cash flow into Euro at a conversion rate of 1.12. So we have 1.12 US dollar per one euro. And again, we have here our cash flow list. And uh, then we iterate over the list. And uh, for each and every element, we actually divide each element, which is a cash flow in US dollar by 1.12. And by doing so, we calculate uh, the corresponding uh, euro cash flow. And uh, we print out the euro cash flow. So for example, here we have um, for the cash flow $100, the corresponding euro cash flow 89.28 and so on. All right, thanks for watching and I'll see you also in the next video. Bye. In this video, you will learn how to use the very helpful range function and how to create and work with a range object. So a range object is another iterable that we can iterate over and a range object actually can produce a sequence of integers from a predefined start to a predefined stop in a predefined uh, steps actually. So in simple words, you can create all integers, for example, from zero till nine or from 1000 till 2000. So we have uh, the function range and inside the parentheses, uh, we can, for example, pass uh, 10. And by doing so, we create a range object uh, 0, 10. And we will see in a minute uh, which uh, numbers we can create uh, with uh, this uh, range object. But at uh, this point, it's important to understand that a range object is an iterable, like a list, but it's not a collection or a sequence, as uh, the elements haven't been produced or stored in memory yet. But a range object can produce uh, the elements when called. So the question is now, how can we call the elements of a range object and uh, store the elements in memory? And uh, one way would be by creating a list uh, with uh, the list function. So the list function is another Python uh, build-in function. And here we can pass our range object within the parentheses. And uh, let's simply run the cell here. So we passed uh, the range object uh, 0, 10. And obviously we created uh, the numbers or the integers from uh, zero till nine. 
So by default, uh, the start is at uh, zero inclusive. And uh, the end, uh, for example, if we pass here 10 at uh, the end exclusive. Uh, so 10 is exclusive here. And we end here at nine. And the default step is uh, one. So we have here steps of one. However, we can also change the start and the steps. So for example, we can explicitly say that the start should be one and the end is 11 exclusive. So one inclusive and 11 exclusive. And uh, this uh, gives us here a list uh, from one till 10. And uh, finally, in uh, the third position, we can also define uh, the step size. So by default, it's one, but uh, we can also explicitly set uh, this uh, to two. And uh, let's have a look here. So here we have uh, the numbers uh, starting from one and we have a step of uh, two, so three, five, seven, and nine. So with uh, the range function, uh, we create a range object and actually we can each and every object, uh, no matter if it's a number or a range object or whatever, we can uh, save an object uh, in memory and assign it to a variable. So for example here, we have uh, the numbers uh, from zero till five inclusive. So these are the timestamps of our cache flows and uh, we can save those in the variable n. So here we have a range object uh, zero six. So this uh, includes uh, zero, one, two, three, four, and five. And actually we can also index a range object. So we can select the second element at index position one and in this example it's uh, one and before i said that uh, a range object is another iterable that we can iterate over so we can use here a for loop so for each element in uh, range six we can uh, print the element and uh, consequently we get uh, the elements uh, zero one two three four and five and of course we can also define a more complex action here so we simply print out all elements here, but we can also calculate and print out uh, all elements uh, to the power of two. And uh, this gives us uh, 0, 1, 4, 9, 16, and 25. So finally, you could ask what are the benefits of a range object compared to a list. And uh, let's assume that we have uh, 1 million iterations. Then one option could be that we create a list uh, with uh, 1 million integers and we iterate over the list uh, with all 1 million elements in memory, or we can iterate over the range object and with a range object, uh, we never store all 1 million elements at uh, the same time. So on each and every loop, we only produce uh, the respective number for that loop. And that's of course more memory efficient. So with a list, we store each and every element of the list. So in our example, 1 million elements at uh, the same time in our memory. All right, thanks for watching and I'll see you also in the next video. Bye. In this video, we will use lists and for loops to calculate present values and future values for projects with many cash flows. So here in the first question, we shall calculate the future value of our savings account in five years given an interest rate of uh, 3% and uh, the following cash flows here. So that's uh, the solution for our problem here. And basically there are two lists uh, that we have to iterate over in a for loop. So we have uh, the list uh, with the cash flows starting with uh, 100, 10, 20 and so on. And uh, second, uh, we have uh, the compounding period starting from uh, five years uh, for the first cash flow and ending at uh, zero for the very last cash flow in year five. So let's go back to our Jupyter notebook and uh, let's start coding. And first of all, we are creating the cash flow list uh, with uh, the six cash flows. And uh, then we need to create a list uh, with uh, the compounding periods. And uh, first of all, we create here the list n. And actually we have here a range uh, until six excluding from zero. So that's n, but actually we need the reverse order and we can actually reverse uh, the order with uh, the following code. So this is a special case of uh, slicing lists. And uh, later on in this course, we will have a deep dive into uh, slicing uh, lists. So let's simply run the cell. And uh, by doing so, we are actually uh, reversing the order starting now from five until uh, zero. 
So we need to compound the 100 uh, by five periods and the 10 by four periods and so on. Then we have our compounding factor of uh, 1.03, which is one plus uh, the interest rate. And uh, then we can actually calculate uh, the future value and uh, we create the variable future value and uh, initially we have a value of zero and uh, then we iterate over all cash flows and actually we add uh, the future value of each and every cash flow to the future value here. Now for i in range 6, so for each and every cash flow, we increase or increment the uh, future value by actually the cash flow times uh, the compounding factor to the power of the compounding period. So let's have a look at the very first loop and uh, the first iteration. So we have i equals uh, zero and we actually index uh, the cash flow list for the index position uh, zero, which is uh, 100 here. And then we multiply it with uh, the compounding factor to the power of uh, the very first element in the list uh, n, which is five here. And uh, in this way, we are doing this uh, for all cash flows and uh, we are actually uh, incrementing the future value. So let's uh, run the cell here and we actually print out intermediate results. So the future value of our first cash flow is 115. Then uh, the sum of uh, the future values for the first uh, two elements are 127 and so on. And finally, we end up with a future value of 257. So after five years, uh, we have 257.98 US dollar in our savings account. And of course, instead of printing all intermediate results, we can also only print out uh, the final result by actually removing the print statement uh, from the for loop here. So here we have our final result of 257. And now let's come to present values and let's have a look here at the, the example. So today we agree with a bank on a payout plan that guarantees the payouts of $50 in one year, $60 in two years, 70 in three years, 80 in four years, and $100 in five years. And the question is now that we have to calculate the funding amount or the present value of these cash flows that we need to pay in into the payout plan. And let's assume that the applicable interest rate is 4% uh, per year. So in simple words, so the question is here, how many US dollars uh, do we have to save today that uh, we get uh, the following payout plan here? And actually this is an example to calculate present values for projects uh, with many cash flows. And also here we have a formula. So actually, essentially, we have to calculate for each and every cash flow the present value, and then we have to sum up uh, the present value of all cash flows. So let's have a look at uh, the solution here. And again, it uh, might make sense uh, to draw here a timeline. And uh, first of all, we have uh, the cash flow in one year. And actually, we have to discount this cash flow over one period at an interest rate of 4%, and we get here the present value of 48.08. Uh, and uh, the same we can do also for the other cash flows. So we have to discount uh, the cash flow in year two by actually uh, two years, and the cash flow after three years uh, by three periods, and so on. And finally, we have to take the sum over all present values. And let's have a look at uh, the final solution here. So we get a present value of uh, 316.36. So today we have to save uh, 316.36 US dollars in our savings account in order to get uh, the following payout plan. So 50, 60, 70, 80, and uh, 100. All right, now let's go back to our Jupyter notebook and uh, let's uh, see this in action here. And again, we are creating the cash flow list uh, with uh, the cash flows. So we have uh, 50 in one year, 60 in two years, and so on. And uh, we have uh, the discounting factor of uh, 1.04. And then we create uh, the variable present value, and uh, the initial value is uh, zero. And in total, we have here five cash flows, so we have five loops. So for i in range five, and in each and every loop, we increment uh, the present value by the present value of uh, the respective cash flow. 
So let's have a look how this works in the first loop. So we have i equals uh, zero. Then we take uh, the very first element at index position zero, it's uh, 50 and divide it uh, by f uh, to the power of i plus one, uh, which is actually here one. So here we have to uh, increment i by one in each and every loop uh, to get actually the discounting period. And also here we can print uh, the intermediate results. So the present value of uh, the very first payout, uh, 50, is uh, 48. And in total, the present value of all payouts is uh, 316. So we have to fund our savings plan, our savings account today with uh, 316 to get uh, the guaranteed uh, payout uh, plan here. All right, thanks for watching and I'll see you also in the next video. Bye. In the last lecture, we have calculated the present value of our payout plan that we arranged with a bank. And we calculated a present value of all payouts of uh, 316.36 so that's uh, today's value of all benefits uh, that uh, we receive in the future. And at the same time, that is also the funding amount or saving amount that uh, we have to pay into our plan today. And I0 stands uh, for the investment today. And uh, we have a negative sign here. So this is a cash outflow today. And in the future, we have uh, positive uh, cash inflows. In this particular case, uh, we have uh, the situation that uh, the present value of all inflows is equal to the initial investment. So if we uh, rearrange uh, this, we can also say that the initial investment, which is negative, plus uh, the present value of all inflows is zero. And uh, this is exactly the net present value or short NPV. So net because we deduct uh, the initial investment from the present value of positive inflows. And here in this example, we have a net present value of zero. And uh, the reason is uh, that here we have a structured uh, bank product. So the savings amount or the initial investment was calculated based on the positive inflows. However, that is uh, not the standard case in real world. So let's have a look at a real world uh, scenario and a real world investment example. So here we have uh, the XYZ company and it evaluates to buy an additional machine that will increase future profits or cash flows by $20 in the first year, $50 in the second year and so on. And uh, the additional machine costs $200. So that's uh, the investment today or in a T0. And our task is now to calculate the project's net present value and evaluate whether the company should pursue the project. And actually XYZ's required rate of return or the cost of capital is 6% per year. So later on we will have a more detailed look here on required rate of return or cost of capital. But first of all let's have a look at the formula. And this is actually nothing new. So here we have uh, the present value of all inflows and here we have uh, the initial investment which is negative. So net present value is equal to the initial investment negative plus uh, the present value of uh, future inflows. And here we have R which is uh, the required uh, rate of return or the cost of capital of the company. And typically in those uh, real world investment projects um, the initial investment is uh, not equal to the present value of uh, positive inflows. So we have a net present value that is unequal to zero. So either we have a positive ne net present value or we have a negative uh, net present value. And actually the most important question for each and every project is now, should we accept a project or should we uh, reject uh, a project? And uh, the decision rule is pretty simple. So if uh, the net present value of a project is uh, positive, uh, then we should accept the project and pursue the project. And if uh, the net present value is negative, uh, then we should uh, reject the project. And I also want to give you an interpretation of a net present value. So typically when we pursue or accept a project with a positive net present value, then uh, theoretically, today's company value should increase uh, by the net present value of uh, the additional project. And in total, we can say that the total company value 
is actually the sum of uh, the net present values of all projects. So this might be a bit uh, theoretical, but uh, this is actually the interpretation for a total company value or actually the sources of uh, a company value. So it's uh, the sum of all projects uh, net present values. And we've already seen in our formula that we do not have an interest rate, but a required rate of return or cost of capital. So here in red. And I also want to give you a short intuition on the required rate of return of a company. So the required rate of return is actually the expected return of comparable or alternative projects. Or we could also say the return of uh, the second uh, best or next uh, opportunity or project. So let's uh, have an example here in private life. And let's assume that a bank offers you an interest rate of 2.5% on uh, the savings account. However, on your existing account uh, with uh, your existing bank, you already get an interest rate of 4%. So this 4% is actually the next uh, best opportunity or alternative. And it's in a way your opportunity costs. So you would only change uh, to a new bank and to a new savings account if it uh, provides a higher interest rate than uh, your existing savings account. So in this example, you probably wouldn't change um, the bank and the savings account if uh, you get only 2.5% instead of uh, 4%. And there's also a second intuition for the required rate of return. So typically the initial capital outflow I0 has to be funded and a company is typically funded uh, with uh, debt. So we have either bank financing or the company issues uh, bonds uh, to bondholders. And uh, the fixed interest rate is uh, then actually here the cost of debt. So it might be 4% or 5% or whatever. And uh, second, we have also the cost of equity. So that's uh, the required return by the shareholders. So typically, of course, a company is uh, not required to pay fixed interest or dividends uh, to shareholders. But nevertheless, the shareholders require a return. And later on in this course, we have a deep dive into required equity returns or forecasting equity returns. But for the time being here, it's uh, sufficient to know that a company calculates uh, with uh, the weighted average cost of capital to fund a capital outflow. And this is also called uh, the WEC, so weighted average cost of capital. And let's also have a short uh, private life example. So let's assume a friend asks you to lend him 1,000 US dollars uh, for one year. And actually, you do not have uh, the 1,000 US dollars. And uh, before you can do this, you have to go to your bank and also borrow the, the money from the bank at, for example, an interest rate of uh, 3%. Then uh, this is actually your cost uh, to fund um, the capital outflow to your friend. And if your friend offers you an interest rate of only 2% and uh, you have uh, the cost of funding of uh, 3%, then obviously this is uh, not a good uh, deal for you. So this uh, will definitely result in a negative uh, net, net present value for this uh, project here. All right, that was uh, the theory. And in the next video, we will actually calculate and code uh, the net present value with uh, Python. So hope to see you there. Bye. All right, we are going to calculate now the net present value for XYZ's investment project. And uh, we create here a list uh, with all cash flows, starting with uh, the initial outflow in uh, T0. So today it's minus 200. And then uh, we have positive inflows in the next uh, years. And we also have uh, the discounting factor of 1.06 which is 1 plus uh, the required rate of return or cost of capital of 6% and uh, then again we create uh, the variable NPV which is initially uh, 0 and uh, then we iterate over the cash flow list. So let's have a look at the very first iteration and here we have i equals uh, 0 so we increment uh, the net present value by the very first element at index position zero, so minus 200, and uh, 200 uh, discounted by zero period, so we have minus 200 again. Then next in one year, we have a positive inflow of uh, 20, and we discount uh, 20 by one period, and so on. 
And uh, finally, we print out uh, the final net present value of our project. And it is uh, 38.71, so the net present value is positive and uh, we should actually accept and uh, pursue the project. And the question is now, would your conclusion change uh, with a purchase price of $250 instead of $200? And actually we can uh, change elements in a list. So we can here index or select uh, the very first element, minus 200. And uh, we can assign actually a new value, minus 250. So later on in this course, we will also have a deeper look uh, how to change and add and also remove values uh, from lists. So this is here a short outlook and uh, let's do this. And let's have a look again at our cash flow list. So now here we have minus 250. And actually now we rerun here uh, the for loop and let's uh, calculate again the net present value. And now we have here a net present value of minus 11.28. So the net present value is negative and uh, therefore we should uh, reject uh, the project here. And the intuition in this case is that uh, the return from the project does actually not cover uh, capital costs. So the capital costs are 6% and uh, having a negative uh, net present value. So we do not cover here the capital costs. Or to have another intuition, so here we should uh, reject uh, the project and uh, pursue uh, the second best alternative, uh, which uh, should give us around uh, 6% here. All right, thanks for watching and I'll see you also in the next video. Bye. Welcome to the second coding exercise. We are here on the Jupyter dashboard and we know that uh, our course materials are located on the desktop. And here we can see course materials part one. And we go to exercises and select exercise two. Exercise two is all about lists, for loops and time value of money problems with many cash flows. And uh, therefore, first of all, here we have a savings plan with uh, some cash flows and we should uh, store the cash flows in a list. And uh, second, we have to index uh, the list for some elements. So today's saving or the saving in year three and so on. Then we shall iterate over the list and print each and every element. Then next we have to calculate the sum over all cash flows. And here we should use a for loop. And then question five, we should do the same, but instead of using a for loop, we have to use a build-in function for the sum, but also for the length. Next, we have to create a range object and uh, print all integers from zero till 100. And then we create a list uh, with all timestamps of our savings plan from zero till six. And we have to use uh, a range object for this. And then we need to reverse the order and then finally, we have to calculate uh, the future value of our savings plan after year six. And now let's go on to the ABC company. And uh, the company considers to buy a new machine for $2,000. And it expects a future profit or cash flow increase by the following amounts. And here we shall calculate uh, the net present value. And based on the net present value and a required rate of return of 8%, uh, we shall evaluate whether ABC should pursue the project. And uh, last but not least, uh, the final question, would ABC accept uh, the project uh, with a required rate of return of 10%? So that's uh, coding exercise two. And if you want to do it on your own, then uh, please uh, stop the video now. All right, now let's go to the solutions. And first of all, we can create a list uh, with uh, square brackets and we pass uh, the single elements or single cash flows separated by commas. And then we save the list in the variable CF. Then here we have to index uh, the list for the following elements, today's saving. So that's uh, the very first element at index position zero. So we have zero based indexing. Then next uh, we shall index for the saving in year three. So that's uh, the fourth element at index position three. Then we have the second element at index position one. 
And uh, finally, we have uh, the final year savings. So the very last element at index position minus one. So here we apply negative indexing. Next, we shall iterate over the list and print each and every element. And we can do this uh, with a for loop. And we use here the for loop variable element, but we can use here any variable. So for instance, i or whatever. And then we make a colon here and uh, press enter. And then we get automatically an indent here. And then we use uh, the print function to print each and every element. Here in question four, we have to sum up our savings and our cash flows. And uh, we can do this with a for loop and uh, we shall also print intermediate results. So first of all, we initiate here a variable total and the initial value is zero. And then we iterate over CF and uh, for each and every element, we increment total by the element. And uh, inside the for loop, we also print the uh, intermediate results. And finally, we again print uh, the very last, uh, the final result. And we get here 14,700. So here we calculated the, the sum with a for loop, but uh, there's also a Python build-in function and it's uh, the sum function. And within the parenthesis, uh, we pass uh, the list uh, CF. And of course we get uh, the very same result. And with uh, the length function, we can determine the number of elements in the list. So we pass CF to the length function and we have seven elements. And actually we not only can iterate over a list, but also over a range object. So we can say for i in range 101, and uh, this is actually exclusive. So this is actually the range from zero to 100 inclusive. And we print each and every element. So from uh, zero to 100. Then we shall create and save for the list n with all timestamps. So in total we have seven cache flows starting at timestamp uh, zero till timestamp six. And we use uh, the range function here. So we pass seven exclusive and actually transform the range object into a list with uh, the link list function. And uh, we save the list in the variable n. So this is n. And uh, next we shall reverse the order of n and reassign n. So we can actually reverse the order with the following code, double colon minus one, and we reassign it to n. Now having the cash flow list and uh, the list n with the reversed order, we can calculate the future value of our savings account after six years. And we can assume an interest rate of 4%. So we have 4% interest rate and therefore a compounding factor f of uh, 1.04. And then we initiate a for loop and uh, we start uh, with uh, the variable future value, which is uh, zero. And then we iterate over each and every element in the list the CF and increment uh, the future value by the future value of each and every element. So we have here the respective cash flow times f to the power of uh, the respective uh, time period. And uh, finally, we print the uh, future value and we get here 16,053. So now let's come to a simple capital budgeting problem. And actually ABC evaluates to buy a machine for 2000 and it expects uh, the following positive uh, profits and cash flows. And ABC's uh, required rate of return is 8%. And based on this, uh, we shall calculate the net present value. So first of all, we create uh, the cash flow list with uh, the initial outflow and uh, the inflows. And then we have uh, the return of 8% and uh, the discounting factor. And then we initiate uh, the variable NPV and uh, the initial value is zero. And then for each and every cash flow in the cash flow list, uh, we calculate uh, the present value and uh, we add uh, the present values. And finally, we have uh, the sum of uh, the present values of the positive inflows minus uh, the initial outflow or plus uh, the initial outflow, which is uh, negative. So we iterate here over the cash flow list. And uh, we end up uh, with a, an NPV of uh, 71. And uh, this is uh, greater than zero. And this means uh, that we should accept uh, the project. 
Finally, we shall do the very same calculation, but instead of having a required rate of return of 8%, we shall do this uh, with uh, 10%. So we have uh, the same cash flows, but actually R differs. And uh, this is uh, the very same code, but uh, with a different uh, rate of return. And here we get a negative net present value, minus 61. And uh, this means that in this case, ABC should uh, recheck the project. All right, this was uh, coding exercise two and I uh, hope to see you also in the next exercise, bye. In this course, we already got in touch uh, with uh, several data types uh, that exist in Python, maybe without uh, knowing it. So in this video, I will cover some of uh, the most commonly used uh, Python data types. And actually in Python, everything is an object. So we've already seen that uh, we can uh, save an object in memory and that we can assign an object to a variable. So here, for example, we have the number or the integer 100. This is an object in Python. And uh, with uh, the built-in function type, uh, we can also check the data type. So here we have 100 and uh, the data type is integer. So 100 is uh, simply a number without any decimals. And we've already learned that we can divide the two numbers and assign the result to a variable. So here we can calculate the present value of uh, the cash flow 100 and uh, the interest rate is uh, 3%. So here we have the object 97.08 and uh, many more decimals stored uh, in the variable PV. And again, we can check uh, with uh, the type function, the data type of uh, the object that uh, the variable PV is uh, referencing to and it's an float. So here we have a number with uh, many decimals and uh, this is actually a float object. And also the discounting factor of uh, 1.03 is a float object. And uh, even uh, the object uh, one point is a float because uh, when we type one point, then automatically we get uh, the float and uh, not uh, the integer one. So we have 1.0. Now lists are also objects and uh, they have uh, the data type uh, list. So what a surprise here. So here we have uh, the type uh, list. And also we have already worked with a range object. So we can assign uh, to the range object uh, from uh, zero till 10 exclusive. We can uh, assign this range object uh, to the variable n. And we can check uh, the data type of n. And it's a range object. And also we have already used uh, the built-in function print where we can actually uh, print uh, numbers or lists. So for example, we can print out explicitly here the list uh, CF. And also a built-in function is an object in Python and uh, has a data type. So we can check the data type of uh, the print function and it is uh, a built-in function or method. And again in Python, uh, the general rule is that we can store objects in memory and that we can assign objects to, to a variable. So we can also assign here the function print to the variable a. And then we can actually call the function. So we can print out the cf by passing here our list cf uh, within the parenthesis here of a. So a is referencing to the function print. So this also works here. Next, uh, we have uh, the very important data type uh, strings. And actually strings are simply a sequence of uh, letters and also numbers and can be used for names. So for example, Alex or Microsoft. And we can actually create a string uh, by passing the sequence of letters here within uh, quotation marks. So here we have uh, Microsoft. And here we can see that uh, this is a string and uh, we can see this here with uh, the quotation marks. And also here we can check uh, the data type with uh, the type function and uh, we get uh, str for string. And it's no surprise uh, that we can also store strings in memory and uh, assign them to a variable. So for example, here we have uh, the variable company name and uh, we have Microsoft here. So the variable company name is uh, referencing uh, to the object uh, Microsoft, a string object. Then next uh, we have booleans, so true and false. And we can already see here in uh, green that uh, these are actually special keywords. So we have true and we can check the data type of true. And it's a bool. 
and also false. Um, this is also a Boolean value. So these were very few examples of uh, data types in Python. And the question is now, so what is a data type? And actually the data type of an object actually determines uh, the functionality. So actually we can uh, divide two numbers. So here an integer divided by a float and uh, we get here a result. And uh, this only works actually because uh, some developers uh, defined that uh, we can divide an integer by a float object. And if we try to do the same with a string, so we divide a string by 1.03, then we get here an error message, so unsupported operand type for string and float, so the divide does not work here. And also here this behavior and the fact uh, that we get here an error message, a type error, is uh, the result of the extensive uh, work performed by the Python uh, developers and uh, they actually defined uh, the functionality of uh, data types and they did this actually in classes. So we could say that uh, the string Microsoft is an object with uh, the data type string but we can also say that Microsoft is an instance of uh, the class uh, string and we can also say that 100 has uh, the data type integer or is an instance of uh, the class integer and within these classes uh, the python developers actually defined uh, the functionality all right this was a very high level overview on object oriented programming thanks for watching and i'll see you also in the next video bye this is an overview and the hierarchy of the most commonly used data types in Python. So we've already learned that in Python everything is an object and uh, each object has a data type. So for example we have integers, uh, we have uh, floats which are numbers, then we have uh, lists, we have uh, functions uh, like the print function and also we have uh, strings and uh, booleans, uh, true and false and uh, many more data types. And actually for each object uh, we can determine the data type or alternatively we could also say that each object is an instance of a class. And actually in classes uh, the functionality and uh, the properties of uh, data types are defined. And finally each object has a memory address so we can uh, store each object in memory. So for example we can store integers, uh, floats, uh, booleans and also strings. So let's have a look at the hierarchy of some data types and uh, first of all we have numbers and uh, there we have integers and uh, floats and also booleans uh, true and false are numbers so we will see uh, this uh, later in the course. Then next uh, we have uh, collections uh, where we can store multiple elements or objects and uh, first of all we have uh, sequences. And here we can differentiate between mutable and immutable sequences. So mutable sequences like lists can be changed in memory. And in contrast to that, uh, immutable sequences cannot be changed. So for example, tuples and strings. So later in the course uh, we will have special lectures on mutability. Then next uh, we have uh, sets and also here we have mutable and immutable sets. And uh, finally we have uh, mappings uh, like uh, dictionaries. So these are the most commonly used uh, collections provided by the Python standard library. However, and uh, to be honest, there are more powerful data handling tools uh, that are provided by special data science libraries uh, like uh, NumPy arrays, Pandas data frames and Pandas series. So later in this course we will cover all these uh, tools in detail. And uh, finally we have also callables. So for example build in functions uh, like the print function or the length function are callables. So we can call these functions and for example we can pass uh, a list uh, within the parentheses of the print function and uh, print out uh, the list. Or with uh, the length function uh, we can actually determine the number of elements in a list by calling the length function and actually by passing a list uh, within the parentheses of uh, the length function. Then next uh, we have built-in methods and uh, these actually work in the very same way as uh, functions but uh, methods are actually specific uh, for each and every data type and class. So there are different methods uh, for integers and uh, for strings. And uh, finally we can also define our own user-defined functions. So in many cases uh, we do not have to reinvent the wheel 
and there already exists some uh, built-in functions or methods but uh, sometimes uh, we have to define our own uh, user-defined functions so that's actually real fun thanks for watching and i'll see you also in the next video bye this is an excursus to dynamic typing so dynamic typing is uh, the opposite of static typing and if you are familiar with other programming languages uh, you might be used to static typing and in this regard uh, python works here different so here we have a dynamic typing and let's have a look on dynamic typing so we can assign uh, the integer uh, 100 uh, to the variable a and then we can check uh, the data type a it's uh, an integer so actually the variable a is uh, referencing uh, to the integer object uh, 100 then next in python we can change uh, the reference of a variable and uh, we can for example assign uh, the string object uh, facebook uh, to the variable a and now we can check uh, the data type of uh, the object uh, that uh, the variable a is uh, referencing to and it's now a string and finally we can also assign a list to our variable a so that's uh, no problem and a is now referencing uh, to the list so no problems here this uh, works uh, perfectly in python because uh, we have dynamic typing in python however in other programming languages uh, this uh, does not work so once uh, we have assigned uh, the integer 100 uh, to the variable a then the variable a has been declared as an integer and uh, cannot be assigned uh, the string value facebook later on so here in java we would actually get an error message all right thanks for watching and i'll see you also in the next video bye in this lecture we will go through some of uh, the most commonly used python build-in functions so build-in functions have uh, been created to perform some of uh, the most uh, frequently used workflows in an easy and efficient manner so for instance uh, if we want to determine the number of elements in a list we can do this with a for loop but uh, this is uh, pretty inconvenient and python coders have to reinvent the wheel again and again so to avoid this uh, there are some helpful built-in functions uh, like uh, the length function all right let's assume that uh, we save 100 dollar for one year at an interest rate of three uh, percent then of course we can assign uh, to uh, these input factors uh, some uh, variables and we can calculate uh, the future value and we've already worked with uh, the build-in function print so here we can actually display values in uh, the output so for example we can print uh, the future value and it's here 103 and actually build-in functions have uh, one thing in common so typically they can be performed on different data types or to put it uh, the other way around uh, we can pass uh, different data types uh, to build-in functions so for example here we passed a float object to the print function but we can of course also print here a string facebook or we can also print a list and actually most functions uh, give some flexibility and options to customize uh, things so for example the print function allows uh, to print uh, many objects so here we have uh, many objects uh, separated by a comma and functions typically also have uh, parameters like uh, the separator parameter and here in this example we can define how the values uh, that we print out are separated in the output so for example here we can pass uh, the argument a new line to the separator parameter and let's have a look here so here we have uh, the present value the interest rate the number of periods and the future value in the separated lines uh, but we can also pass another argument to the separator parameter so for example comma and uh, by doing so we separate uh, the output values only by commas so here we have uh, the output separated by commas all right next uh, let's uh, create uh, the list of cash flows with in total six cash flows and uh, then we have already learned uh, that uh, with uh, the length function we can determine the number of elements in the list and alternatively we can also do this with a for loop but uh, no need to reinvent the wheel here actually so we have six elements and actually to the length function we can pass all kind of uh, sequences so a list is a sequence uh, containing uh, different values but also a string is a sequence uh, containing many letters 
So for example, Facebook has uh, in total eight letters here. And therefore we can also pass here the string Facebook to the length function. And here we get uh, the result eight. And finally, we can also try to pass an integer to the length function. And here we get uh, the error message uh, that uh, the object of type integer has uh, no length function or no length. And actually these behaviors here have been defined in the classes. So for example, in the integer class, it has been defined uh, that uh, there is no length uh, for an integer, for example. All right, now let's uh, go to uh, the sum function. And also here we can pass a sequence uh, like our cash flow list. And here we get uh, the sum over all elements, uh, 90. And we can also try to pass um, the string Facebook uh, to the sum function. But here we get an error message, so unsupported operand type plus uh, for integer and string. Next, we can also get uh, the minimum value in the cash flow list uh, with uh, the min method. And we get minus 200. And uh, then we can also try to apply the min function on a string, so for example, Facebook. And uh, we would actually expect to get the uh, minimum alphabetical value, and here it's an A. So let's try this out. And uh, here we get capital F, so this is an unexpected behavior actually. And for the min function, capital letters come first. And here we only have one capital letter, so F, and therefore we get here F. And let's uh, try to do the same with uh, a lowercase f here. And then we get a. So we should be careful when we use uh, built-in methods and functions. And we should try to understand uh, what is going on in the background. Otherwise, we will be surprised by some strange behaviors here. And uh, with the max function, we can also get uh, the highest or the maximum element. And in case of our cash flow list, it's 100. And uh, for Facebook, so here we would expect actually an O here. And uh, this is true. All right, these were a few Python built-in functions, but uh, there are many more. And let's have a look. Here we have all available Python built-in functions. So for example, we have uh, the range function or the print function and the length function. And uh, later on in this course, we will examine uh, many other functions. But uh, for the time being, we have reached uh, the end of this video and I hope to see you also in the next one. Bye. We have already seen the integer data type and actually integers are whole numbers uh, without the uh, decimals or fractions. So for instance, uh, 100 is an integer and we can check this uh, with uh, the type function. And of course we can perform arithmetics uh, with integers. So for example, addition, subtraction, multiplication and division. And if we divide two integers, then we get actually a float object, even if uh, the result itself is also an integer. So 10 could be an integer here, but as we can see here, we have 10.0 and uh, this is a float. So let's uh, check this. Before we have learned that in Python we can store objects in memory and uh, assign objects uh, to variables. And of course also integers are objects and we can store them here for example in the variable i0. So the investment at the timestamp 0. And actually we could also say that the integer 100 is an instance of uh, the class integer. And actually integers have some uh, built-in methods. So built-in methods are actually very similar to built-in functions, but uh, methods are actually specifically designed uh, for a class or data type. So an integer object, uh, for instance, has uh, different methods uh, than, for example, a list. And uh, there are very few methods uh, for integers. And actually one method is uh, the bit length method. And we can actually uh, call a method by having here the variable that is pointing or referencing uh, to the object. And then we have a dot. And uh, then we have to code uh, the method. So here in this example, it's a bit length. And same as uh, with the built-in functions, we need uh, some parentheses uh, to call the function or the method. 
And actually, there are many methods uh, where we can pass arguments here inside the parentheses, but uh, not here with uh, the bit length method. So now let's simply run the cell and uh, we get here seven. And we can also go here inside the parentheses and uh, press uh, shift tab. So we hold shift and press tab. And by doing so, we get here some information on the method. So for example, the description or doc string that the bit length method uh, returns the number of bits necessary to represent uh, the integer in binary. So we are using here a computer and typically we are working with uh, decibel numbers and the decimal system. However, in our computer, the decibel numbers have a binary representation, so the binary system and uh, the bit length method actually returns the number of bits uh, necessary to represent uh, the integer in a binary. And in this case here with uh, 100, it's uh, seven bits. All right, thanks for watching and I'll see you also in the next video, bye. All right, we are coming now to floats and uh, floats are actually numbers with decimals. For instance, 1.04, we have here two decimals and we can also check the data type and it's no surprise uh, that uh, this is a float. And in case uh, we divide one integer by another integer, and even if we get here another integer, so here 10, then uh, this is actually a float here then in Python, so after division, so 10.0. And we can also check the data type, it's a float. And we've already learned that in Python we can store objects in memory and assign to a variable. And of course we can also do this uh, with uh, float objects. So we can uh, save uh, the object 1.04 and assign it uh, to the variable r. And uh, then for instance we can perform some arithmetics uh, multiplication. 100 times uh, 1.04 gives 104. And actually there are also some built-in methods for floats. So let's have a look here with uh, the tab key. So we have the s integer ratio method or the is integer method. So let's have a look here inside the parenthesis with the shift tab. And the is integer method actually returns true if uh, the float is an integer. And uh, with 1.04, we should get actually a false. And that's true. And let's also have a look at the method s integer ratio. And this method actually returns the integer ratio. So each and every float is actually stored as an integer ratio, a ratio of two integers. And let's have a look how 1.04 is internally stored or represented. So actually 1.04 is the ratio of this large integer and this large integer. Next, let's come to some uh, strange behavior and uh, obviously some bugs in our code. But uh, this is actually not a bug and uh, this is also not uh, Python specific. And now let's make the following calculation. So we add 0.1 three times and uh, then we check whether this is equal to 0.3. And actually it uh, should be equal. But uh, we get here a false. And this seems to be a bug, but uh, this is not a bug. And to understand uh, this behavior here, we have to understand how floats are actually internally uh, represented. And first of all, let's have a look at 0.1. So we get here 0.1, but if we add here 0.1 three times, then we get the result of 0.3. And then in the 15th decimal, we get a four. So this is not exactly 0.3 and it seems like that 0.3 is exactly 0.3 but let's check this in more detail and we can do this with the built-in function format. And here we can pass um, the float, so for instance 0.1 or 0.3 and then we can define how many decimals um, the format ma function uh, shall display. So this means here 20 decimals and let's have a look at uh, 20 decimals of 0.1. And here we get 0.1 and then finally in the very last uh, three decimals uh, we have uh, 555. So 0.1 is uh, not exactly 0.1 and let's check this also for 
And also 0 0.3 is not exactly 0 0.3. So here we have 0 0.299 and finally here 8890. And actually this behavior is not a Python specific. So we're working here on a computer with a binary system. So zero and one and numbers in a computer are represented using bits and not uh, decimal digits. So all numbers have a binary representation, a zero and one. And therefore some decimal numbers uh, with a finite uh, representation. So 0.1 and 0.3 have a finite uh, representation in the decimal system, but they do not have a finite binary representation. So that's uh, simply impossible. So let's have a look at a float example that has a finite binary representation. For instance, one divided by eight. So eight is uh, two to the power of uh, three. And this should work in the binary system. So we have here 0.125 and let's also get uh, 20 decimals. And 0.125 is actually the exact uh, representation. And as another example, one divided by 32 has also a finite binary representation. So 32 is actually two to the power of five. And uh, let's check this here. And 0.03125 is uh, the exact uh, representation also in uh, the decimal system. So the question is now, can we get a more precise uh, representation for 0.1? So for instance, by rounding, but uh, this is simply impossible because uh, still we are here in a computer with a binary system. So we can uh, try to round 0.1 to one decimal, but if we check this uh, with uh, the format function, then we can see here that even with rounding, we cannot make 0.1 more precise here. All right, thanks for watching and I'll see you also in the next video, bye. We have already used the Python build-in function round in the last lecture and in this lecture we will examine some more options how to round the floats and also integers. So let's start uh, with uh, the float 1.3454 and actually we can round this uh, to the next integer. So let's have a look here inside with shift tab and actually the round function rounds a number to a given precision in decimal digits. So we have two parameters here, the number parameter where we have to pass uh, the number and uh, we have uh, the n digits parameter. And here we can define the precision or the number of digits and uh, the default behavior is uh, that actually we get uh, the very next integer. So let's uh, run the cell here. And here we get uh, the next integer which is one. So we round 1.3454 down to one. And uh, now let's have a look at the number 1.7657. So if we apply the round function here, then by default uh, we round the number to the next integer. And in this case, it's uh, two. And we've already seen that we can define a precision and a number of digits. So for instance, uh, we can also round uh, to a one digit, 1.34. Let's have a look here. And here we get 1.3. And we can also pass uh, two decimals. And here we should actually round up to 1.35. Let's have a look here. And this is true. And we've already seen that uh, there are numbers that cannot be represented with a finite uh, binary representation. And also rounding uh, does not help us here. So again, we have the case where we want to round 1.3454 to uh, two decimals. And then we check uh, the first uh, 20 decimals with the format method. And also here we can see that uh, with the rounding, we do not uh, get exactly 1.35. So we have 1.35 and in the 18th and 19th uh, decimal, we have some eights here. All right, now let's go on. And we not only can round uh, floats, but we can also round integers, for example, to the next multiple of 10 by passing here minus. So by passing here minus one, we round uh, to the next multiple of 10. And in this case, we should round down to 10. And having 17, we should round up to 20. And of course, we can also round to the next multiple of 100 by passing minus two. And having here 217, we should round down 
to the next multiple of 100 and this is here 200 and uh, 257 should give uh, 300 so 300 is the next multiple of uh, 100 for 257 and now let's come to kind of a strange behavior so let's uh, try to round 1.5 and this is actually a tie as uh, the distance uh, to the next the multiples is equal. So we have 0.5 distance to 1 and a distance of 0.5 uh, to 2. And let's uh, check this here. And here we get 2. And now let's uh, try to round 2.5. And also here we would expect uh, that uh, we round up to 3. But uh, this is obviously not the case. So also here we get 2. And this behavior is actually the so-called uh, banker's rounding. And it actually seems arbitrary, but uh, there's a real benefit of banker's rounding. So let's assume that you want to add 1.5, 2.5, 3.5 and 4.5. And this gives a 12. And now let's assume that 0.5 is always uh, rounded uh, to the next uh, lower integer. Then we should receive uh, the following result which is uh, clearly pretty far away from 12. So we have here 10. And now let's check what we really get when we use here the round function on each and every element. So do we get 10 or 12? And do we actually get 12? And again, uh, this is uh, the so-called banker's rounding and it works in a way that the uh, ties are rounded to the nearest or next value with an even least significant digit. So in our example here, we round uh, to the next even integer. And in case of uh, 1.5, it's 2. In case of 2.5, it's also 2. So 2 is an even number here. And we can see that banker's rounding leads uh, to less biased rounding. So if ties are always rounded to the next higher or to the next uh, lower integer, then we get here actually very unprecise uh, results. So on average, 50% of all ties uh, will be rounded up and 50% uh, will be rounded down. All right, thanks for watching and I'll see you also in the next video, bye. In this lecture, we will examine lists in more detail. So lists are collections and uh, more specific sequences uh, where we can store many objects. So for example, here we have our cache flows, uh, six in total, and uh, we create a list and assign it uh, to the variable cf. Then next we can check uh, with uh, the built-in function type, the type, so this is a list. And we can also determine uh, the number of elements in our list uh, with uh, the length function. So in total we have six elements. Then with uh, the built-in function sum, we can uh, calculate uh, the sum over all elements. And here we have uh, 90. Then next uh, we have uh, the built-in function max. And here we can determine uh, the maximum element in our list, uh, CF, and it actually should be 100. So let's have a look here. And we can also determine the minimum element uh, with uh, the min function. And we've already learned how to index a list or a sequence, and uh, the so-called uh, zero-based indexing applies. So if we want to get uh, the very first element, uh, so here minus 200, then uh, this element is at index position zero. And uh, we can actually index lists here with a square bracket. And there's also the concept of uh, negative indexing. So for example, if we want to get uh, the second uh, last element, then we can pass here minus two and uh, we should get uh, the element 100. Lists have also some uh, built-in methods. And let's have a look here. So we have uh, cf dot and let's press uh, the tab key to get a drop down menu. So here we have um, the uh, built in methods uh, for lists. So for example, we have uh, the append method, the copy method, and also the index method. And we also need here some parentheses. And actually in the index method, we can actually pass a value and we can check uh, the index position of uh, the first occurrence of uh, this value. So for example, in our list, uh, we have uh, the value 70 and uh, the very first occurrence uh, we have at index position three. So if we pass here 70, then uh, we get uh, the index position three. And we can also try to pass a value that is uh, not in our list. 
So for example, 59. And here we get value errors. So 59 is uh, not in our list cache flows. Next, uh, there's uh, the Python build-in function enumerate. And here we can pass our cache flow list. And by doing so, we create a enumerate object. And we can actually unpack an enumerate object uh, with um, the list function. So we pass uh, the enumerate uh, object here within the parentheses of the list function. And here we get a list and uh, the list actually contains uh, tuples. So we can see here with the parentheses, uh, so these are tuples uh, containing two elements. And uh, later on in this course, uh, we will have a closer look on tuples, but for the time being, so here we have index uh, value pairs. So we have uh, the value minus 200 and uh, this is at index position zero. Then we have the value 20, which is at index position one and so on. Next, we have uh, the built-in method count, and uh, count actually returns uh, the number of occurrences of uh, one value. So for example, here we have um, one time uh, the value 20, and by passing 20, we should get uh, the number of occurrences. So in this example, it's one occurrence. And finally, it's uh, pretty important to understand that in a list, uh, we can store different objects uh, of uh, different uh, data types. So for example, we can store integers and uh, also floats, for example, 50.2, and we can store strings and uh, Boolean values. So this is uh, no problem here. And we can also iterate over the list and uh, determine for each and every element in our list uh, the data type. So let's do this here. And here we can see that uh, we have four different data types in our list. Uh, we have integers, floats, uh, strings, and uh, Booleans. And this is actually an important uh, characteristic of lists that uh, we can store objects uh, of uh, different data types here. And uh, this also determines uh, the functionality of lists and also the performance of lists, for instance, in element-wise operations. So later in this course, we will see that, for example, in a NumPy array, it's only allowed to have uh, one data type. And actually, in the end, uh, that's uh, the reason why lists and NumPy arrays behave uh, differently. But uh, we will see this later in the course. But uh, for the time being, we are now finished. And I hope to see you also in the next video. Bye. In the last lecture, we have learned that we can store objects of uh, different data types in lists. However, this uh, flexibility comes at a cost. So it limits element-wise operations uh, with lists. What do I mean with element-wise operations? So let's assume that uh, we have forecasted uh, future cash flows for an investment project. So for example, 100 in one year, 10 in two years, and so on. So let's uh, create the list here. And then we get some positive news uh, that allows us uh, to update our forecasts. Say we now expect 10% uh, higher cash flows. Then it would be great to simply multiply each and every element in our list uh, with 1.1. Uh, so let's try this out. And we get here an error message. So this is uh, not how lists work. Let's have another example. And uh, let's assume that we need to update our forecast as uh, there is an additional fixed cost of uh, 20 per year. Then consequently, we need to subtract uh, 20 from each and every cash flow in our list. And uh, let's uh, try this out here. But again, this is not how lists work. So there's a workaround uh, with a for loop. But uh, first of all, uh, let me introduce uh, the append method. So we can create a list uh, with uh, the elements 1, 2, and 3. And uh, with uh, the append method, we can actually add another element at uh, the end of the list. So for example, here the element 4. And here we have actually 4 at uh, the end of our list here on the right hand side. And also we can create empty lists. So we have here square brackets uh, with uh, no elements. And uh, we can assign the variable uh, cash flows new. So this is possible here. All right, now we are equipped to perform element wise operations. And actually, we want to create a list with cash flows increased by 10%. And uh, therefore, first of all, we create uh, the empty list uh, cash flow new. And then we iterate over the list cash flows. And uh, for each and every cash flow, we actually multiply the cash flow with 1.1 1 .1 and uh, store the increased cash flow in the variable new 
and uh, then we append uh, the increased cash flow which is uh, stored in the variable new to our new list and uh, this we will do for all loops or for all cash flows and uh, finally we print our cash flow new list and here we have our cash flows all our cash flows increased by 10 percent and the same we can do also for our second example so we can subtract uh, 20 from each and every element in our list cash flow and again we create uh, the new list the cash flow new it's an empty list here and we iterate over each and every element in our cash flow list and we actually subtract uh, 20 from each and every element and then we append uh, the new value to uh, the new list the cash flow new and finally we print out uh, the new list here and here we have all values uh, reduced uh, by 20. And finally, there's actually one last uh, thing that I want to show you. So before we have seen that uh, we cannot multiply a list uh, with a float object. So our cash flow list multiplied with the 1.1 1 .1, uh, does not work. However, we can actually multiply a list with an integer. So for example, three. So let's have a look here. And actually, instead of multiplying each and every element uh, with uh, three, we created here three copies of uh, the list and uh, actually concatenated uh, the three copies into uh, one list. So we have uh, three times uh, the sequence 100, 10, 20, 50, 30, and 25. So if our intention was uh, to multiply each and every element uh, with uh, three, then actually this result is uh, pretty surprising actually. All right, thanks for watching and I'll see you also in the next video. Bye. We have already learned how to get or access single elements in a list. This is called indexing. However, we can also slice a list. Uh, that means that we can get or access many elements or subsets of a list. And actually the very important concepts of uh, zero-based indexing and negative indexing apply also to list slicing. So let's assume that here we have our list uh, with uh, six cash flows. And now we want to get or we want to slice uh, for the elements uh, 20, 50 and uh, 70. So here we have uh, the index positions uh, 0, 1, 2 and uh, 3. And we can actually slice for this subset by opening uh, square brackets here. And uh, then we can slice uh, from the second element at index position 1 inclusive. So here it's uh, 20 until so colon stands for until until the element at index position 4 it's 100 exclusive so let's uh, run the cell here and here we have uh, the subset uh, 20 50 and 70 so let's have another example and uh, let's uh, slice uh, from index position uh, 0 inclusive until index position 1 exclusive and here we only get uh, the very first element uh, minus 200. And actually when we slice uh, from the very first element, we can also have uh, the following notation. So colon 2 means uh, that uh, we slice uh, from the very first element until the third element at index position 2 exclusive. So here we have minus 220, so the first two elements. And we can also slice from a specific element until the very last element inclusive. So for example, let's assume that we want to get all elements uh, from uh, the second till the last. Then we have here one colon. And here we have all elements except uh, the very first element, uh, minus 200. And finally, we can also slice uh, for all elements by simply having here colon. So from the very first uh, till the very last inclusive. And as I said before, also negative indexing applies uh, to slicing. So for example, we can get all elements except uh, the very last element. So from the very first element until the very last element exclusive. So here we have all elements except uh, the very last one, 50. Next, we can also get uh, the last uh, three elements. So we slice uh, from the element 
at index position minus three inclusive until the very last element inclusive. And here we have uh, 70, 150, so the last uh, three ones. And finally, we can also get every second element. So the first colon here stands for all elements. So all elements uh, from the beginning uh, till uh, the end. And then we have an additional colon two. And uh, this means uh, that we only get every second element starting from the very first one. So let's have a look here. So here we get uh, minus 200, 50 and 100. So minus 200, then the second next 50, then the second next 100. Next we can also slice from the second element at index position one until the sixth element exclusive, but only every second element. So this is also possible. And uh, finally, we can also select every third element here. And last but not least, we can also reverse uh, the order. So we actually uh, slice our list and uh, select all elements. So from the first one till the last one, and then every minus uh, one element. And that means uh, that uh, we actually reverse uh, the order here. So here we get uh, 50, 100, 70, 50, 20, and uh, minus 200. All right, thanks for watching, and I'll see you also in the next video. Bye. Changing or modifying elements in a list is a typical workflow. So let's uh, create uh, the list uh, CF uh, with our savings plan. So we save 100 today, 10 in one year, and so on. However, plans can change, so we decide to uh, deposit today only $50 instead of $100 and actually list some mutable objects. And that means uh, that we can change or modify elements in a list. So later in this course, we will dive deeper into mutability of objects in Python. So that's a pretty important topic, but uh, for the time being, it's uh, sufficient to understand that uh, we can modify elements in a list. And this is actually pretty straightforward. So we have to index uh, for the element uh, that you want to change. So in this example, it's uh, the very first element at index position zero. So here we would index uh, for 100. And then we can assign uh, the new value 50. So let's run here the cell and let's uh, check again our list uh, CF. And uh, here we have uh, successfully changed uh, the very first element to 50. And actually we can also change or modify many elements in a list. So let's assume that we want to have ongoing and uh, constant savings of uh, 40 US dollars per year. Then we can simply slice uh, for the elements uh, that uh, we want to modify. So here all elements uh, starting from the second element. And uh, then we can try to assign uh, the new value 40. And here we get an error message, can only assign an iterable. And what we tried here is uh, so-called uh, broadcasting. So we tried to, to broadcast uh, a scalar value, so 40, to uh, more than one element here in our list. And uh, broadcasting actually does not work with uh, lists. However, we can assign a list uh, with our desired uh, new values. So here we have a list uh, containing uh, 5 times 40. And then we can actually slice for the elements uh, that we want to change and assign here the new values. So let's uh, try this out. And uh, this works. So today we save uh, 50 and in the next five years, uh, 40. And of course, we can also have different values here. So for example, we could uh, save in two years uh, 70 and in five years, maybe only 10. So this also works. All right, thanks for watching and I'll see you also in the next video. Bye. In this video, I will show you how to sort lists and how to reverse uh, the order or the sequence of a list. And uh, you might recall that uh, we have already reversed uh, the order of a list when uh, we calculated net present values. So we created uh, the list n with integers uh, from uh, zero till five. And uh, then we can uh, reverse uh, the order with uh, the following slicing, so double colon minus one. So here we have the sequence uh, five uh, till zero. 
However, it's important to understand here that uh, we didn't change uh, the original list n. So we simply created here a new object uh, with a reversed order, but uh, the variable n is uh, still referencing uh, to the original list from uh, 0 till 5. So let's check this. So this is uh, still our original list. And if you want to change uh, the referencing of uh, the variable n, then uh, we have to reassign n to the new object. So with uh, this code here. And uh, now n is actually referencing uh, to a new object uh, with uh, the reversed order. However, there's also a second option how to reverse uh, the order of a list. And uh, we can actually do this uh, with uh, the built-in method uh, reverse. So we simply use uh, the method here on our list n. And uh, let's check n here. And apparently the reverse method uh, reversed and uh, changed the list in memory in place. So here in this example we did not uh, create a new object, but uh, we changed actually our original list n. And uh, this is also called changing an object in place. Now let's create a new list uh, with uh, some cache flows, so 110, 20 and so on. And uh, we assign it uh, to the variable cf. And uh, there's actually uh, the sort method. And uh, the sort method actually sorts the elements in the list uh, from uh, low to high. So let's uh, run the cell here. And uh, let's uh, check cf. And uh, here we can see actually uh, the sorted list uh, from uh, low to high, so from 10 to 100. And also here we have changed our object, so the list here in place. So we modified the list and we actually did not create a new object or a copy. Last but not least, uh, there's also the option uh, to sort the elements in the list in a reverse order, so from high to low. And we can do this by passing a true to the reverse parameter. So the default argument is actually false. So by default we sort our list uh, from low to high. But we can also pass uh, true here. So let's uh, try this out. And uh, here we get uh, the reversed order from high to low. And for the sake of completeness uh, we can also pass uh, false here to the reverse parameter. So let's uh, try this out here. And uh, by doing so, we should actually sort our list again from low to high. And uh, this is true. And as I said, uh, this is uh, the default behavior of uh, the sort method. So sorting the list uh, from low to high. And if you want to have uh, the default behavior, then we do not explicitly pass here false uh, to the reverse parameter. All right, thanks for watching and I'll see you also in the next video. Bye. In this video I will show you how to add and remove elements from or to a list. And again here we have um, the projected cash flows uh, for the XYZ company's investment project. Buying an additional machine starting with uh, the initial outflow or investment of uh, 200. And uh, now let's assume uh, that the machine can run for another year, year 6 and uh, produces in this year additional profits or cash flows of uh, 25. So we should actually add uh, the element 25 at uh, the end of our list and uh, let's uh, try to do this uh, with uh, cash flow plus uh, 25. And uh, we get an error message here and it says can only concatenate list to list and not to an integer. And uh, that means uh, that we can merge or concatenate a list uh, with a list so we have to put uh, the additional cash flow of uh, 25 into a list and uh, then we can add uh, the two lists and actually merge them. So let's have a look here. So here we have our new and updated list uh, with uh, 25 here at uh, the very end. However, it's important to understand here that uh, we didn't change our original list. So here we created a new object uh, with uh, the additional 25 at the end and uh, the variable cf is uh, still referencing or pointing uh, to our original object here. So let's uh, clar clarify this here. So still we have here our original list uh, without the 25. And if you want to add to the 25, 
then actually we have to reassign here the variable to the new object uh, that includes the uh, 25. All right, now let's assume that our machine uh, can run for an additional year, year seven, and uh, here we project additional cash flows of uh, 10. And uh, there's actually a second option how to add elements to a list. And we can do this uh, with uh, the append method. So we have already seen the append method and actually the append method adds an element at the end of an existing list. So here the CF list. And at this point, actually, I want to introduce a very helpful tool. So it's called uh, the tooltip. And uh, we can go here inside the parenthesis of a method or a function. And uh, then we can uh, press uh, shift tab. So we hold shift and press the tab key. And uh, by doing so, we can get here some uh, more additional information and explanations on the build-in method or build-in function. So here we can see the append method and uh, within the parenthesis uh, we can pass an object that we want to add uh, to the list cache flow. And it says here that the append method appends objects to the end of the list. And actually it's a build-in function or method. So this is uh, pretty helpful. And uh, let's uh, run the cell here. And actually the append method uh, changes or modifies our original object. So here we do not create a new object, but uh, we change our original list uh, that is uh, assigned to the variable CF. So let's have a look at CF. And here we can see that now we have uh, 10 here at the very end. So again, it's important to understand uh, that uh, with uh, this code, we are actually creating a new object and uh, we have to reassign the variable here to the new object. And uh, with the append method here, we actually change or modify our existing object. So the list here, so that's a difference. All right, now let's assume that we can use uh, the machine for another two years with uh, additional cash flows or profits of five and two. So we want to add here two elements uh, to our list. And again, we can do this here by uh, concatenating or merging uh, two lists uh, with a plus sign. So this works uh, pretty good. But also here, it's important to understand uh, that here we are creating a new object. So we do not uh, manipulate or change our original object that is assigned uh, to the variable CF. So CF is uh, still here referencing uh, to our original list uh, without uh, five and two here. And again, we have two options here. So the first option is uh, to reassign uh, the variable CF to uh, the new object or we use uh, the extend method and actually modify and change our existing uh, list or object. So here, let's have a look inside the parenthesis uh, with the shift tab. And here we can see that the, the extend method extends a list by appending elements from the iterable. So here we have to pass uh, inside the parenthesis an iterable. So for example, a list uh, with uh, five and two. And by doing so, we're extending the list uh, CF by these uh, two elements. So let's uh, run the cell. And we are actually changing our original object, our original list. So now we have CF and we have five and two here at the very end. Next, we decided that it is uh, not worth uh, to run the machine for the very last year where we only get uh, two as a cash flow or profit. And uh, then we uh, decide actually to remove here the very last year. And uh, we can do this here with uh, the remove method. So let's have a look here with shift tab. And it says uh, the remove method uh, removes uh, the first occurrence of a value. So if we pass here two, then uh, it's important to understand uh, that we only remove uh, the very first occurrence. So for example, if we had uh, two also here, then only the two here is uh, removed and not uh, the two at uh, the end of our list. But as uh, we only have uh, the element or the value two once here on our list, then with uh, the remove method, we should actually remove here uh, this element here. So let's have a look. And uh, this is true. And also here it's important to understand that uh, the remove method actually uh, changes or modifies our original or existing object. So we do not create here a new object. So we manipulate here the object uh, that is assigned uh, to the variable CF. 
And now finally, let's assume that you want to go back uh, to our original list. So until 50 and uh, that you want to delete 25, uh, 10 and uh, 5. Then this does uh, not work with uh, the following code. So we cannot uh, deduct a list uh, from a list. And actually, if you want to delete uh, the last uh, three elements in a list, then it might be best uh, to uh, slice our list here. So for all elements uh, except the last uh, three elements, and uh, then we reassign the new object that we create here to uh, the variable cf. So now again we have our original list. The pop method is another method that I want to show you here. So let's go here inside uh, the parentheses. So the pop method uh, removes and returns item at an index. And uh, the default argument for the index parameter is minus one. So by default, if we use here the pop method, then we remove uh, the very last element at index position minus one from the list. And at the same time, we return the element. So let's simply la have a look here. So the pop method actually returns here the very last element. And at the same time, it actually removes uh, the last element from the list. So now let's have a look at the list CF. And here we can see that the very last element 50 has been removed. Finally, there's uh, the insert method. And let's have a look here inside the parentheses. And it says here the insert method inserts an object before an index position. So here we have uh, two parameters. So we have uh, the index parameter and the object parameter. So let's have a look at the first argument here for the index parameter. So here we can define at uh, or before which index position in our list we want to insert uh, the object which is here at uh, the second position. So here we want to insert uh, 100 before uh, the element at index position 2. So we have here index position 0, 1 and 2. And actually here we would insert the new element 100. So let's have a look here. And let's uh, check CF. And here we have now the element 100 inserted. And also here we have uh, the case uh, that the insert method actually modifies or changes our original list. So we do not create a new object, but uh, we change the existing object in memory. All right, thanks for watching and I'll see you also in the next video. Bye. We are coming now to one of the most important concepts in Python, mutability of objects. And if you want to avoid the most frequently made mistakes in Python, then you should follow the next two lectures uh, carefully. We have already seen the following example. So we have an interest rate of 5% and uh, we assign it uh, the object here to the variable r1. And uh, now let's assume that uh, we create a second uh, variable r2 and uh, we want to have uh, the same value here, so 5%. So r2 is also 5%. And then we increment r1 by one percentage point. And if you think now that r1 and r2 are 6%, uh, then you are wrong. So r1 is actually 6%, but r2 is uh, still 5%. So let's have a detailed look what is uh, going on here in memory. So that's our memory with uh, some slots and uh, their addresses. And we code r1 equals 5%. And by doing so, we create a new object, 5% at uh, the slot uh, with the memory address uh, 0x1000. And we create actually the variable r1, which is uh, pointing or referencing uh, to the object here. Then next uh, we have uh, the code r2 equals r1. And uh, by doing so, we create uh, the variable r2. And actually r2 is uh, pointing or referencing to the very same object as uh, the variable r1. Next, we are incrementing r1 by one percentage point. And uh, what we actually do here, we do not change or modify the object that r1 is uh, pointing to. So we do not change here the 5%, but uh, we create a new object, uh, 6%. And we are actually changing uh, the reference of uh, the variable r1. 
So we uh, delete here the reference uh, to the object 5% and we create a new reference uh, to the object uh, 6%. However, the variable R2 is still pointing or referencing to the object uh, 5%. And uh, that's uh, the reason why we didn't change R2. So we incremented R1, but uh, we didn't change R2. And actually the reason for this is uh, that integers and also float objects are immutable objects. So once uh, we have uh, the object here in memory, so we cannot change uh, the object. Uh, we can create a new object. So we can increment uh, by one percentage point and create the, a new object but we cannot change uh, the object here. All right, now let's go to lists which are actually mutable objects. So we create here the list uh, with uh, six cache flows, 100, 10, 20 and so on. And we assign it uh, to the variable CF1. And uh, then we also create a second uh, variable CF2. And uh, we want to have uh, the same uh, list here for CF2. So we have uh, the same values or the same list here for CF2. And now we want to change uh, the very first element of uh, CF1. So instead of having 100, we want to have 50. And if you think now that uh, we uh, did change uh, CF1, but uh, we didn't change uh, CF2, then uh, you are wrong. So we also changed uh, the very first element of our variable CF2 or the list uh, that uh, CF2 is referencing or pointing to. So in both lists here, we have uh, 50 as the first element. And again, let's have a look what is uh, going on here in detail in memory. So here we have a view on our memory and uh, we create a list object. So with uh, six elements. And uh, we create actually the variable CF1, which is pointing or referencing uh, to the object. And then we create a second variable CF2. And actually CF2 should uh, reference or point uh, to the very same list. And then we change or modify the very first element in the list uh, CF1. And actually we do not uh, create a new object here. So we change or we manipulate uh, the existing list or the existing object. And uh, let's have a look here. So we simply change uh, the very first element on, on our list. So we have now 50 here. And here we have uh, the situation now that not only CF1 has changed, but also CF2, or to be more correct, the object uh, that uh, CF2 is uh, referencing to because it's uh, the same object uh, that uh, CF1 is referencing to. So as a summary here, we can say that uh, lists are mutable objects, so we can change uh, or manipulate uh, lists in memory. All right, now let's go back uh, to our Jupyter Notebook. And let's have another example here. Again, we create here the list and uh, we assign it to the variable CF1 and we create uh, CF2. And then we append another object here to CF1, 15, and we do this uh, with uh, the append method. And let's print out uh, CF1 and CF2. And here we can see that uh, we have changed uh, CF1 and uh, CF2. So that's uh, the first alternative how we can append additional elements uh, to a list. But uh, there's also a second alternative which uh, works uh, differently in memory. So again, uh, we create the list here and we say CF2 is uh, CF1. And uh, then we actually concatenate uh, two lists, so CF1 and uh, 15. And by doing so, we create here a new object and uh, we reassign uh, the variable CF1. And if we check now CF1 and CF2, then here in CF1, uh, we have uh, the additional element 15 but uh, we do not have this here in CF2. So again, let's have a detailed look how this works in the background. And again, we create uh, the object or the list uh, with six elements and uh, we have uh, the variable CF1. Then we create uh, the second variable CF2. And then we append uh, the element 15 uh, to a CF1 and actually uh, we change uh, the existing list so lists are mutable and uh, the append method actually changes uh, existing uh, lists, so CF1 for example. So here we have uh, 15 at the very end of the list 
And we can also see that, of course, CF2 is also referencing or pointing to uh, the uh, changed list or object. And we can also say that uh, the append method that changes or mutates the lists in place. And uh, let's have a look at uh, the second alternative. So here our list was modified or changed. And actually variable reassignment is a completely different concept. So again, we create here the object, uh, the list, and uh, see if one is uh, pointing or referencing to it. Then we create uh, CF2. And then we have uh, the following code. Uh, so we add uh, the element 15 uh, to CF1. But uh, what we actually do here, we create a new object or a new list uh, with uh, 15. And we actually change uh, the reference of uh, CF1. So this is called variable reassignment. So we delete here the reference uh, to the original list and uh, create a new reference. And as a consequence, so CF2 is still referencing or pointing to our original list uh, without uh, the additional element. So the original list wasn't modified or changed here. All right. So now let's have one last example here. And again, we create uh, the list uh, CF1 and uh, we say CF2 equals CF1. And uh, we have already seen that uh, with uh, the sort method, we can sort a list in place. So let's do this here. So we sort uh, CF1 in place. And of course we have uh, changed uh, CF1, but uh, we have also changed uh, CF2. And the reason is uh, that the sort method actually changed or mutated the original list. And actually both variables, so CF1 and CF2, are referencing or pointing to the same original list. All right, thanks for watching and I'll see you also in the second part. Bye. Welcome to the second part on object mutability. And uh, we've already seen the following situation. So we create a list and assign it uh, to a variable CF1. And uh, we also create a second variable CF2. And both are referencing or pointing uh, to the identical object. However, there are cases uh, where you actually want to create a copy of an object or the list here, where CF1 and CF2 are referencing to different objects, so to copies. And if you change one object, so for example CF1, you do not change the other object uh, where CF2 is referencing to. And there are actually three ways how to do this uh, with uh, lists. Two bad ones and uh, one good one. So let's have a look here. So this is uh, the first alternative and uh, we can simply create uh, the identical list uh, two times and uh, assign it uh, to uh, two different variables, CF1 and CF2. And uh, when we change now the very first element of CF1 to 50, then uh, we do not change actually CF2. So here still we have uh, two different lists. So let's have a look what is uh, going on in memory. And here we create uh, the first list and assign it uh, to the variable CF1. And then we uh, create uh, the identical list. So that's a different object and uh, we assign it uh, to the variable CF2. And if we change now CF1, so we change uh, the very first element uh, to 50, then of course uh, we do not change uh, the object that uh, CF2 is referencing to. So this uh, solution works here, but it's uh, pretty inconvenient uh, to create uh, the object here two times. So this is uh, definitely not an advisable solution here. So let's have a look at uh, the second solution. And again, here we create uh, the list and assign it uh, to variable CF1. And uh, then we slice here CF1 and uh, we select all elements in CF1 and assign all elements uh, to CF2. So we assign uh, the slice here to CF2. And actually when we slice lists, uh, then uh, we create a new object. So CF2 is actually referencing uh, to a different object here. And uh, let's uh, modify or change uh, CF1. So if we do this, uh, then we do not change uh, CF2 because uh, CF2 is actually referencing to another object. And again, let's have a more detailed look here. So we are creating the object here and we have a variable CF1. Then uh, we actually 
slice CF1 and uh, by doing so we create a new object so with uh, the same elements and uh, we have uh, the variable CF2 and again if we change or modify CF1 then of course uh, we do not change uh, CF2 or the object uh, that uh, CF2 is uh, referencing to. So this solution works in case of uh, having lists here but uh, for example we will see later with the numpy arrays that it's uh, not guaranteed that uh, when we slice a list or a numpy array that uh, we automatically create here a copy. So when slicing this uh, we create actually a new object or a copy but this is actually not guaranteed for other collections or sequences uh, like for example numpy arrays. So this is also here not an advisable solution. And finally now let's come uh, to the best solution. And again we create uh, the list and assign it uh, to the variable cf1 and uh, then we can actually create a copy of uh, cf1, so a new object with uh, the copy method. So we create here a new object and uh, we assign it uh, to cf2. So cf2 has of course uh, the same elements here and if we change uh, cf1, so the first element, then uh, we actually do not change uh, cf2. Again, let's have a more detailed look here how it works. So that's uh, the best solution here. And again, uh, we have uh, CF1 and uh, the list here. And then we create a copy of CF1 with uh, the copy method. So we have here a new object with uh, the same elements and uh, we assign it uh, to the variable CF2. And of course, if we change uh, CF1 now, then actually we do not change uh, CF2. So if you want to work with uh, two different objects and copies then uh, you should always use here the copy method. Alright, thanks for watching and I'll see you also in the next uh, lecture. Bye! Welcome to coding exercise uh, 3. We are here on the Jupyter dashboard and we have our course materials part 1 on our desktop. So course materials part 1, exercises and now we are going to exercise uh, 3. And actually exercise uh, 3 covers integers, floats, lists and built-in functions and uh, these are very essentials of uh, Python coding. So first of all here we have to create integers, floats, strings and uh, booleans of our choice and we should uh, explicitly check the data type. Then next here we have a list L and we should use some built-in functions. So for instance we shall calculate the sum and the number of elements and the maximum. And we shall do the same not only for a list but also for a string. Next we shall check whether the following calculation is true and uh, we shall examine why this is true or not true. And uh, then we have to round a flow to two decimals and check the first 20 decimals. Then next we can also round uh, to a multiple of uh, 10, 100, 1000 or whatever. Next we shall create the slices of a list. So this is a very important topic here. And we should add elements to a list and also change elements in a list. And finally we also have to remove elements from a list. And then we have to perform element wise operations. So adding 20 to each and every element and uh, we have to sort uh, the values in a list from high to low. And finally we have a very important topic, mutability of uh, lists and objects. So this is coding exercise uh, 3 and if you want to do the coding exercises on your own then please uh, stop the video now. All right, now let's move on with uh, the solution. In Python, everything is an object, and for instance, also the integer 14 is an object that we can store in memory and that we can assign uh, to a variable, for instance, a. And then we can also check uh, the data type of a, and it's no surprise it's an integer. Next, we have uh, the float object uh, 12.56, and then we have uh, the string Twitter within quotation marks here. And finally we have a boolean value, so we have true and false. 
Next, uh, we have uh, the following list uh, with uh, in total eight or nine elements. And actually, we shall use the built-in functions to calculate uh, the sum. And here we can use uh, the sum function and pass uh, the list L to sum. So first of all, we have to define the list and uh, save the list. And now it works, minus 405. Then with uh, the length function, we can determine the number of elements. And at all we have nine elements and uh, we can also determine the maximum element with uh, the max function. And here we get the 340. So here. And actually the key message is uh, that we not only can pass integers of loads to build in functions, but also other data types like strings. And here we have uh, the string S and uh, don't ask me to pronounce it. So this is a, a real word an existing word, but I don't pronounce it here. So let's save S and we can determine the length of S and it's uh, 14. And we can also determine the alphabetically first uh, value with uh, the mint function. And here we get uh, C, but this only works because we have only lowercase letters here. So if we had uh, uppercase letters, then uh, these come first actually. Now we have uh, the following equation, 0.2 plus 0.2 plus 0.2 equals 0.6. And intuitively this should be true, but in Python uh, this is false. And the reason is pretty simple. So we can check uh, the first 20 decimals of 0.2 with uh, the format function. And here we get uh, the result 0.2 and then here in the last uh, decimals uh, we have 111. So 0.2 is not exactly 0.2 and also 0.6 is so not exactly 0.6. And uh, the simple reason for it is uh, that we are here on a computer in a binary system and there's actually no finite uh, representation for 0.2 or 0.6 in the binary system. And therefore there's also no exact and finite uh, representation in the decimal system for these numbers here. And actually rounding does not help us. So here we shall round 1.56456 to do decimals. And we can actually do this with the round function and uh, pass um, the number and uh, the amount of decimals to, and we save it in A. And here we get 1.56. And again, we can check uh, the first 20 decimals of A. And also here we can see that 1.56 is not exactly 1.56. So the answer is here no. So there's simply no finite uh, binary representation for 1.56 and the uh, rounding doesn't help here actually. Next we can also round uh, to the next multiple of uh, 10, 100, uh, 1000 or whatever. And for the next multiple of 10 we would pass here minus one. And consequently for the next multiple of 1000 we have to use minus uh, three here. And here we get uh, 2,321,000. Now let's go on and uh, we have the following cash flow list. And now we have to create uh, slices, uh, the first uh, two elements. And we can slice a sequence uh, with uh, inside uh, the square brackets uh, with a colon. And the first two elements are simply from the very first element until the element at index position two, so that's uh, the third element exclusive. Then we have the elements uh, 300, 500, and 750, and these are at uh, the index positions uh, zero, one, two. Then we have three and uh, four. So from index position two till four inclusive means uh, from two till five exclusive. Two is inclusive, five is exclusive. Now we shall slice for the last uh, three elements and here we can use negative indexing and from the element at index position minus uh, three inclusive until the very last element inclusive. Here we have all elements except the last element. So from the very first element until the last element at index position minus one exclusive. And finally, we have every second element starting from the very first one. So we have the first colon here, which stands for all elements. And then the second co colon stands for every second element.
Next, we shall add the Cashflow 1200 for the year 7 to the list, so at the very end. And we can actually append uh, new objects uh, to the very end of a list with the append method. So we use uh, the append method on the list uh, CF and we append uh, the element 1200. And here we have 1200. Now in question 10, we have to change uh, the cash flow and timestamp to it's uh, 300 to 400. And we have to change uh, the list in memory. And therefore we select uh, the element. So at index position two, and uh, we actually assign the new value 400. And by doing so, we change uh, the list in memory. So now we have here 400. In the next question, we shall remove the last uh, three years from the cash flow list. And we shall do this uh, with slicing and variable reassignment. And uh, therefore, we slice uh, the list for all elements except uh, the last uh, three elements. And uh, we reassign the variable. Here we shall create a new list, uh, CF new with all elements of CF uh, incremented by 20. So first of all, we initiate the empty list, the CF new, and then we iterate over the cash flow list. And uh, each and every element in the list, we actually increment uh, by 20, and then we append uh, the element uh, to the list, the CF new. Here we have to sort the CF new from high to low, and we shall change the CF new in memory. And we can do this actually with the sort method and pass uh, true to the reverse parameter. So the sort method actually sorts in place. So it means that it changes uh, the object in memory. And here we have now the elements uh, from high to low. Now let's come to object mutability and actually list some uh, mutable objects. So we have two projects uh, with identical cash flows. We have um, the project one and uh, the cash flow list one. And actually CF2 equals uh, CF1. And by doing so, we actually create only one object here, the uh, list. And the variable CF1 and CF2 are both uh, pointing or referencing to the very same object. And if we change now the very first element of uh, CF1 to minus 60, then of course also CF2 references uh, to the changed object. So let's check this here. Here in CF1 we have minus 60 and also CF2 is uh, point pointing or referencing still to the very same object uh, with minus 60. So in this case, uh, this was not our intention and now we have to make sure that uh, CF2 does not change. And we shall actually follow best practices and therefore first of all we create a CF1 so this is the object and then we create a copy of the object which is a different object and uh, then we assign it uh, to the variable cf2. So cf1 and cf2 are pointing or referencing to different objects and therefore if we change um, the object that uh, cf1 is uh, referencing or pointing to then of course we do not change uh, cf2. So here we have still minus 50. All right, this was uh, coding exercise uh, three. Thanks for watching and uh, see you in the next exercise. Bye. This is an introduction to the data type tuple. And a tuple is a collection or more specific a sequence uh, like lists. So let's have a look at uh, the type hierarchy. So here we have uh, the collections provided by the Python standard library. And for example, we have uh, sequences like uh, lists, uh, tuples, and uh, strings. And there's actually one major difference between lists and tuples. So we have already seen that uh, lists are mutable. And in contrast to that, uh, tuples are immutable objects, so they cannot be changed in memory. And typically there are very few cases uh, where I create tuples. So I prefer lists or numpy arrays uh, when I need a data collection, or pandas, data frames, or series. However, it's uh, impossible to get around tuples as uh, many functions and methods uh, return data that is stored in tuples. So at least uh, you should have seen a tuple before. All right, let's create a list uh, with our investment project cash flows. And uh, we save the list in the variable CF. 
And uh, we have already learned uh, that there's uh, the enumerate function where we can actually uh, create a list that uh, contains uh, the pairs uh, index position and the values. So let's simply have a look here. So here we have uh, the list uh, stored in the variable enum. And uh, here we have actually one, two, three, four, five, uh, six elements. And uh, these elements are actually tuples. So you can see this uh, here in the parentheses. So this is one tuple and uh, this tuple here consists of two elements, zero and the minus 200. So we can see that the element minus 200 is at index position zero, the element 20 at index position one and so on. And now we can also index the list enum for one tuple. So for example, for the very first one at index position zero, and uh, we save the tuple in the variable tup. So this is here a tuple containing two elements. And uh, we can also check here the data type, it's a tuple. And actually same as uh, with uh, lists, we can also index a tuple. So we can select or access uh, single elements and also here zero-based indexing and negative indexing applies. So if you want to get uh, the very first element, the uh, zero here, so this uh, can be found at index position zero. And the uh, same as uh, with the lists, we can index tuples by having here uh, square brackets and passing uh, the uh, desired index position of the element. So here we get uh, the element uh, zero at index position zero. And as I said, also negative indexing applies here. So we can also get the very last element at index position minus one. So no surprise, it's minus 200. So indexing tuples works in the very same way as indexing lists. However, there's uh, one major difference. And the difference is uh, that uh, tuples are immutable. So we cannot change or modify elements in a tuple or the tuple itself. So for example, let's assume that our initial investment is not minus 200, but only minus 150. Then we could actually index uh, for the element that you want to change. So we select here, the element at index position one, and we could try to assign a new value minus 150. And here we get an error message. So the tuple object does not support item assignment. So a tuple is immutable. However, a tuple has uh, still some methods. So we can uh, check this here after the dot with uh, the tab key. So we have here count and index. And uh, let's go here inside uh, the parentheses. And here we can see that the count method returns to the number of occurrences of a value. So here we can pass a value, for example, minus 200. And it's actually no surprise that uh, we have one time uh, the element minus uh, 200. And uh, there's also the second uh, build-in method index. So let's have a look here with shift tab. And uh, the index method returns uh, the first index uh, position of a value. So here we can pass a value, for example, minus 200. And let's run the cell here. So it's no surprise uh, that it's uh, the index position one. And uh, finally, we can also extract uh, the single elements of a tuple and uh, save the elements in other variables. So for example, here we could say that we want to create two new variables, position and cash flow, and we can code the following. So position comma cash flow equals uh, tuple. And actually now here, the very first element in our tuple is uh, assigned to the variable position and the second element to the variable cash flow. So here we have uh, zero for position and uh, minus uh, 200 for cash flow. Next, we can also create tuples from scratch and uh, this works uh, pretty much in the same way as uh, with lists. But instead of having here square brackets, uh, we have to pass our desired elements of our tuple within a parenthesis. So let's have a look here. So this is our new tuple. And there's also another way to create a tuple. So actually we do not need here the parenthesis. We can simply say that we want to store and uh, create a new tuple with uh, the elements uh, zero and minus 100 in uh, the variable top three. And this also works here. And finally, we can also convert a tuple into a list 
So there's uh, the build-in function list, and here we can pass our tuple that is stored in the variable top. So here zero and minus 200. And it says here, the build-in function list that creates a build-in immutable sequence. And uh, let's have a look here. So now here we have uh, the list. And we can also convert a list uh, back into a tuple with uh, the build-in function tuple. So here we can pass uh, the list L to the tuple function. And again, now we have here the tuple with the elements 0 and minus 200. All right, thanks for watching and I'll see you also in the next video. Bye. A dictionary is another data type in Python and also a data collection. So in dictionaries we can store key value pairs and therefore they are also called mappings. Let's have a look at an example here. And we have two lists. So we have one list uh, with uh, company names, Facebook, Microsoft and Apple. And we have uh, one list, the price, with uh, the corresponding uh, last uh, stock prices. So for instance 188.25 for Facebook and 144.61 for Microsoft. And now we want to combine the company names with the prices and we can actually do this with a dictionary. And we can create a dictionary with curly brackets and actually we have a key value pairs. So first of all we have to define uh, the key and for the first key value pair the key is Facebook. Then we have a colon and then we have to pass uh, the value for the key. So in this example 188.25 and the same we also do for the other two key value pairs separated by commas. So let's uh, run the cell here. And here in the output uh, we can see the dictionary. And actually there's no limitation on the data types. So here in uh, the keys uh, we have strings and as values uh, we have floats. And now let's uh, save the dictionary in the variable mapping. And let's check the data type of mapping. It's a dictionary. And then we can actually access a value with uh, the corresponding key. And we can actually do this uh, with uh, square brackets and then we can pass uh, the key. And by doing so we get uh, the corresponding value 188.25 for, for Facebook. And actually we can also overwrite a value or assign a new value to a key. So for instance let's assume that the most uh, recent Facebook price is now 190.51. Then we can do this here. So let's have a look at mapping. And now we have here the key value pair Facebook and 190.51. And we can also add additional key value pairs. So for instance, we can add uh, Google with a recent price of 1,298. And let's have a look. So here we have on the right hand side now Google. And actually it's no surprise that also dictionaries have uh, some built-in methods. And one method is uh, the keys method. And here we can get actually uh, the keys of the dictionary. So this is a dictionary keys object, but you can easily transform this into a list and uh, get a list uh, with uh, the keys here. And uh, second, uh, there's also the method values. And similar to the keys method, here we can get the values in a so-called dictionary values object and we save the object in the variable L. And let's check the data type. And this is a dictionary values object, but uh, we can simply transform uh, this object uh, to a list or convert to a list with uh, the build-in function list. And here we get a list uh, with uh, the values, so 190, 144, and so on. Next we have also the items method. And let's have a look here. And here we get a dictionary items object where the key value pairs are organized in tuples. So here we have uh, the tuple Facebook 190.51 and so on. And uh, we can also convert uh, this object here to a list by using here the list function. And by doing so we get a list uh, with four tuples and each tuple contains actually one key value pair. And we can also iterate over a dictionary items object and actually we can unpack um, the tuples so we can say for key value 
in uh, mapping.items, we want to print uh, the key value pair. And by doing so, we get here Facebook 190.51, Microsoft 144.61, and so on. And you might ask yourself if we can also use stock prices as keys and uh, the company names as values. So this is possible as long as uh, there are no duplicated uh, prices and actually the keys must be unique and therefore the company name is uh, the best key for a stock as we do not have two companies uh, with uh, the very same name Facebook for instance and actually the price is not an appropriate identifier or key for a stock as uh, we can have uh, the very same price for two stocks simply by chance and we can also check this here. So we use uh, the key uh, Facebook two times and create uh, the dictionary mapping. And actually Python only accepts uh, the key Facebook once. So we have only one time Facebook with uh, one value. So now let's go back to our lists. We have uh, the stock list and the price list. And there's actually an easier way to create the dictionary. So first of all, we can create a zip object uh, with uh, the zip function. And we pass actually the two list, stock and price. And this is a zip object. We can also check this here. And to understand the zip object, we can also iterate over the zip object and uh, print all elements in the zip object. And here we get actually uh, three tuples uh, with uh, the key value pairs. So the zip function actually organizes and uh, stores uh, the elements of the two lists in a way that uh, the very first elements of the lists are actually organized in one tuple, then the second elements are organized in one tuple and so on. And then we can transform a zip object into a dictionary with the function dict. And by doing so, we create here our dictionary. All right, thanks for watching and I'll see you also in the next video, bye. We have already seen the string data type and uh, this is now a more detailed introduction to string objects. So let's have a look uh, at uh, the type hierarchy first. So these are the collections and uh, we have sequences and we have mutable and immutable sequences. And actually a string object is simply a sequence uh, containing letters, numbers and also special characters. Obviously strings are immutable and we can create strings by putting the sequence of characters within quotation marks. So let's have a look how it works in action. So here we have the string Facebook incorporated and uh, we can see that uh, we have uppercase uh, characters, lowercase characters. We have also special characters like uh, white spaces and also points or dots here. So this is a sequence uh, with uh, characters and uh, we put uh, the sequence here within quotation marks and by doing so we create a string object and uh, same as uh, with uh, other objects we can actually save the object uh, in memory and uh, assign a variable to it so for example company name so here we have our variable company name and this it is uh, referencing or pointing to the string object uh, facebook incorporated and we can also check the data type and it's uh, no surprise it's a string object. And actually indexing and slicing strings works in the very same way as uh, indexing and slicing lists. So also here zero based indexing and negative indexing applies. And let's assume that uh, we want to access um, the very first character here, so the capital F then uh, we can pass here within the square brackets uh, the index position zero. And let's also try to get uh, the character at index position three. So this is here a lowercase e. And actually white spaces or empty spaces are also characters uh, that are part of uh, the string. And uh, for example, so here we have index position zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And here we have uh, the white space at index position eight. And uh, we can actually access here the white space. So here we have actually a white space or space uh, within here yeah, the quotation marks. 
and also negative indexing applies so we can actually select uh, the very last uh, character it's here the point or the dot and of course you can also perform slicing on uh, strings so for example from the third character at index position inclusive until the element at uh, index position 7 exclusive and here we get uh, cbu strings are immutable objects so that means uh, that uh, we cannot change or modify strings in memory and uh, therefore if we try to get a lowercase f instead of an uppercase f then uh, this might not work here so here we get an error message a string object does not support item assignment and actually a string can be everything so it can contain letters and uh, numbers uh, special characters and so on so we could also have uh, the sentence i invested uh, 50 us dollars into facebook exclamation mark and uh, we save the string here in the variable sentence and then we can also check uh, with uh, the built-in function length the number of characters in or the number of elements in the variable sentence and here we have actually 29 elements in uh, the string object so including white spaces uh, special characters and uh, so on next we can also convert numbers like integers of loads to strings uh, by passing them here uh, within quotation marks so we have here 100 and uh, we save here the string 100 and the variable i0 so investment at uh, timestamp 0 and here we can see that uh, this must be a string and we can also check this so this is a string object and of course we cannot multiply strings for example with 1.03 so this doesn't work however we can merge or concatenate strings with a plus operator so we have here the string i0 100 plus the us dollar so we have here white space us dollar and here we can actually concatenate both strings so 100 white space us dollar however again it's important to understand that uh, here we created a new object so the original object that is stored in i0 is uh, still 100 and we have also the option to convert a number that is actually here a string to convert and back into an integer for example so with uh, the built-in function int then here we get 100 and also here we created a new object so the object uh, that the variable i0 is uh, pointing to is uh, still the string 100 so we have to perform here variable reassignment and now we have here the integer 100 uh, that is saved in the variable i0 so we can check this again here with the type function and then again we can convert i0 back into a string with uh, the str built-in function and we use uh, variable reassignment again and there's also the float function and here we can convert an integer into a float so let's do this here so instead of having the integer 100 we have 100.0 uh, uh, so that's a float here finally let's have a look at uh, some uh, useful built-in methods for strings so for example here we have uh, the upper method and actually let's have a look here inside the parentheses so with uh, the upper method we can return a copy of uh, the string converted to uppercase so each and every character here is uppercase now then we have also the method lower so let's have a look and the method lower returns a copy of the string converted to lowercase so all characters uh, should be lowercase next we have uh, the build-in method capitalize and it says here that it returns a capitalized version of the string so let's have a look here so the very first character is here uppercase and uh, all of the other letters or characters are lowercase and finally we have also the build-in method title 
Uh, let's have a look here. So title returns a version of the string where each word is title cased. And the uh, title case actually means uh, that uh, the very first character of a word is uppercase and all of uh, the other characters are lowercase. So here we have i, it's uppercase, so then invested the i is also uppercase and all of the other first uh, characters in a word are also uppercase. And here again it's important to understand uh, that uh, these methods uh, create a copy so they create a new object and uh, they actually do not uh, change uh, the original object. So our sentence is uh, still here, the original sentence. And if we want to change this, uh, then we have to use here var variable reassignment. So let's assume that you want to have the sentence only with uh, lowercase uh, characters. Then we have to code the following here. So here we have uh, the sentence in lowercase. All right, thanks for watching and I'll see you also in the next video. Bye. String replacement is a powerful tool that allows us uh, to replace certain parts of strings by other values. And string replacements are in particular useful in the context of multiple printing operations where the printed data is updated, for instance, uh, during a for loop. So let's simply have a look how it works live in action. And uh, we have here the interest rate, 5%. And uh, we assume that uh, we need to change or to update the interest rate in the near future. And uh, now we have the string, the interest rate is curly brackets. And actually the curly brackets here mark uh, the position in the string where we can uh, replace or update uh, values or characters. And we can actually do this uh, by using uh, the method format on the string here. And then we can pass uh, the replacement value. So the value that you want to have here instead of the curly brackets to the format method. So let's uh, simply run the cell here. And here we can see that uh, in our output uh, we have now the string, the interest rate is uh, 0.05. And actually in a string we can also have uh, several replacements. So for example, we can also store interest rate in uh, the variable what. And then we could have uh, the string, the curly brackets is curly brackets. And then we use um, the format method. And actually the first value that we pass here within the parenthesis actually is uh, the replacement uh, for the very first uh, curly bracket and uh, the second one for the second. So let's have a look. And here we get uh, the interest rate is 0.05. And instead of passing here variables uh, to the format uh, method, we can also pass uh, the values directly. So for example, 0.05. So this is no problem. So here we have a stream of cash flows. And uh, this is a list, uh, for example, with uh, 110 and so on. And uh, we save uh, the list in the variable cf. And now let's assume that uh, we want to iterate over the list with a for loop and we want to print out each and every element uh, with a sentence, with a complete sentence. For example, the cash flow is x. And uh, we can actually do this here by iterating over the cash flow list. And then we print uh, the cash flow is curly brackets. And in each and every iteration or loop, we actually replace here the curly brackets by the loop variable i. So in the first loop i is 100, in the second loop i is 10 and so on. So let's uh, run the cell here. And here we get uh, the printout, the cash flow is 100, the cash flow is 10 and so on. And in addition it could also make sense uh, to add uh, the timestamp of each and every cash flow. And uh, therefore we can uh, use here actually two replacements. So for each and every cash flow, we could say that uh, the cash flow is at timestamp uh, 0, 1, 2 and so on. And actually the value of the cash flow. So we can iterate here over a range object uh, with uh, the length of uh, the cash flow list. And uh, for example, in the very first uh, loop iteration, so i is uh, 0. So the cash flow at timestamp zero 
is, and let's have a look here. So the very first element of the cash flow list, the 100. So let's run the cell here. And here we get uh, the cash flow at uh, T0 is 100, uh, the cash flow at uh, T1 is uh, 10, and so on. So string replacement is a pretty helpful tool. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you also in the next video. Bye. Booleans or Boolean values are the logical values true and false. And uh, by the way, these are examples of uh, reserved uh, keywords in Python that uh, shouldn't be used as uh, variable names. So Boolean values play an important role in all programming languages and in all kind of operations and algorithms. So let's simply start and here we have uh, true. So we can see that here in green, uh, this is actually a keyword here. So we can see this here. And uh, true gives true and false gives false. And we can also check uh, the data type of uh, true and false. And uh, true are and false are actually instances of uh, the class uh, bool. So the data type is bool or boolean. However, these boolean values are also numbers. So let's have a short look at our type hierarchy. And the uh, booleans are actually also numbers. So we have integers, uh, floats, and uh, booleans, which are numbers. And uh, the reason for this is uh, that booleans can also be represented by integers. So let's uh, go back here. And by passing true to the integer function, we can also get uh, the integer value behind uh, true. And uh, this is uh, one. And the same we can do for false. And actually this is uh, zero. And consequently with uh, booleans, we can also perform arithmetic operations like with uh, numbers. So for example, we can calculate uh, true plus false. And uh, this is actually one plus zero, which uh, gives one. Then we can also calculate uh, true plus a, an integer, five. And uh, this should uh, give uh, six actually. And uh, of course, we can also perform subtractions, uh, multiplications and divisions. So for example, we could calculate false uh, times six. And as uh, false is actually represented by zero, so this uh, should give actually zero. And uh, the same we can do also for true. So one times uh, six should actually give uh, six. And uh, that's uh, correct. So that was a short introduction to Boolean values. Thanks for watching and see you also in the next video. Bye. In the next two lectures, I will show you the most frequently used operators in Python. So this lecture provides an overview on the different operator types. And in the next video, we will see operators live in action. And actually, we already know quite a few operators. So for instance, arithmetic operators. And uh, for addition, we have, for example, the plus sign. And uh, for subtraction, uh, the minus sign. And uh, we have a star or the asterisk for multiplication and a forward slash uh, for division and actually a double star or a double asterisk for exponentiation. And also we have uh, operators uh, for modulus and uh, floor division, but uh, these are actually two less uh, frequently used operators. Next, we have assignment operators and uh, we already know that with an equal sign, we can actually assign a value or a object uh, to a variable. So for example, the integer three to the variable a. And we also learned uh, variable reassignment. So for example, we can increment a by three or decrement a by three with uh, the operator plus equal or minus equal. And uh, the same we can also do for multiplication and division. So we can multiply a with uh, 3 or we can divide a by 3. Then we are coming to comparison operators. And here we can actually check whether two objects or two variables that uh, reference to objects are equal or not. And uh, we can do this here with uh, the double equal operator. And we can also check uh, whether two objects are not equal with uh, the not equal operator. So we have here exclamation mark equal. Then next we can check uh, whether x is uh, greater than y with uh, the greater than sign. And also we have uh, the less sign. And also we have uh, operators for greater than or equal to 
and uh, less than or equal to. Logical operators are pretty important and here we have uh, the operators and or not. And with uh, these operators we can actually combine uh, statements. So for example we have two statements x uh, less than 5 and x less than 10. And uh, let's assume that x stands for 2 then x is uh, less than 5 and uh, less than 10. So both uh, statements or all statements are true. And actually the end operator only returns a true if all statements are true. Then we have uh, the OR operator. And also here we can combine statements and the OR operator returns a true if at least uh, one statement is true. So not all but at least one statement must be true. And finally with uh, the NOT operator we can uh, reverse uh, the result. So instead of having false we can reverse the false and return a true. Or we can reverse the true and get a false. Next identity operations are actually not the same as uh, comparison operators. So here we have is and uh, is not. And they shouldn't be mixed up uh, with uh, equal or not equal. So here we have equal, not equal and uh, so this is actually not the same. So the is operator returns a true if uh, both variables, so in this example x and uh, y, are the same object or if uh, both variables are pointing or referencing to the same object. And the operator is not uh, works in uh, the opposite way. So it uh, returns a uh, true if both variables are pointing or referencing not to the same object. Then next uh, we have uh, membership operators in and uh, not in. And here for example we can check uh, whether a specific element is in a list. So for example we can check uh, whether the cash flow 100 is uh, in the list uh, CF. And uh, the opposite we can check uh, with not in. And finally we also have uh, bitwise operators. And I will explain these uh, when we come to NumPy arrays. Alright, thanks for watching and I'll see you also in the next video. Bye! In this video I will show you comparison uh, logical and membership operators live in action. And let's start with the uh, comparison operators. So let's assume we have uh, two objects here, two cash flows, and uh, we assign them to the variables cf1 and cf2. And uh, then we can check whether those two are equal with a double equal sign. And of course uh, they are not equal. Then we can check uh, whether they are not equal with uh, exclamation mark equal. And uh, this is true. Then next we can check whether 50 is uh, greater than uh, 60. And uh, this is false. And then we can also check whether 50 is greater than or equal to 60. And also this is a false statement. Then we can also check uh, whether 50 is uh, smaller or less than 60 and uh, this is true. And the statement 50 is uh, less than or equal to 60 is also true. So as I mentioned before comparison operators and identity operators are not the same. So let's have a look here. And uh, we have a 5% interest rate uh, stored in the variable R1. Then uh, we assign also R1 uh, to R2 actually. And then with uh, the double equal sign we can check uh, whether R1 is equal to R2. And this should be a correct statement as uh, both uh, variables are referencing uh, to the same object uh, 5%. And as uh, both variables are pointing or referencing to the same object, then uh, the statement R1 is R2 should also give us a true. So the is operator is actually checking whether two variables, so R1 and R2, are referencing or pointing to the very same object. And the equal operator is only checking whether the objects uh, that R1 and R2 are pointing or referencing to whether these objects have uh, the same values or the equal values. So let's have another example here and uh, we create uh, the list uh, with uh, three cash flows and uh, we assign the variable cf1 and uh, then we create a copy of uh, the object here and we assign the copy uh, to the variable cf2. So we have two separate objects and uh, cf1 is uh, referencing to the first list 
and uh, cf2 to the second, so a copy of um, the first. So we have two objects and uh, the objects are actually equal, so we have uh, the same or equal values here. And uh, therefore, if we check here whether cf1 and cf2 are referencing to equal objects or values, we get a true. But uh, when we check uh, whether cf1 is actually the very same object as uh, cf2, then uh, we should get a false. And actually it's not uh, checks uh, the reverse statement. So whether cf1 and the cf2 are not the same object. And in this case, uh, this is a true statement. Now let's come to logical operators. And again, uh, we have uh, cf1, which is 50 and uh, cf2 is 60. And uh, first of all, we have uh, the end operator and uh, we can actually combine uh, statements with an end operator. And we only get a true if all statements are true. So we have here true and true and uh, this gives a true. So actually true and true is um, the same as uh, CF1 uh, less than 100. So this uh, gives uh, true and uh, cf2 equals 60 is also true so here also here we have uh, true and true and uh, we get a true then next uh, we have uh, true and false and uh, the end operator only returns a true if all statements or all conditions are true and here we have one true and then one false and uh, therefore we get here a false so here we have one true statement the cf1 is less than 100 and uh, we have a false statement, cf2 is equal to 70, and uh, therefore we get here a false. And also for the sake of completeness, uh, false and false gives also a false. So now we are coming to the OR operator, so the logical OR. So we can combine statements or conditions with uh, OR, and uh, we actually get a true if at least uh, one statement or condition is true. So not necessarily all statements must be true, but at least uh, one statement. But uh, we also get a true if all statements are true. So here in this example, true or true gives a true. So CF1 is uh, less than 100. This is a true statement and CF2 is equal to 60 is also true. And uh, this should be here or. So here both conditions are true and therefore we get here a true because at least the one statement is true. Next we have true or false and also here we should get a true because at least the one statement is true. And uh, let's have an example here. So we have uh, CF1 less uh, than 100, uh, this is true or CF2 equals uh, 70, this is false. But at least one statement is true and therefore we get here a true. And finally, false or false uh, should give us a false because uh, no statement here is true. And uh, finally, we also have uh, the not operator and uh, this actually reverses uh, false and true. So not false uh, gives true and not true gives false. <coughs> so CF1 is uh, less than 100 is a true statement and not true gives us a false. And Finally, this is an example where we have to use parentheses. So we have uh, two conditions and we combine those uh, conditions with an end operator. So we have uh, CF1 uh, less uh, than 100 is uh, true and uh, CF2 equal to 70 is false combined with an end operator gives false. And then we have not false uh, should give us a true. And actually we need to use here parentheses Otherwise, uh, the not operator would uh, only reverse uh, this statement here. And finally, let's go to membership operators. And here we have our cash flow plan, so our investment, and uh, we save uh, the list in uh, CF. And uh, with uh, the in operator, we can actually check uh, whether a specific element is in the list. So for example, we can check uh, whether 20 is in the CF, and uh, this should be a true statement. And we can also check whether 30 is in CF and this is obviously a false statement. 
and we can actually apply membership operators not only on lists but also on other sequences for example strings so we have here the company name facebook and uh, we can check uh, whether d is uh, not in the company name so here we have uh, the operator not in and as we can see here so this is a correct statement so we should get a true here and we can also check whether an uppercase f is uh, not in the company name so here we have an uppercase f so this should uh, return a false so these were some python operators uh, live in action thanks for watching and i'll see you also in the next video bye Hi and welcome to Coding Exercise 4. We are here on the Jupyter dashboard and we have the course materials on the desktop. Course materials part 1. And we go to exercises and now we go to exercise 4. And exercise 4 covers uh, tuples, dictionaries, strings, uh, booleans and operators. So first of all we have to create a tuple and index a tuple for an element. And then we try to change an element in a tuple. Then we create a dictionary and uh, return a value for a key. And then we iterate over the dictionary and print all key value pairs. Then we have a string and we shall index the string for the second last character and also convert the string to uppercase. Next we have a and b and we should check whether a is uh, greater than b. And then we have C and D and we should check whether C is not equal to D. Here we should check whether two variables are referencing two lists that are equal and also whether two variables are referencing or pointing to the very same list or to say to the very same object. And then we have here two conditions, condition 1 and condition 2 and we should check whether at least the one condition is met. So here we have to use the logical AND, OR and NOT. And here we have to check uh, whether both conditions are met. So we have the conditions uh, 3 and 4. And finally this is a more complex statement. And before you run the cell you should uh, verify whether this code uh, returns a true or a false. Alright, this is coding exercise 4 and if you want to do it on your own then please stop the video now. All right, now let's go to the solution. And first of all, we have to create a tuple with the elements 103% and 103. And we can do this by passing the elements within the parentheses here and separate it by commas. But actually, we do not need the parentheses here. So let's have a look. So here we have a tuple. And same as uh, with the lists, we can also index uh, the tuple, for instance, for the second element at index position 1. And we can also try to change or mutate an element in a tuple, for instance, uh, changing the third element to 106.09. But uh, actually, this does not work, as uh, tuples are immutable objects. Next, we can store key value pairs in a dictionary and we have a so-called uh, mapping. And uh, here we shall create and save a dictionary with uh, two country capital pairs of our choice. So for instance, France and Paris. And here we open the curly brackets and we have um, the keys of France and Italy and the values Paris and Rome. And then we can get uh, the capital of France uh, by passing uh, the key within the square brackets here and we get uh, the corresponding value. It's Paris. And then we can also iterate over the dictionary and print each and every uh, key value pair. And here we also have to use a string replacement. So for each key value pair we should use XYZ as uh, the capital of ABC. And first of all we transform each and every key value pair into a tuple with uh, the items method and then we unpack the tuple with the uh, key comma value and we do this uh, for each and every key value pair and then we use here string replacement and we have uh, two curly brackets and uh, the first curly bracket is uh, replaced uh, by the value and uh, the second by the key and here we have uh, Paris is uh, the capital of France and Rome is uh, the capital of Italy here in question 7 we have the following string and we can save the string in the variable stat for statement. 
And then we can also index a string, for instance, for the second last character, and it should be an R. So the dot or the point is uh, the very last character. And then we can also convert a string to uppercase. So we can convert each and every character to uppercase uh, with uh, the upper method. And we actually reassign the variable. And now we have uh, the statement in uppercase letters. Now here we have a and b and we should check whether a is uh, greater than b. So first of all let's uh, create a and b. And uh, we can also print a and b to check this uh, manually. So actually a is obviously less than b and uh, therefore we should get here a false. Next we have uh, c and d and first of all we create a c and d. And then we should check whether c is not equal to d, and we can do this with exclamation mark equal. And here we get a false, and this means that c and d are equal, and we can also check this. So this is the very same value here. Now in the following we have the list cf1, then we have cf2, which is actually the same as cf1, and actually CF2 is referencing or pointing to the very same object. And then we have CF3, which has uh, the same values in the list, but uh, this list is a different object. And if you check now whether CF1 and uh, CF2 are equal, so with uh, the double equal sign, then we check uh, whether the objects uh, that uh, CF1 and CF2 are referencing or pointing to have equal values. And this is uh, the case and actually CF1 and CF2 are not only equal, but actually also the same. So they're referencing to the very same object. In question 12, we now have to check whether CF3 and CF2 are referencing to the very same object. And uh, we can check this with the is keyword. And obviously this is not the case. So CF3 is uh, referencing to an object uh, with equal values but uh, the object is not the very same object that uh, CF2 is referencing to. So let's check this here. And here we get a false. Now here in the following we have uh, two conditions, condition one and condition two. And uh, condition one checks whether this number here is uh, divisible by three. And uh, condition two checks uh, whether this number is greater than 63 times 650. So let's uh, create the two conditions and uh, for each condition we should actually get a true or a false. And if our task is now to check whether at least one condition is met, so at least one means um, a logical or. So we can check this with uh, the keyword or. And here we get a true and let's uh, print condition one and condition two. And condition one is false, so this number is not uh, divisible by three and condition two is true. And therefore at least uh, one condition is met and uh, therefore we get here a true. Next we shall check whether both conditions are met and we have here conditions uh, three. So this number is uh, divisible by seven or not and we have condition four. So let's uh, create both conditions and we get trues or false. And now if you want to check uh, whether both conditions are met uh, we have to use uh, the AND keyword. And we get a true here and uh, therefore we can say that uh, condition 3 is true and condition 4 is true. Finally we shall check whether the following code uh, returns true or false. And let's have a look here. So first of all we have uh, type 23 equals integer. So this is an integer 23 and uh, therefore within uh, this parenthesis we get a true then we have here not true is false, so this is a false. Then we have four unequal to three, this is true. And therefore we have here true or false. And uh, true or false gives a true and uh, not true gives a false. So let's have a look here. And this is correct. All right, this was uh, coding exercise four and uh, hope to see you also in the next exercise, bye. In this video I'm going to introduce conditional statements and the keywords if, elif and else. So far we were able to check whether a statement is uh, true or false with uh, comparison operators. 
So for example, we can check whether the uh, second element in our cash flow list is uh, greater than uh, zero. So 20 is uh, greater than zero, this is true. But uh, very often it is uh, the case uh, that you want to take a particular action if a condition is true and uh, if uh, the condition is false or not met, you want to take a different action. And in Python we can do this uh, with if, elif and else. So let's start with if. So this is a Python keyword. You can see this in green. And then we copy here our condition. And we paste it here. And uh, then we use a colon. So we check uh, whether the second element is greater than zero and then we press uh, the enter key. And uh, by default you can see here that uh, Python creates an indent. And now we can define an action that we want to take in case uh, that uh, the condition here is true. So for example, we could uh, print uh, the string uh, is positive or positive. And uh, let's uh, run the cell here. And here we get this output uh, positive because uh, the statement here is true and uh, therefore the action here is uh, executed. All right, now let's uh, do the same also for the very first element, minus 200. At index position zero. And uh, this is a false statement and uh, therefore the action here, printing positive, is actually not executed. However, let's assume now that if uh, the condition here is not met, you want to take an alternative action. So for example, printing a negative and uh, we can define this here. So we can now use uh, the Python keyword else. And also here we have to code a colon and uh, press return. And also here we get uh, automatically an indent. And here we can define now the alternative action in uh, cases uh, where the condition here is uh, not met. And in our case maybe it's uh, printing a negative. And let's run the cell here. And here we get the output negative. And actually we can do this uh, for all elements in our list. So we can iterate over the list and check for each and every cash flow whether the cash flow is uh, positive or negative. And uh, of course we can do this with a for loop. So let's uh, create the for loop here. So for i in uh, cf. And uh, then we copy here our if and else statement. And it's actually important here to make uh, the right indent. So we have here after the for loop an indent. Then here we need an indent after the if statement. And also here we have to make uh, the right indent for the else statement. So it must have uh, the same indents uh, than uh, the if statement. And we also have to press here the tab key for the printing. And finally we have to replace uh, this here by the uh, for loop variable i. And let's uh, run the cell here. And here we get uh, negative, positive, 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 positive. So we have minus 200 is negative and all of uh, the other cash flows are positive. So here we have uh, the combination of a for loop and uh, conditional statements and uh, this is uh, very commonly or frequently used. So we iterate over a list or sequence and check for each and every element whether the element uh, fulfills a certain condition and uh, then we define actually the actions uh, to take. So now let's go on here. And of course we can also have uh, more advanced actions. So we can use here a string replacement. And in case uh, that the cash flow is positive, we can print ca the cash flow is a positive cash flow. And uh, we can actually replace here or we can insert here the particular cash flow into our action or into our string. So let's uh, run the cell here. So minus 200 is a negative cash flow, 20 is a positive cash flow and so on. So far we considered uh, two different cases. So either a cash flow is uh, negative or a cash flow is positive. And now let's assume that we have a cash flow of zero in one particular year. So we can actually do this here by inserting the value zero before index position uh, three with uh, the insert method. And let's check uh, CF again. So here we have uh, the value zero now. 
And consequently, we have uh, three cases. So we have the case uh, that uh, the cash flow is uh, positive. Then uh, we have the case uh, that uh, the cash flow is negative. And uh, we have uh, the third case uh, that we have uh, no cash flow at all. And actually, we can cover multiple cases uh, with ELIF. So again, we iterate over the cash flow list. And uh, first of all, we check whether the cash flow is uh, positive. And if uh, the cash flow is positive, uh, then we print cash flow is positive. Then we uh, check uh, the second case with uh, the ELIF statement. So if the cash flow is not positive, uh, then uh, please check uh, whether the cash flow is negative. And if uh, this is uh, the case, please print uh, the cash flow is negative. And in all other cases, so the cash flow is uh, neither positive nor negative, then else uh, print uh, no cash flow. So let's run the cell here. And here we get the minus 200 is a negative cash flow, 20 is a positive cash flow, and here we have a no cash flow. And instead of having here a combination of if, elif, and else, we can also make uh, this more explicit. So here with uh, the else statement, we cover all other statements uh, that are not covered by the if and elif statements. So in this case, the case uh, that the cash flow is zero is uh, the only alternative case here. But uh, also here we can do this uh, more explicit and we can iterate here again over our cash flow list and uh, print a positive cash flow if uh, the cash flow is uh, greater than zero. Then we can print negative cash flow if uh, the cash flow is uh, less than zero. And then we can check for the explicit case also with an elif statement. So elif uh, i equals uh, zero, then we should uh, print no cash flow. And uh, this gives in uh, this example here the same result as above. And actually the number of elif statements is not limited. So theoretically we could have here 10 or 20 elif statements and check uh, for 10 or 20 different cases. Next, let's further extend our case here and uh, let's assume that you want to put all negative cash flows in a new list and all positive cash flows in a list. And uh, therefore, we can create here the uh, two empty lists, uh, cash flow positive and cash flow negative. And uh, then we iterate over the cash flow list. And if uh, the cash flow is positive, uh, then we append the cash flow in the list or to the list, the cash flow positive and uh, else uh, we append the cash flow to the list uh, cash flow negative and finally we print out uh, both uh, lists here so here we have uh, the list cash flow positive with uh, the elements uh, 20 50 70 100 and uh, 50 and uh, we have the list uh, cash flow negative with uh, minus 200 and uh, zero and actually we have also zero here in the list the cash flow negative because uh, we used here the else statement and else in this case also covers i equals uh, zero and uh, therefore alternatively we could use here elif so we only put uh, positive cash flows in the list uh, cf positive and all negative cash flows uh, less than uh, zero in the list uh, cash flow negative and now we only have uh, minus 200 in uh, the list uh, cash flow negative. All right, thanks for watching and I'll see you also in the next video, bye. The keywords pass, continue and break are pretty useful and extend our options and uh, functionalities when working with uh, conditional statements. So let's have a look at some examples. And again, here we have our cash flow projection where we also have uh, zero cash flows in one year. And in the last video, we learned how to create uh, two new lists, one list with only positive cash flows and one with uh, negative cash flows. So we checked here for each and every element whether the element is positive or negative. And it actually returned a list uh, with uh, positive elements and a list uh, with uh, negative elements. However, the element uh, zero is in a uh, no list here, so it's uh, neither in the positive list nor in the negative list. So the element uh, zero neither fulfills uh, the first condition nor the last condition. And uh, the default behavior is if we do not define here an else statement, then uh, by default, the action is actually a no action. 
And we can actually make this more explicit uh, by defining here an else statement. So we can define that in all other cases, we want to do nothing. And actually, we cannot simply leave here a blank line for no action, but still we can actually define here a no action. And uh, we can do this uh, with uh, the keyword pass. And of course, uh, the result uh, does not change here. So we get here the positive cash flows and here the negative cash flows. And uh, for zero, we defined uh, that the Python uh, should do nothing by having here the pass statement. And as I said before, this is uh, the default behavior. So if we do not define any alternative action here at all, so if we do not define here else, then by default, Python does actually nothing. So here in this case, it's uh, not uh, required to have here the else statement with pass. But now let's assume that uh, first of all, we want to check whether uh, the elements are equal to zero. Then also here, we cannot simply leave um, the action blank. So this does not work. And also if we create here the action line here. And also in this case, uh, we have to define an action. And even if it's uh, the no action, so we have to define it. And uh, we can do this uh, with uh, the pass keyword. So if uh, the element is equal to zero, then Python should do nothing. And if um, the element is uh, greater than uh, zero, then the element should be appended in the list CF positive and in all other cases. So in the case uh, that uh, the cash flow is negative, uh, then the cash flow should be appended to the list uh, CF negative. And of course, uh, this uh, gives you the same result. However, there's uh, one thing that I want to show you and where you have to be careful when you use uh, the pass keyword. So this is essentially the very same code. But instead of having here only one line with the pass for the action in case i is equal to zero, so we have another line here printing this is zero. And it's important to understand that even if we have here pass, so do nothing, then Python nevertheless goes into the next line here and checks the other actions. So let's run the cell here. And in this case, so the statement uh, this is zero is executed here. And then all of the other elements are correctly located here in the respective lists. So printing the statement here this is uh, zero is uh, not uh, really helpful. And uh, what we actually wanted to do here, we wanted to check uh, whether the element is equal to zero. And if this is uh, the case, then our intention might be that Python immediately goes uh, to the next element and uh, actually stops to evaluate uh, the current element or value. And instead of having pass here, where the uh, next actions are still evaluated, instead of having pass, we can also have here the keyword continue. And by having here continue, Python directly stops uh, the iteration and goes to the next element in the cache flow list. So let's uh, run the cell here. And here we do not have uh, the statement, uh, this is uh, zero. Because once uh, we come to the element uh, zero in our iteration, then the statement here is true. And uh, the very next action is continue. And continue means that uh, we stop uh, the current uh, iteration or element and uh, we immediately go to the next element in our for loop. And the next action, so printing this as uh, zero, is uh, not evaluated or considered anymore. So that's uh, the functionality of continue. Now let's consider an investment uh, where we have in the first uh, four years negative cash flows. So typically startups and uh, very new companies have uh, negative cash flows not only in the very first year, but also in the second, uh, third or fourth year. So this is actually a very common example or a very common cash flow projection for a startup company. And uh, then at uh, some point in time, it turns uh, positive and grows. So let's uh, define here the list uh, CF. And now let's assume that you want to determine the first year where we have positive cash flows. So the first uh, profitable year. 
And in this case, it's a year zero, one, two, three, four. So it should be a year four. And there are actually two alternatives how to do this. So the first alternative, um, we create here the variable n. So that's uh, the number of uh, years and uh, the initial value is uh, the zero. And then we iterate over the cash flow list. And if uh, the respective cash flow is uh, positive, then we print the year x, y, z is uh, the first uh, profitable year. And uh, we replace here the curly brackets by n. And then at the end of each iteration, we increment n by one. And uh, then we go to the next element and so on. So let's uh, run the cell here. And here we actually have uh, year four is uh, the first profitable year. Year five is uh, the first profitable year and so on. So actually our iteration does uh, not stop after the first uh, profitable year. And actually for all years uh, following year four, we have the statement, uh, this is uh, the first profitable year, which is actually incorrect. So in this case here, we want to break or to stop uh, the iteration once a condition is met. So once uh, we have found a cash flow that is uh, positive, and we can actually do this uh, with uh, the keyword break. So let's include here in our if statement as additional action uh, the keyword break. And uh, break means uh, that we completely stop uh, the for loop and the iteration. So once we have found a cash flow that is uh, positive, then we print the year x, y, z is uh, the first profitable year. And the next action would be that we completely break our iteration. So let's uh, run the cell here. And here we get uh, only year four as so the first profitable year. So let's again have a look how the iteration works in detail. So the very first element is minus 200. Then we check whether minus 200 is uh, greater than uh, zero. And uh, this is false and therefore neither the action uh, print nor the action break is executed here. And then as very last action in the first iteration, we increment n by one. So we have n equals one. Then we go to the next element minus 100. And also here the condition is false and we jump uh, to the increment and we increment n to two and so on. And there's actually also a second alternative how to do this. So we do not necessarily need to work with the variable n. And we can actually iterate over a range object uh, with uh, the length of uh, the cash flow list, so 10 elements. So we iterate here from uh, 0 to 9 inclusive. So for example, in the very first iteration, we uh, check uh, the element at index position 0. It's uh, minus 200, where the minus 200 is uh, greater than 0. And this is, of course, uh, false. So the following actions are not executed and we jump uh, to the next iteration. And uh, once we have reached uh, 20, then uh, this uh, statement here is true and we print out year four as uh, the first profitable year and then uh, we break uh, the whole iteration or the whole for loop. And of course, here we get the very same result. All right, thanks for watching and I'll see you also in the next video, bye. In this lecture, we will apply our new skills to determine an investment project's payback period. So the payback period of an investment is simply the time until the initial investment is uh, recovered. So we start at uh, the initial investment, which is a negative cash flow, and then we add uh, the cash flow of uh, the first year. So to say, we calculate the cumulative cash flows, and we will continue to do so until the cumulated cash flow is uh, greater than zero. And uh, this is also called the break-even point of an investment. So again, here we have uh, the XYZ company that uh, buys an additional machine for 200 and we have some positive cash flows. So let's uh, create uh, the CF list. And uh, then we create uh, the variable accumulated cash flow and the initial value is uh, zero. Then we iterate over the cash flow list so for i in range, uh, the length of the cash flow list, so from uh, zero till actually five inclusive. And for each loop or for each iteration, we have uh, three actions. So first of all, we increment uh, the accumulated cash flow by uh, the cash flow of uh, the respective uh, iteration. So for example, in the very first iteration, it's minus 200. 
then here we could also print uh, the intermediate result, uh, the accumulated cash flow. And uh, then third, uh, we check uh, whether the accumulated cash flow is uh, greater than zero. And if uh, this is uh, the case, uh, then we print the statement, uh, the project's uh, payback period is uh, x, y, z years. So we replace here the curly brackets by i. And actually once the accumulated cash flows is uh, greater than zero, we break here our iteration and our for loop. So let's uh, run the cell here. And here we get uh, the intermediate results, uh, the accumulated cash flow. So after the first iteration, it's minus 200, then minus 180, so minus 200 plus 20, then plus uh, 50 gives minus 130 and so on. And uh, finally, after four years, we have a positive accumulated cash flow of 40 and uh, we print the statement the project's payback period is four years and uh, then we have a break here. So this works here, however, we should also define an action for the case that a project uh, does uh, not break even. So let's assume the next uh, project here. So here we have minus 200 and minus 150 in the first uh, one or two years. And obviously this uh, project does uh, not break even. So here the sum of uh, the positive cash flows is uh, less uh, than uh, the sum of uh, the negative cash flows. So again, we create uh, the variable accumulated cash flow and uh, we iterate over the cash flow list. And actually until here, it's um, the same. And uh, then we add uh, an elif statement. And here we check uh, whether the accumulated cash flow is uh, less uh, than or equal to zero. And so we can combine here two or many statements uh, with and or or. So we can only say that uh, the project does not break even once uh, the project uh, has terminated uh, after the very last cash flow, so here 50. So two conditions must be met. Uh, the accumulated cash flow must be uh, less than or equal to zero and uh, we actually must have evaluated uh, the very last element. So i equals the length of the cash flow list uh, minus one. So in this case, i equals five, so the very last iteration. And uh, let's uh, run the cell here. And uh, here we get uh, the project that does uh, not break even. And of course, we do not have to print the intermediate results, so we can actually cross uh, this out here. And uh, we only get uh, the project does not break even, and uh, same we can do here. So we can actually cross um, the intermediate printing. And let's finally check if uh, this uh, code uh, still works uh, for a project that does break even. So CF is um, the project that does break even and let's run here the cell. And here we get uh, the project's payback period is four years. All right, thanks for watching and I'll see you also in the next video, bye. This is an introduction to while loops, a very powerful tool in Python. And to show you when and why we should use a while loop, I will use in this lecture a toy example. So let's assume we have uh, two integers, a and b, and we do not know the values of a and b. However, we do know that a is greater than b. And the plan is now actually to decrement a by one until a is equal to b. And in addition, we want to determine the difference between a and b. So let's uh, define a and b, a is equal to 10 and b is equal to 5, however we do not know this. So we only know that a is uh, greater than b and uh, then we create a new variable difference and the initial value is uh, 0. And then we can check whether a is greater than b with a uh, conditional statement. And if this is uh, the case, uh, we print uh, out a tuple a and b and also the uh, string or the statement a is uh, still greater than b. And uh, then next uh, we decrement a by one and uh, we increment the difference by one. And we will repeat uh, this process until a is uh, not uh, greater than b, so until a is equal to b. And if uh, a is uh, equal to b, then uh, we print out uh, the differences and uh, actually here the final value that is uh, stored in the variable difference. So let's uh, run the cell. And uh, this is actually the very first iteration. So a is uh, 10 and b is five. And the statement is a is uh, still greater than b. And we actually decreased a by one and increased the difference by one. 
So let's uh, take here the next iteration. And now we have uh, a equals nine and uh, b equals five. And uh, of course, a is still greater than b. So now let's uh, repeat here the process and let's uh, rerun the cell until a is equal to b. So finally, we have here the result, uh, the difference is five. And uh, if we print out now a and b, then we get here five and five. So we solved uh, the problem here. However, it is uh, not uh, really efficient uh, to rerun cells. And uh, so we have here many loops. And uh, whenever we have many loops, we could also use a for loop. So again, we have a equals uh, 10, b equals five. And uh, the initial uh, value for difference is uh, zero. And uh, then we use here a for loop. So for e in range six, and in total here we have now six iterations or loops. And then we check uh, whether a is uh, greater than b and uh, print out a and b and uh, decrement a and increment uh, the difference. And once a is uh, equal to b, then uh, we print out uh, the difference is um, here the difference. So let's uh, run the cell here. So here we have uh, 10, 5, a is still greater than b and uh, some more iterations. And finally, we end up with uh, the difference is five and a is also five. So the for loop uh, does uh, the job here. However, there's uh, one problem actually. So we do not know the difference between a and b and uh, therefore we do not know in advance how many iterations or loops we actually require or need. So I passed here six to the range function because I knew that uh, in the end uh, we require six iterations but typically we do not know this uh, in advance. So for example if we specify nine loops then we have uh, four times so the difference is five so we have more iterations or loops uh, than necessary and in this case we could actually solve the problem by using here a break keyword so once uh, the difference is uh, zero we break here the loop. But still let's assume that our initial guess is that uh, we need uh, four loops. Then actually we do not uh, reach uh, the end or the desired result um, of our task here. So A is still greater than B and uh, we do not know the difference between A and B. And here comes uh, the while loop into play. And the while loop is a so-called indefinite iteration or loop. And in contrast to that, the for loop is a definite uh, iteration or loop because uh, the number of loops are specified explicitly at uh, the time when the loop starts. And in contrast to that, in a while loop, uh, the number of times uh, the loop is executed isn't specified explicitly in advance. And uh, rather the while loop runs as long as uh, some condition is met. So with a while loop uh, we can decrement a by one and increment the difference by one until a is equal to b. So again we have a equals to 10 and uh, b equals to 5 and the initial value for the difference is uh, 0. And then we use a while loop and uh, we start with uh, the Python keyword while and we say while a is uh, greater than b colon and uh, for our intuition we could also say that as long as a is uh, greater than b and then python makes automatically an indent here and here we can define uh, the action uh, that we want to take so we want to print out a and b and say that a is still greater than b and also we want to decrement a by one and increment the difference by one and finally, once uh, the while loop has stopped, uh, we want to print out uh, the final value of uh, the difference. So let's run the cell here. And actually we can see here that uh, we have uh, six iterations. So we have 10, 5, 9, 5, 8, 5. And finally we have uh, the difference is 5. And actually A is also now 5. So that's uh, the main intuition behind a while loop. However, there's one major pitfall. 
and uh, let's have again the same case a equals 10 b equals 5 and difference is uh, 0 and instead of decreasing a by 1 in each step we uh, made a mistake here and we increase a by 1 so actually a will never be 5 so in the next step a will be 11 then a will be 12 but a will never reach uh, the value 5 and uh, let's uh, run the cell here and uh, we can see that uh, we have many, many loops. So in theory, we have an indefinite amount of loops and uh, therefore we have to cancel or to quit here the kernel or interrupt. And we can do this here with interrupt. So otherwise our code is uh, running forever actually. So let's go to the very end. And here we can see that we have interrupted um, the code. So finally, we had here over 130,000 uh, loops. That's uh, the pitfall here with the while loops. So we only made a small mistake and actually we created an infinite loop. All right, thanks for watching and I'll see you also in the next video. Bye.